It marks 10 years of TNT's National Literary Festival and it's the first ever virtual NGC Bookers Lit Fest. It's packed with stories, talk, readings, extempo, poetry, new talent, and of course, surprises. 18 events, 80 participants. Friday 18th to Sunday 20th September. Catch it all via Facebook, YouTube, and on the Bookers website, bookerslitfest.com. My name is Auntie Thelma and I'm going to read you a story created by Children on Tobago for the NGC Children's Bocas Lit Fest Storytelling Caravan. This story is about a turtle. It's called The Adventures of the Baby Turtle. There once was a baby turtle named Michael. Even though he was only five months old, he already had a very exciting life. It was a hot sunny morning when he first came out of his turtle nest in the sand. Michael knew that he had to push his tiny young fins against the heavy damp sand and make his way to the sea. He could hear the waves rolling onto the beach and he could smell the sea foam. He turned his body around in the direction of the sound and the smell. There were dogs on the beach. They loved to eat baby turtles like Michael. When they saw him moving in the sand, they came running towards him, panting with their long tongues hanging out, going up and down between their sharp white teeth. Michael saw the dogs coming and knew he was in danger. He stopped moving at once. He stayed absolutely still, pretending to be a stone. He hoped the dogs would leave him alone. The dogs came up to him, sniffing him. He smelt like salt water. They poked him with their wet noses. Their breath was hot on his cold shell, which was not yet very hard. Soon they were gone. And when he was sure they were far away, he slowly started to move towards the sea again. It seemed such a long way away. In just a moment, he was in danger again. This time, a huge hungry corbeau swooped down to pick him up in his beak. The corbeau missed on his first attempt. He flapped his great big black wings and wheeled around in the sky to come back and get Michael. But the baby turtle crawled as fast as he could and reached the sea just in time to escape. He swam for his life, going as deep down into the water as he could. The corbeau flew overhead, angry that Michael had got away. Swimming is much easier than crawling in the sand, Michael thought to himself. He was very glad that he had survived the dogs and the corbeau. A boat passed nearby, filled with tourists taking pictures. Soon he was alone in the water. He felt free. He felt safe. But he was wrong. As he swam along happily close to the surface of the water, he saw a long dark shadow in the distance coming towards him. It was moving fast. He saw the till, tall fin of a large fish cutting through the water. It was a shark, and he knew that this time he was in real trouble. The shark rushed towards the baby turtle with his jaws wide open. Michael dived and dipped, left and right. The shark laughed. My name is Danger, and soon you will be in my belly, baby turtle. The shark tried and tried to scoop Michael up but Michael was too skillful for him. The shark got tired of trying to eat the turtle. This is boring, said the shark, and a waste of time. He swished his huge fat tail and swam away. The baby turtle felt like a champion. He beat the shark. Loser, he shouted, but the shark was too far away to hear him. In his travels, Michael met a group of Trini fish. The colours were red, white and black. He also met clownfish, zebrafish, angelfish, tigerfish, dogfish and lionfish. They were friendly and he felt safe with them, except for the lionfish who kept trying to beat him and eat his tail. There were often fishermen around who put their nets in the water to catch fish, but Michael always escaped. 
Whenever he saw a shark or a big fish that might eat him come in his way, he would hide himself by pulling his feet inside his shell and pretending to be a stone. He had learned how to protect himself, but he was alone most of the time and he had to swim a long way out to sea to find food. Sometimes the swimming made him feel tired. He ate pink, white and yellow jellyfish. He later got to know that the yellow ones had the most dangerous sting. One day he met some other turtles. That made Michael very happy. Their names were Johnson, David, Optiman, Sarah, Bammy and Bumblebee. They taught him a lot of useful things to keep himself even safer. He learned to be alert and to watch out for plastic bags floating in the sea because they could kill him. Every day he was heading further and further out into the Atlantic Ocean to find food. The water was cooler than the sea near Tobago. There he knew he would meet other dangers such as killer whales. He decided that it was a good idea to swim with the other turtles because they would be much safer swimming in a big group. After some time, Michael and the other turtles became close friends and soon Sarah became his special friend. They liked each other very much and when they grew up they got married. Many years passed. One day Michael got caught in a fisherman's net. The fishermen took him to Lambeau Beach in Tobago. As soon as they got there, the Coast Guard arrived and told the fishermen that he was not allowed to catch turtles. It was against the law. So the fishermen released Michael. He swam back the long, long way to his turtle family and told them about his experience. He was glad to be back where he belonged safe and sound. Michael and Sarah stayed out of danger from then on and lived a long life happily together forever after. Better known as Auntie Queenie. Today I'm reading from the NGC's Children Bocas Lit Fest Storytelling Caravan. The name of my story is Mako the Village Parrot and it is written by the children from Sandigan. Bianca sat on the tallest coconut tree in the village where she could mackle everybody's business. Not everyone liked Bianca. Tommy, the village bully, hated her because she told on him when he hid old man Mooty's crutches. She also told on him when he stole the cupcakes out of Lady Hilda's oven. One day, Bianca was sitting in her unlocked cage Tommy realized that no one was around and decided to teach Bianca a lesson. He threw Bianca into a paper bag and ran into the forest. Bianca scratched at the bag and squawked very loudly. 
When the parrot stopped making noise, he opened the bag to see if she was still alive. Bianca escaped from the bag and flew up into a tall tree. Wicked boy, wicked boy, squaw, squaw, she screamed at Tommy. Tommy realized that he didn't know the way back home. Leaving Bianca behind, he started to run. In his haste, he tripped and fell into a deep hole. He started bawling and screaming for help, but no one was there to hear him. It grew darker and darker while Tommy sat in the hole and cried. When he looked up, he saw above him a Bianca perched on a tree. She laughed as his pleas for help before flying away. Bianca returned to the village. She sat on her owner's shoulder as he led a search party for Tommy. Wicked boy, wicked boy in the hole, he started to say and then said it over and over again. Her owner asked her to show them where he was. The villagers found Tommy down the deep hole, crouching in a corner and trembling with fear. He was holding on his arm, which had been hurt in the fall. Quickly, they retrieved him and rushed him into the hospital. A few days later, Bianca sat on her coconut tree and saw Tommy come home from school. She felt proud that she had been able to save him. She crawled into her cage and fell asleep. When she opened her eyes, Tommy was standing there, offering her a biscuit. She gently lifted it from his fingers. Tommy said he was sorry for giving Bianca so much trouble and asked to be her friend. Bianca was very happy and she had a new friend and a biscuit for all her troubles. Lila, and today I will be reading to you a story from the NGC Children's Bocas Lit Fest Storytelling Caravan. Our story today is written by children from Grand River and it is called The Mermaid of Grand River. Everyone in the sleepy little village of Grand River was waiting for the annual fisherman's fet. The elders who spoke French patois described it as a grand affair. Everyone in the village came out in their finest dandans, and it was great fun. Samantha, Crystal, Keith, Boy Boy, and Kyle were great friends and were all in Standard 4 at the Grand River Anglican School. They met every year at Mr. Waldron's fish broth stall and spent the day together. 
boy boy arrived first, as and he was scowling. Early as usual, eh? Mr. Waldron peered at boy boy over his spectacles. Why are they always late? Look, it's 11 o'clock already and we're supposed to meet at 10. Maybe you should cool off with some hot fish broth, boy boy. <laughs> no thanks, Mr. Waldron. Not yet, boy boy replied. Hey, why are you grumbling, boy boy? Today's a day to have fun. A voice behind him shouted. Kyle gave boy boy a friendly slap on his shoulder. I just hate waiting, that's all. So where those goose? Five minutes later, Samantha and Crystal appeared. No manners. At least they can apologize for being late, muttered boy boy. Why are you so grumpy, asked Samantha. Today is the day to have fun. Good morning, Mr. Waldron. Boy boy didn't answer and just shrugged. The five friends drank Mr. Waldron's delicious fish broth and then, and then went off to check out the many different rides and games. Two hours later, they returned as Mr. Waldron was cleaning down his stall. You guys ready to go for a boat ride? He asked. Give me a minute and then we'll be off. When Mr. Waldron was ready, they set out in his power boat. After about 15 minutes, they heard a sudden rumble of thunder. Hmm, weather changing. See those heavy dark clouds in the south? That's strange because the weatherman expected sunny weather. Besides, it's dry season, said Mr. Waldron. The skies quickly grew darker. Lightning flashed and the thunder rolled louder. The sea became rough with huge waves lashing the boat. The children were afraid, but Mr. Waldron told them not to worry. The boat bobbed up and down like a tiny little cork on the water as he tried to turn it around. Suddenly, a sharp flash of lightning made them scream. A loud thunderclap pitched the boat into the air and they all landed on an island, which seemed to appear from nowhere. The boat was smashed, but luckily, they were on hoot. Let's see if, if we can find a place where we can be dry, suggested Kyle. Look over there, it's a cave, shouted Samantha. Let's go in, said Boy Boy. On entering the cave, they were amazed. There was a hand with a golden pen writing letters of fire. Then, they saw a huge bird. I am the mystical Pally. It said, ah! You have come to receive a message. To know and go tell it all. Ah! The sacred mermaid only appears at the end of every hundred years, at the eleventh hour for eleven minutes. Tonight, she will give you a message for the people. <laughs> the magical Makapi will yawn for five minutes and a scroll will fall from his mouth. Only she can read the scroll. <laughs> the bird flew away. At 11, a beautiful woman surrounded by bright light and little mermaids appeared on the water. Her lower body was a shining multicolored fish. Then a giant mapapi snake rose out of the water, opened his huge jaws and out came the scroll. The sacred mermaid took it and began to read. Humans, she said, never hurt animals, birds, or other living things. Protect the leatherback turtle. Be kind to one another. Treat the earth with respect. Trees are sacred. Restore the forest. Return the earth to its beautiful state of vegetation. When you return to your realm, let your people know 
that this must heal the earth. They must heal the earth from the sickness that they have brought upon her. She told them to drink from the rainbow waterfall at the foot of the mountain. This will give you the power to fly over the mountain and descend into the portal. Go, tell everyone what you saw and heard. With a brilliant flash of light, the mermaid, all the creatures and the snake disappeared. Mr. Waldron and the children followed the mermaid's instructions and returned safely to Grand Revere. They told everyone the story. Very few people believed them, but those who did followed the instructions. And the hills of Grand Revere had remained lush and green to this day. The end. your bow mr fiddler oh ha hi this country so colorful and truly diverse we're doing our best to put tnt first you success through advancement we encourage we proudly supporting the rich cultural heritage promoting development in the sporting arena and empowering women for equality of gender we sustaining the environment and strengthening the society first citizens helping paint a brighter tnt drag your bow mr fiddler I've been doing spoken word, I would say, I guess seriously, maybe like three years. I've um, been dabbling with it since about, I heard Gary Acosta in 601 Liquid Lounge in San Fernando sometime in 2005 or six. So yeah, um, my piece, I think it was very topical. Uh, I wrote it a while ago. Um, but for some reason, the material is still very relevant to today. Um, and so I think I felt very inspired to, to do it because of everything that has been transpiring pre, during and post elections um, and $50,000 too. Who's protecting the youth? Nobody. Who's been telling the truth? Nobody. Who's been stealing the loot? Nobody ain't. But if crime show up at door, go make Keat sweat. Send six shots at your right and turn Ferris wheel. I hope that combat training kicks in. <laughs> I just kicks in. I don't watch what I say because police could act on commission. Nah. Anti cams, anti up for the cool ease of life after governing. Gas pumps, fares raise. And there's a price to die when profits rise and funeral homes blame it on the cost of living. I mean, cornerstones, pillars, and column fall because <laughs> finance is a joke. And ministers still pass around the collection plate. I'm promised to share with you come election day, but thy success on Icarus wings, cause reality is the only check that we cash in. Contraceptives in the punches, the ramps are rants now. One percent love in the starlight, and Lord knows we love the coffee. And they say God is a trini caught up in an app being controlled by a Siri and peeing on people playing games. You ain't see they only different by name and the results is the same. Nah, wait. Oh, you ain't catch that? 
I say PNM people playing games, UNC, they only different by name and the results is the same now. So there's no price for peace of mind when life seems unfair. And here I am on my Nappy Myers thinking that discipline, tolerance, production had a purpose, but all you do is watch words written in post and react. Shun me because I upset because you infer to me as a cockroach or call me a monkey. So I put the mask on and become a future uncertain. And when I realized the world was in the palm of my hands, I only took what was necessary to make me a better person. Stitching together the life that best suits me with hand-picked cotton and mistakes to bind it. Journals over Jordans because I can't afford to be close-minded. Broken in this perspective that's flawed by your reality and the mirror. Your two cents can't even pay for thoughts or grumbling. Tummy's rumbling louder than your talk and we prayed for bread, prayed for butter. Prayed for better only to be told to hold on to the hem of his garments while pastors living in royal castles and in the church is chicken. So what the hell you telling me about prayers when poverty is my religion? Hope crawling on my skin like a bad itch. A 21 year old Zessa riding wrong looking for a bad bitch. The hook like a worm now. <laughs> Cock waking she up in the morning but not staying for bacon after he break fast and Bum is a shell of a former self, so the eggs are cracked from inception. And since the coop mostly have hens, some of these Adams cut in the apples to be Eve's. I try not to judge, but I am also imperfectly seen. Here on my nappy, my is thinking that discipline, tolerance, production had a purpose. But all we do is watch words written in post and react. Shun those who react because who's protecting the youths? Nobody. Twenty twenty marks ten years of TNT's National Literary Festival, and it's the first ever virtual NGC Bookers Lit Fest. It's packed with stories, talk, readings, extempo, poetry, new talent, and of course, surprises. Eighteen events, eighty participants. Friday eighteenth to Sunday twentieth September. Catch it all via Facebook, YouTube, and on the Bookers website. BocasLitFest.com Thank you.
the world of natural gas, Trinidad and Tobago enjoys an enviable reputation. This is not by chance. For over three decades, one company has led the way in shaping the country's unique energy sector and facilitating its growth. The National Gas Company of Trinidad and Tobago, NGC. NGC is a diversified energy company playing a key role in the development of Trinidad and Tobago's energy policy and increasingly sophisticated energy economy. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to day two of the book, NGC Book of Lit Facts. Throughout the ages, people have sought escape and refuge in the words and imaginations of writers. Literature taught us how to connect virtually with others even before virtual connection was possible. Today, literature is one of the few diversions in which people can engage without risk. For all of these reasons, the NGC Bocas Lit Fest is a pertinent and valuable addition to our national calendar. Here at NGC, we have always held this festival in high esteem for its impact and relevance, and now that it assumes this new dimension of importance, we are even prouder to partner as title sponsors. And so, to all who have come here to seek escape today through literature, we wish you a happy journey. Have a wonderful day, everybody. I'm Dr. Mulia Maye, and I'm the coordinator of the MFA in Creative Writing at the U.S. St. Augustine campus. The MFA is for writers who want to carve out time to concentrate on their craft. It is designed to give writers the tools that they need to grow their writing. The first year of the MFA offers courses that encourage deep thoughts about the processes of writing, reading, and research for writing purposes and offers a solid base for the student to complete their manuscript and reflective thesis for examination. The following MFA students are going to share their work in progress and we thank Bocas Litfest for this opportunity. 2020 is a new experience for us all and keeping our strong bonds with the writing and literary community is more important than ever. Please enjoy the following readings from Nadja Nabi, Stacey Leela, Vanessa Salazar, Raki Kisun, and Faith Jaffarelli. Hey there everyone! My name is Naja Nabi and I'm a student on the MFA program at UWE. Today, I will be reading for you my short story titled Travelling and I do hope that you enjoy it. The feeling of a woman sits near the feet counting. Ten toes. She whistles along the membrane of calves, knees and thighs, moving over a flattened mound, small bumps of breasts, a neck and then to the mouth, leaning in for a kiss goodbye. Outside, away from where the body lies tense and cool, the magenta sky hemorrhages into a twilight stained maroon. Blackbirds fly released, having no choice but to abandon all sense of grit, reason and direction. Their wings are stretched rigid and stiff. They drift in sublime surrender to the indomitable winter, panting on the breath of wind. From where she sits on the cold, thin layer of dull cloth separating the body from the dusty earth in which it came, she, the woman, the feeling, watches. The avian's appearance is a signal. It is time for her to leave. When she gets up, the body shivers in the cool. Be quiet now, silence, relax. The tongue unfurls off the ridge of the gum and comes to lie flat. The head droops, shoulders and pin like a jacket slid off the hanger. It listens, her body, because it knows she will return. She always does. If it will receive her once more is yet to be known. This is why, when she reaches the edge of the cover, she turns for one final look. On nights like this, one can't be sure. 
one never knows if one will be returning to the same body or if when returned, the body will still be receptive. She pays no attention to the man beside the body. She takes no care to wonder if he is hungry or wanting rest in hers. She knows by the sound of his snoring, she has already fulfilled her part. He, this man, her husband, is appeased, and now he has turned off the world and returned to his natural state, selfish living. He is much to thank for this what she is doing, but of course that would be given him too much. Instead, she focuses on her own appetite for thrill and adventure. It was this that brought her to it in the first place, and it is this that sees her true, sustains her in her travels. She never thinks of him when she is gone, not one bit. She never wonders of who he is dreaming of that night. Instead, she focuses solely on herself, on living, even if that living means carrying on like the dead, even if it means abandoning what was God-given. In this, her true form, she no longer belongs to him. She belongs to no one. Sometimes not even herself. She loves that. Freed of duties that bind her, her humanity, she is released. She is no longer beloved wife or mother or daughter or even friend. She is boundless, eternal spirit. Primal, existing as she was before the origin of sin. Before God had blown his breath on clay and made it come alive. She is like God himself. And who can own God? Who can say to God that he must stay quiet and hidden and that he must listen as commanded? No one dares contest God. So in this form, she is as she was always meant to be, freed. She steps into the glow of the moonlight and she is off crossing sea and space and time, traveling, expanding. She is light from the heaven. She is light on the sea. She is sound. She is the hum of an ohm, the primordial sound of the universe. She is the chant of a prayer, the whisper of hope. Tonight she is reaching far beyond anywhere she has ever dared ventured before. Perhaps it is because she is feeling a bit risky. Perhaps the comfortableness of the state is setting in finally. She just finds herself wanting a new kind of trip tonight, something strange and alluring. She looks up at the sky. Only once has she gone skyward. She floated then among the stars. But when she looked down on it, she realized how much of it was unknown to her. She figured then she was better off knowing where she came from before she could chart a new ongoing. She started first in Europe, but she's done trekking through there. Once, she met a man with whom she fell in love. Another traveler like her. She kissed him under the leaning tower, made love to him in the great ruins, atop Spanish-style roofs at sunrise, and once under the Eiffel Tower. That was after he told her he would be traveling to the stars for good, that his time on the earth was over. She had to concede it was the end. She had to accept and let him go. The next morning when she woke up in her body, and after she'd seen her husband off for work, she cried endless. So now she's done with the business of Europe. She wishes to see other worlds, so she's trotting, if one could call it trotting, the globe, for a new spot to have new adventures in. She's thinking of Nigeria or the Congo, somewhere in Africa. So she travels westward to this new adventure. In the darkness of the night, she comes upon the tall striding god. He crosses the plain, colourful, walking on a pair of sticks, a long flowing gown, a pair of wings, clawed rippling flowing. Colour and glitter rises out of his back and hangs down in sequence. He moves with grace and elegance and ease. His large body guiding as she, the feeling, the woman, stalks on his heels, careful to not be noticed or seen. She moves as he crosses into the Atlantic, passing land masses and large structures at sea, boats, waves, crossing until he comes upon a shore lined with hills that roll one into the other and enters the place. She has never come to such a place like this. Immediately, it is different to her, in a good way. In the way that you never knew you needed something before, but you find it when the time is ready, in a healing kind of way. She creeps through acres of unfamiliar leaves, through a lush green thicket, following tall striding God 
as he dances the wind and comes upon the sound, the fire, the whistling. In this world, men and women are dragons, bats and devils, blue painted and black oiled. They run through the streets screaming, cackling, red drool dripping into a bucket full of dollar bills. She is quickly disturbed. She tries to run, but the crowd is stick around her, wailing, carrying on, grinding against each other. The scream and the whistle is an echo thick in the night. In the grit and heat, in the orange glow of the lampposts, she is looking for a way out. She is cursing herself. Why did she come to this place? Why did she follow? Why couldn't she be content with somewhere closer to home, somewhere safe? She tries to flee, wants to go back to the body, but they block her, and she is quickly lost in the rhythm and the energy and the sound of the whistling and the wailing and the painted fiend who stands before her seeming to stare straight into her soul. She runs again, tries to signal to her striding God, but he is lost in a rapture as he holds one leg in his hand and waves and wails all over the place. Bouncing around, he dips and squats, and she, the woman the feeling, is below, praying that he will see her and lift her away from this madness. She turns and turns, and then she spots her, the woman, the masquerader, and she is stunned at the thin, feeble frame of the woman who looks exactly like her, though not at all, at the curls bouncing and at the woman whom she has felt she has seen every day in her reflection. How is it possible? Had her own body picked up and decided it was coming too? Had it gotten fed up of being left behind, decided it had to live as well, and not lay there abandoned and locked off from the rest of the world? She ventures over to her, the woman, the masquerader, and she drifts about her inspecting the hair and the face and the frame, and she dares to do something she has never done before. She touches the woman. Her spirit is on flesh and sweat, skin and circling before she enters two spirits, one body, moving together, she inside the woman and the woman inside of herself, and she feels the energy and the hips rolling, becoming one with this carnival woman, juve woman, jammed woman, trotting down the road in her short pants, walking the road with a neck full of powder, breast and bottom full of every colour under the sun, cooling on her skin along with mud and clay and chocolate and powder and film and fantasy. Together they are tall spirit dancing on stilts. Woman in a field lighting a stick of cane, screaming resistance on an early morning. In all the world she has been, there is no pain like the one felt in the body, but there is also no pleasure like it. And she, who is one with the woman, sprawling all over a man, all over the ground, all over sunrise and paint and sound and the chant of iron and the clatter clatter and the desk and drum. In all this, she has come to find herself and be freed finally, if only for this one moment, if only for this happening, if only for this time. Soon again, she will find herself returned at her doorstep, at her own body transformed and changed. But for now, for all that exists now in her, is this place and in this she is at home in the unmaking of herself so that's my story and you be good you continue to be safe out there and many blessings thank you for listening hi i'm stacy creative writing mfa student at the uv the following is an excerpt from my manuscript for the program tutul bay by stacy lila the longest rope have an end grandma eunice used to tell me and sometimes that end is not one you will wish on your worst enemy. Grandma Eunice had married an Indian man from Arapo. Kali was his name. He did buy land from Petra de Koto down in the valley and built up a nice concrete house with inside toilet machine. Grandma Eunice said that long time, Dick were used to come down and bathe in the river. Rachel too used to go skinny dipping in the six foot deep pool back in the day. Every time she tell me, Grandma Eunice used to frown up she face and remind her about the time she smoked weed and Kali reached down by the river with her broad leather belt. He blazed, she asked, twice. First, when he find she naked on the bank with Rambo, and the second time in front of the Dakota residence as an, as an announcement that no only child not ruling he house. 
Soon everything that happened down on that side was illegal. Fields of weed were planted, cocaine lace joints were rolled by the thousands, man toting AKs and bazookas to show off. And just like that, the place, once a retreat, became a meeting point for the wayward and criminals. Rambo too would get tired of the gang thing. He died from multiple gunshot wounds on the very river bank where he and Rachel used to meet. I almost sure that it was that was where I was conceived. They say he wasn't always a bad boy. He could have turned out good, he could have turned out bad. But one day a strong breeze blew. Rachel had just started to show belly. Kali beat she black as white, hoping that she lose the baby, but she didn't. Grandma Eunice ban up her wounds like she used to do her own and take care of her until the baby come. They name me Linda and Kali get a third generation of Jones woman to torment. Rachel eventually moved out to live with her new man and leave me there with Grandma Eunice. The night the bacchanal start, I did sit on my bed with my big white hat in hand waiting for Ravi. Rachel gave me that hat when Kali died. It was a strong hat made by a mestiza as a gift to Grandma Eunice's great grandmother, an heirloom handed down from mother to daughter, not because it was precious or important, but because it outlasted lifetimes. Rachel didn't care for the hat. She said she looked like a fool in it, so she gave it to me to play with. But even as a girl, I find it was classy. When I hear the whistle blow, I went and unlatched the door. I ran back to the bed, put on the hat, and strike a pose. As Ravi come, he knock off the hat and laugh. Ravi is Brahmin, and although he family high color, they broke into teeth. I never think he would have liked me. When he first kissed me, I come alive. It had buried something in my head, a feeling that I would have never feel again in life. The smell of cigarette smoke mixed with faded cologne that he would have put on since morning grabbed my attention when he picked up the hat off the ground. We were still laughing. He had eyes to die for. Bottomless jade pupils surrounded by rich brown earth. I pulled on his sharp chin and his beard suited like black nylon. In my usual routine, I buried my tongue between his lips, looking once again to see if I would taste love. All I found was the residue of punching. He flinged the hat on the bed. You and this blasted hat, he say. Do play like it or like it now. You didn't tell me I look like a painting of a free black woman when I wear it. I put back on the hat and take a picture. That was Mama Guy, he say, and then knock it off again. We couldn't done laugh. Where you pass, I ask. Where else through the forest? You don't afraid? For what girl, the darkness? He grinned. And to be side, I will do anything to see you. Even cough down the devil that living in the silk cotton tree. You could do that for me. And it's then I remember. What about Sima? You could do that for she too. In truth, I was with I was with Ravi before Sima. But he as I tell him, I wanted to meet his family, and he didn't want that. Nevertheless, he used to come around on and off. A year later, he married Sima. He said his mother and father arranged it because she was Hindu like him, and her family had money. I remember his exact words. How I could marry you? You is Christian, and to besides, I would divorce Sima in two years, and we could take she money and go somewhere. That was seven years ago. As time passed, the story changed. The last reason he couldn't leave was that Sima was not well. She was manic depressive. Grandma Eunice said that he had a jumpy on him that the Sen woman mad. I followed Baruta because I'm not mad. You see, everybody does need somebody, even if they're just plain wicked. Ravi was there for me. Like the peg Kali used to walk after the doctors cut off his gangrene foot right before he died. I watched my mother and grandmother take care of the old Rambelli Rawan who beat all of you like snake. He didn't use the peg for long. He stopped when he killed Kitty in the doorway. He cussed everything he rested his eyes on, including me. He tell me I black and ugly like Eunice. 
and the two of them pick him up and put him on the couch and neither of them watch me twice. Ever so often, Robbie would slip away from me and like I can't catch myself. So I used to beg him to come back. I was crippled like Callum and he was my pet. The love, the sweetness, the sugar was eating me and poisoning me same way. All how I wanted to leave, I couldn't. As Grandma Eunice used to say, leave your luxury for latrine. So she stayed, despite the licks, the cuss, the torment, the name calling, the hurt, the shame, the wickedness. Same way Rachel stayed, because she, because it was he who mind we, and was the right thing to do. Well, I stay because Robbie was all I had. I say, I stay because Grandma Eunice used to say that God does bless selflessness. I did come to hate Rachel and Grandma Eunice. We used to follow stink for everything and used to escalate to massive cussles that could be heard as far as the big bridge. Like the time Rachel ups and tell me just so that I should call her mommy. She never raised me. I tell she the only mother she was was a mother so-and-so. I know I shouldn't have said that, but I was vexed for too long to say sorry. For Carly Wake, Rachel tell everybody that taking care of she father when he died was the why God healed her and she was grateful. I get up and spit on the ground. I never do nothing so in my life, but I had every right. You calling God name and shut up with man, I say. She make an announcement. Oh, she will never get married because when she was 14, Grandma Eunice sweep she, she foot with her broom. Right after that, she meet Rambo, and as they, as they planned to get married, he come and did. Then she was with Bobby, and they, and they went around for five years, and the day she talk about jumping the broom, she never see him again. To stress and the never, she screw, the thumb, she screw her thumb right in the dimple. She and Wade did reach as far as to buy suit and gown, and then he tell her, just so, just so, I don't think this will work out, and he leave. I wanted to say it's blight, she blight, eh? but the people who were there shaking their head and remembering these stories. Oh, that seal she fit, but it don't have to be so for me. I could get married and settle down and leave people man alone. After my own mother embarrassed me so, the whole a sangre they go and take it upon the self to show me bad face. On the day of the funeral, I cry like a baby with colic, not because Carly gone. But because although he was gone, I still feel the bitterness in my stomach leaking into my mouth. I wanted to spit again. And when I hold it back, I vomit. All the dashing bush that they forced me to eat the morning to keep me up splatter on my shoes. Grandma Eunice had come to hold me. I feel a contentment in her body while she holding me. Like she thought I'm grieving for, grieving for him. Or maybe she thought I forgive him. In the funeral, she will look to tell me it's strange how we just come to love the people who hurt us. I pull away from she and fall in the muddy grave, break my ankle and dirty up my nice black dress. That caused another cussle, but long after, I did let it boil. And that was when things used to get the worse. I used, to say, I used to feel this way when Seema come up in conversation, like we was on top of this fire, bubbling like Carl. Every single time I promised myself I would leave. That night, I would say to myself right before you opened the door, but I'm not sure when it slipped on mine. Oh gosh, things going nice. Why you have to go and bring she up for? Ravi sighed. Sitting on the bed, he rubbed his bushy eyebrows between his thumb and his middle finger and then leaned over into the weight of his head. It always on my mind. You keep saying that you would leave, but it's seven years now, Ravi, and you're still with the woman. It's not that simple with husband and wife thing, he struggled to explain. She was my wife when I meet you. I breathed a big breath through my mouth. Why you don't just let me go? I told you, you could go if you want. He long him out like we was in standard one and he didn't want to play with me again. I wanted to go, but Mother Shiba say I too too be. The old woman concluded from what she saw that my lover hadn't work over on me, but it was I who stripped it over him. I... 
To be honest, I will not fight for her, he tell me. We have a lot of attachments but that, that keep us together, but the love gone now. Long time. I wish it could be easier for us, but soon things will change. I didn't start to believe him, eh? But when he talk about change, I know he lying to repeat. Change? I ask him. Yeah, I gotta tell she. But what he said didn't ease my spirit because it's like I living in limbo. I always hide in how I feel. I just even hide what I think in because I afraid people read my face. Or maybe do I will do something to give it away. Something that might make the man so upset with me, he would tell me for the millionth time that he can mash up the thing if I make it bad for him. No, nope, it didn't make me feel better at all. I can't take it no more. All you just change is your clothes. Is then the idea come? And I wonder why I didn't think of, about it long time. You know what? I will tell she. He busts out laughing. You, you don't have the belly. Oh, so you feel, you, you think as the same little girl you meet how much years ago. I was certain now. He used to tell me when I shouldn't do something. Never in his life. He tell me I can't do something. You know what? I will tell her. He pulled back his head like a drake and watched to see if it was me. But he's smart. He take my hands and kiss them like I see picture free black woman. You know, Linda is the conquistador's name for beautiful. He could have tried what I didn't make up my mind. And I frightened. And I don't know why I so frightened. That's strange, eh? What is that? How we just come to love the people who hurt us. I wasn't saying that Grandma Eunice right. But I wonder if it's true. And why I frightened so. I study if I did like the bad treatment more than the man who treated me bad. I don't think it's a bad thing. I don't even know what he's talking about. I was just fixing the eyes. The eyes that held me captive. Grandma Eunice says lost. But what she know? That night before he peeled himself out of my arms to find his wife house, I had a dream. It had ride my chest like a palm mango. So I ended up telling Grandma Eunice, but it caused her falling out again. That was the last time we would talk face to face. In the dream, I was in a white dress walking up the church aisle. I watched to see if Robbie was waiting, if it was Rob, Robbie waiting for me. And I feel so good that he finally chose me. When I reach up, I get vexed because I noticed that it was, I was sitting in the front row crying. Somehow when I saw me sitting, I started to see from that point of view. I raise up my head and stop crying because he say it is me he married him. I smile. But when, I, when he lift up the veil, I saw it was great Auntie Bertha who dead a long time now. The funny thing is, I never knew her. I just saw her in pictures. Ravi watching me. And nodding for my approval because he's certain this was me he just married. I tell him that is not me, that, that that is a spirit. He smile and say yes, it's okay. And they walk out the church and I wonder how a wedding ceremony could be this hour in the evening as the sun looking eye level across the savannah outside. So that I have to put up my hand to block the glare. At that point I get frightened because I remember sometimes I can't trust what Robbie's saying. And that was when I wake. My foot was lancing. Rain was going on fall. The place was dead silent. A crapper wouldn't dare croak. He was sitting on the edge of the bed, tying the lacing of his shoes. A dirty, wet scent crawled up the end of the, the skirting of the bed. He glanced sideways and made to leave. When he raised up, the mattress fell hollow. As the door cracked, an icy cold breeze blew in and strangled the warm air. Then he disappeared in the shadows of the tall, stinking two trees in a sepia moonset. Hello, bookers. Thank you for allowing me to read some of my work. My name is Vanessa Salazar, and I am an MFA in Creative Writing student at UE St. Augustine. I will be reading from my first novel, Salima and the Merfolk, which is a young adult novel about a young girl who discovers that um, there are mermaids living at the end of Las Cubas Bay in a river called the Ferry. I'm going to be reading from chapter 7, 
titled I See Your True Colors. The next morning, Salima awoke with a smile on her face. She had dreamt of Amaras. In the dream, they were in an underwater park. They shared an overly topped ice cream sundae, and at the bottom of the sundae was a chocolate box, and in the box was a pearl engagement ring. She didn't wait for him to ask. She shouted, yes. Salima savored the details of her dream. She tried to go back to sleep in spite of the sun's intrusive rays. She squashed a pillow over her head and turned her back to the window. The change of direction put her in view of a mirror. Confronted with her giddy face, her guilt would not allow her the peace to sleep. She could not pretend that Amrus was not Drea's mate or that Drea hadn't saved her life. It was impossible not to be captivated by Amrus's infectious nature, but like her friendship with the Murfolk, the secret of her blossoming feelings was one she intended to keep. The morning had an essence of newness, as if so much was about to change. As usual, Salima, Salima and Missy left for the ferry. This time she took a brush for Drea and a lighter for Amrus. Salima passed Dave in the village. He had materials to finish Annie's office in his truck because the contractor had abandoned the job. He decided to finish it himself with the help of two friends, one of whom was Anthony's uncle. Where would I put Missy when you're finished? She asked. Don't worry, we'll find a place for her, he assured. He drove off and Salima continued on her way. Only Amrus was at the river. Dave was with her mother, me, sorry, Drea was with her mother, making engagement arrangements. Salima gave him his gift and showed him what she brought for Drea. He was amazed at what fire was and what it could do. Throughout the conversation, he kept his finger on the fuel lever, mesmerized, Amrus gazed at the flames and ran his webbed fingers through it, even though Salima warned that he could be burned. With a soft kiss on the cheek, he thanked her for the gift and promised that Drea would love her gift just as much. Eventually, Salima took the lighter from him. She encouraged him to share more about his life, and she did as well. Amrus didn't know what school was and was unimpressed to learn that most of a human's youth was dedicated to education. In, culture, in his culture, their focus was on family and community. For the same length of time that humans spent in schools, they spent bonding with their families and being groomed to be assets to their communities. One thing they did have in common was a concept of marriage. Only to believe in true love was not a popular notion of humans anymore, whereas it was expected from Murfolk. Murfolk married for life, no reconsiderations. When Salima said her parents chose to be separated, that it was not because of death, Amaras could not grasp that reasoning behind the decision. She did not tell him about her mother's drinking, not, not that it would have made any difference to him. He was also stunned to learn that she was an only child. It was not unusual for Murfolk to have upwards of 20 offsprings. He himself was from a family of 23, separated by a few months. She could not think of a way to ask him how mermaids had babies without blushing, so she left that question out. She asked about the river, where it led to, and why they didn't live in the sea. He said that after Murfolk, and humans were alienated, a mermaid fell in love with a human, a human. She would meet him by the same rock that separated the two beaches on Lascrivas Bay. When the sea king found out, he banished her from the sea. With the force of a storm, he pushed her into the same river where Salima, Madria, and Amrath. So what happened to the man she was in love with? Salima asked. He found her and they lived, and lived with her in the river. How did he live with her? There are so many stories, I don't know which one is true. Some say he grew gills, some say she grew legs. My great grandfather said their love found a way to keep them together, and that's good enough for me. So you believe? Salima asked. Sure, I believe. 
Amra smiled coyly as he told his stories. He was confident and proud of who he was without being haughty. He was unlike anyone she had ever met, and not just because of his tail. He treated her as though everything of what she was ashamed of was of no negative significance to him. He was yet to mention her abnormal eyes, though with his eyes she understood why it would not be something that would be odd to him. Amorous released himself from Selima's gaze. He swam to the other end of the river and gave Missy some attention. Why aren't you in the river? He asked Selima. Are you afraid of me? No, I can't swim. Didn't Drea tell you she found me drowning? Drea exaggerates. I didn't quite believe her. Well, she didn't this time. I really can't swim. It's kind of embarrassing. I'm almost 16. When will you be 16? Tomorrow, actually. Well, let's get started. I'll teach you. So I'm going to stop here um, because this goes on to a whole different um, part of the story. A lot of action, a lot of romance, a lot of heartbreak, a lot of failure, and a lot of victories too as well. So thank you everyone for listening to my story and good luck to everyone else. Bye. Hello, good day. My name is Raki Kisun. I am an MFA student with the University of the Western East St. Augustine campus. And today it is my pleasure to share with you part of a manuscript I am currently working on. True to his word, Raja started my training the very next day. But did he teach me anything about magic? No. Did he, however, put me through rigorous physical torture that had absolutely nothing to do with magic? Yes, that was exactly what he did. I didn't care how handsome he was or how good he cooked. I hated him almost as much as I hated burpees. If you are lucky enough to not know what the burpee is, let me enlighten you. It is a form of exercise that is torture that involves going straight from a push-up to jumping on your feet. You know what the worst part was? His good chair. That's right. While he was working my butt off, he had the audacity to be chirpy with a seemingly endless supply of corny jokes. Hey Mia, what did the sea say to the shore? At which point I would usually roll my eyes. Nothing. It just waved at which point he would start chuckling at his own joke. I scowled as he approached. I was sitting on the hard ground in the dark. Daylight had not touched this planet since we arrived, and Raja had taken down a few of the lights he had created on that first day. He said my dependence on the light was limiting me. I noticed a gold-wrapped chocolate in his palm. Damn it, I could smell the layers of hazelnut chocolate. I licked my lips already anticipating the tiny crunch of the wafer and not in the middle. It didn't take Raja long to realize that my weakness was food. As such, he loved dangling treats in front of me. I had learned that the nicer the treat, the harder the workout. And if I complained even once during his beast routine, the bastard would eat the treat in front of me. He never shouted, he never cursed, but I think his brand of cruelty was worse. How's the pain? He smirked. I would have given him a deserving reply if he weren't holding that chocolate in his hand. I ached all over. Great! I raised my chin. Couldn't be better. And I smiled brightly. He laughed. You're lying. Then why bother asking? I scowled harder, trying to visualize a big rock over his head. Nothing happened, of course. That chi maya thing was not working for me. My head hit, my abs hit, even my butt hit. I hadn't known there were muscles in some of the places that hit. I don't want you to lie about the pain, Mia. I want you to control it. There's a difference. 
This time I looked around for an actual boulder to throw at him and I swear if I wasn't hurting so much, I would have walked a few feet to get it. Tell yourself there is no pain, he said. It's all in your mind, he said. He chuckled and peeled off the gold wrapping. In times like this, heightened senses were more cursed than his strength because I could smell the chocolate, the hazelnut, and without my permission, my scent receptors taunted my taste buds about all the joy they were being denied. If I was irritable before, I was worse now. He shoved the whole thing in his mouth, chewing loudly. Then, as if he only just remembered I was sitting there, yeah, right. He faked wide-eyed ignorance. Oh, the deviant said. Did you want one? I narrowed my eyes at him, refusing to answer, knowing exactly how this would go. Not surprisingly, a whole sexy box of chocolates appeared, and he plucked another one out, peeling the paper off slowly, cruelly. I waited anticipating a harder task this time. Mouthful, he stood up. You know what your problem is, Mia? You, I bit the inside of my cheek to keep myself from answering because he would just add difficulty to my next routine. Discipline and all that, he claimed. I snorted, mentally. Discipline was the word he used to disguise cruelty. Your problem is that you still think you're human. Obviously, we were now in the lecture part of the day's lesson, so I didn't interrupt. He had told me this so many times, I could regurgitate his own words back to him. Point form, alphabetically, I bet I could even produce a neat debate essay on it. I swallowed a sigh. It wasn't as though I wasn't trying. I tried. I told my conscious, my subconscious, and my unconscious that I was not human anymore, that I was now a keeper, but they weren't listening to me. Zev wants me not to be soft with you, he shrugged. I think maybe I have been too easy. He had to be kidding me. This was easy? Burpees, push-ups, jumping push-ups, running, crocodile crawls, climbing, punching, kicking, headstands, half bows, Full bows, repeat, repeat, repeat. Well, to hell with him and Zev. I had gotten very adept at pushing away that awkward memory of Zev. But the dreams were torture, embarrassingly so. Raja said we were in another galaxy. Then why was I still dreaming him? Why did I see him when I closed my eyes? I swear, I didn't think about him all day. I killed the thoughts before they took form. Then why was my subconscious torturing me nightly? I should have never kissed him. That kiss was a bad idea. It changed everything. So today you're going to fight me, Raja said. That got my attention. I blinked up at him. I can't fight you. The very idea was ludicrous. Raja wasn't as tall as Zev. But he was just as muscular, his arms strained through the sleeves of his t-shirt and I could see the outline of a well-defined chest. Don't even get me started on his calves. Honestly, I never knew a man's calves could be sexy. He could literally kill me with little effort. You're going to fight me, he directed, and try to take this chocolate from my hand. I stood up and faced him, dressing my chin out. No thanks. I don't want the chocolate that much, he sighed, and suddenly the chocolate was in my hand. Fine, he said, then I'll fight you for it. What's the hell? I held out my hand to give it back to him, but he was already delivering a sweeping kick, tripping me to the ground. He plucked the chocolate from my hand, shaking his head and making no effort to hide a grin. To audacity. Like taking candy from a baby, he smirked, exceedingly pleased with his maneuver. I stood up, dusting myself off, wincing at the pain. My body wouldn't bruise. Zev had been right about the healing. I smelled the doubles before I saw it on my hand. My gaze riveted to him, alarm alerting my reflexes to buck up next time. Ooh, Raja cooed, grinning. Doubles. 
as if he didn't just put it there. He fisted his hands into fight position and approached me. Damn it. Here, you can have it. I had one week of training, one measly week, and while I would like to claim I miraculously gained mad fighting skills in that time, unfortunately, all I had gained for my effort was vicious physical pain. Of course, Raja didn't accept the doubles. No, he seemed to be having too much of a grand time with this new game. He jabbed. I ducked, scowling darkly at him. I am giving it to you. I'm a warrior. Raja donned a mask of completely faked horror. I need to hunt for my food. By fighting a woman? How brave you must be, O oh great warrior. I didn't even realize I had fisted my hands in response until I deflected a punch and jabbed back. His smile brightened. My heart pounded. Anxiety returning at the thought of fighting him, which apparently my body decided to do without my permission. I faltered in my defense and collected a right hook to my jaw. Ouch! But I'm not fighting a woman. I'm fighting a warrior, a keeper. I narrowed my eyes at him. If he was going to force me to do this, then I'll be damned if I didn't give, get at least a few shots in. Hi, my name is Faith and I am from the MFA program at UE. I'll be reading a short story entitled Scraps. So, have you ever seen Mr. Coleman leave his assigned post for a prolonged period of time? I lean back on the plastic chair, crossing my arms in an attempt to glance at the time on my watch. This was the sixth time this policeman asked me the same thing in a different way. I must look like a fool if they thought I wouldn't pick up on it. I hopped sharply, shifting my position again trying to display agitation. Only last week bossman warned me about signing in late for my ship, but yet these men won't let me leave. I wonder if they informed him that they would be questioning me? Bossman ass must be cutting nail right now, a murder and a missing person all on his scrapyard. I watched the officer cut eye before answering, no, and I will tell you again. I never saw him leave his post in the five years that I worked the ship system with, with him. I used to see him sitting in a chair over by the front gate of the yard if he wasn't stationed by the desk. He was always uptight, rigid. I didn't understand why he took this job so seriously. He wasn't a small talk kind of person to me. Scraps was a different kind of man. He used to walk into the building 15 minutes earlier than necessary to relieve me from my post. He would come, wait for me to remove my things from the desk and rest his neatly in the corner. I used to observe the man, only a curt good night, before standing off to the side as he waited for me to leave. It didn't feel rude or made me feel uncomfortable. It wasn't anything like that, so I just thought it was an age difference thing. Everyone on the scrapyard heard about the incident that happened last night, but no one had any real information about what happened. I wasn't surprised at him to find me. I was the last person to see Scraps last night when he came in for his shift. It was only a matter of a time. Officer Bird listened to me, but I knew he didn't believe what I was telling him. He jotted some more notes in that small piece of paper that looked like he ripped it quickly out of the book before coming to speak with me. That was only tactic. They could never be so careful in an investigation. They must feel I never watched CSI. Bert was nothing like his partner who, during my interrogation, was studying even the specks of dust that seemed misplaced in my room. The man didn't even try to hide the fact that he wanted answers. I offered them some information, but I didn't know. Sometimes, I, sometimes, when I forget something, I would have to circle back, and he would be standing up there, no radio on, no newspapers, just him sitting there by that desk. I couldn't, I didn't understand why. I couldn't say too much. I didn't want to incriminate myself about the murder investigation. So I told them it was, he was a diligent worker from what I ever noticed, and I'm sure boss man could attest to that. Officer Bert folded the paper and placed it into his pocket. I was surprised he found space with the amount of pens he had standing upright in that front pocket. All the more evidence that, that the carelessly ripped paper was just a decoy. Well, thank you for your time. If we have any more questions, we will find you. He stood holding his hand out for a shake. His partner already out of the door by the time Bert was ready to follow him. By the way, officer, 
Call the man Scraps. Nobody calls him Cool Man. Maybe that's why you can't find him yet. I pulled up to the scrapyard. I was already 20 minutes late. It was never a pleasure to be deafened by the cranes moving the old cars or the jackhammer crushing them to pieces, but today the scrapyard was silent. Clouds of dust and red sand swirled in the air as the few workers who were called out today hustled to complete their jobs. It wasn't hard to notice them avoiding the bright strips of caution tape quarantining off the eastern side of the yard. I slammed my door shut. I still had to be on guard duty, I thought bitterly. My name is Dara Healy and today I will be reading a story for you from the NGC Children's Bocas Litfest Storytelling Caravan. The name of the story is The Red House Bones and it was written by the children of Porto Spain. Crick crack! Let's start! The Red House Bones The Red House is the most important building. It is our Houses of Parliament where government does its work. One hot, sunny day, construction workers Michael, John, and Kashona were digging deep down under the Red House, which was old and needed to be repaired. Hey, look! Michael screamed suddenly, and he scrambled out of the hole. The other workers jumped out too, as Michael called Mr. Stephen, the site manager. Mr. Stephen, look, I see a set of bones down there. I think it's human bones. I'm not going back in there. While Mr. Stephen was trying to see what Michael was talking about, he accidentally fell into the hole where the bones were. It was dark down there, and Mr. Stephen stumbled as he stepped on the bones. He fell, landing on his face, right on top of a skull. As his sight adjusted to the dim light, he saw that the place was a grave full of bones. He tried to stand up and felt the pain in his ankle. He realized that he had twisted it. He had also broken his cell phone and it had fallen out of his pocket. Suddenly, Mr. Stephen became afraid and started screaming, help, help, get me out of here. Frank, Frank, help me, I can't walk. He called his supervisor. He was surrounded by skeletons. Frank had just gone to lunch, so he wasn't around for the drama. Call an ambulance. I have no money on my phone, said Krishona to Michael, who used his cell phone and telephoned the emergency line 999. Mr. Stephen was very relieved when the ambulance and fire services arrived and used a sling and ladders to lift him out of the hole. They took Mr. Stephen to the hospital. With the two bosses out of the picture, Michael, who discovered the bones, did the talking. Uh, I was shoveling concrete chunks, he told the reporters, when I see a face from a horror film looking at me. Only black space for eyes and grinning with half the teeth missing, he said. But when I look good, I see about two or three of them between the concrete casting. They must be hundreds of years old. 
the police sealed off the area with yellow tape. The next day, archaeologists from the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine and other experts came to run DNA tests on the bones to discover where they were from. For several months, professors and their students were busy scraping the ground and taking samples away in bags. Then one day, they made an announcement that the bones belonged to indigenous peoples, the ones who had lived in Trinidad and Tobago thousands of years before Christopher Columbus and the Spanish arrived in this part of the world. Many indigenous people still live in Arima and they were very excited about the find and came to Port of Spain with their shaman to bless the bones. The shaman looked around at the bones and told them that this had once been holy burial ground. He gave a warning to all present. Be careful. We must remember to respect these bones. They are our ancestors, the first people. The shaman told them that bad things would happen to anyone who harmed the bones or disrespected them in any way. An archaeological search was started to find and save all the bones. When all were gathered, the shaman performed a ceremony and the bones were removed and displayed in the Trinidad and Tobago Museum and Art Gallery for all to see. Crick crack! the end. Butter. Butter. Either any solid yellow to cream colored cooking fat, for example, blue band, I can't believe it's not butter, etc., or rarely a fat made from actual milk. Sometimes differentiated as fresh butter, salt butter, or red butter. Water. Water. A chemical compound of oxygen and hydrogen. It is a liquid at room temperature. According to soca singer Iwa George, the people want it. Me eh no. Me eh no. Me eh no. Me eh no. An expression indicating one's ignorance, as in, me eh know what time it is, na? See also, na. Na! Nah. 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 Either a negative reply or an interjection expressing outrage or incredulity. Nah is sometimes used at the end of a negative statement for emphasis, as in, Daisna itna. Stop your bow, Mr. Fiddler. Oh, ha, ha. This country so colorful and truly diverse. We're doing the best to put TNT first. Youth success through advancement, we encourage. We're proudly supporting the rich cultural heritage, promoting development in the sporting arena, and empowering women for equality of gender. We're sustaining the environment and strengthening the society. First citizens helping paint a brighter TNT. Drag your bow, Mr. Fiddler. Um, 
I've been performing since about 2008, 2012 um, and took a break after that. So this is really like my first performance in front of a crowd really um, since 2012. Um, my piece really would have been inspired by a lot of things that are going around, around us right now. Um, from the COVID pandemic to the economic crisis to elections. And I felt like tying that all up into one package and touching on several, several topics within one piece. See no evil, hear no evil, cover your mouth when you cough. 800,000 people dead. But what figure did it take for that to actually be a loss? Because while the vaccine sits in a lab, waiting for the price of life to finally meet its course, the slight of hand to defeat the thought, they tried to pull my strings but wondered why the hell these feel this thought. So instead, they painted pictures of their politicians to make them look the most pensive. Because while bodies piled upon bodies, they kept boasting about how much money that they already invested and where they invested. But can't tell us who making the millions or for the millions of test kits. But wait, at least we could celebrate because we didn't have to cancel the only two days that we could be festive. No, I, I can't say that. Well, all they must be watching me wandering dog. Nah. That is dark. You can't say them kind of thing anymore these days. No, my lad. So I can't say, oh, they make me sick to my stomach with your skylark. And I can't say, I just want to walk up to parliament and drop 41N95 masks. Yeah, I had to be careful what I say because by the end of this piece, double G could be in my DM saying that he find I cross. Plus, all them misfits up to mischief. Note, I am nobody to mess with. You see them AR 15s flooding the street. Well, <laughs> they're funded by one of my friends from my end of year guest list. Who else you think of bringing them bootleg Versace shirts so that I just go them fet with? So, speak no evil. And hear no evil, but Lady Law is no longer blindfolded because justices make judgments based on judgments that all have political motives. Because greed is a disease that here way longer than COVID and not just scratching the surface of our fabric. Nah, that's ingrained and it's soaked in. And every five years we try to wash it off, but it's the same pain that we vote in for men who live in high rise hotels but should be sleeping in Golden Grove in. I choking on Sahara dust only to find out is them lies that they're smoking. It's like our ancestors had to let us know lessons on distraction concepts. Because while we can't breathe and we eyes burn in the day, we still find time to smile at the dustmate sunsets. It's like when poor people sit down to eat a plate filled with doubt, but we still pushing money behind failed soccer contests. Or like when we continuously borrowing billions in bonds. But we study in Stuarty, falling out with some steps, a sling of nonsense. I only have four minutes, but I have a few more things to confess. So turn your volumes up so you can understand this clearly. A midnight rubber lashing, so with each word I don't know they fear me. This is a stay at home order for your thoughts that like to run carefree. So speak no evil and see no evil. But <laughs> you see, as soon as somebody starts to talk some sense. All of a sudden, nobody can hear me. Sila.
brand new painting Ever changing me and you Things change and who knows how But now, now Is now Miss Jillian Moore I find your music real nice. You have anything new coming out? Yes, I have a new album. It's oh. called Ever Changing. Ever Changing. Because since I reach, everything changed. Well, that is the truth. I mean, it, you, your arrival has put everything in a whole new context. I see. But we're going forward with the album and the reaction has been good. So I'm really happy about that. Okay, okay. Let me a little something to me now. This is so cute. Thank right. you. I like Wait. them, but they're not my style, if uh, you know what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> this is not your style at all. Mm. Wear them in good health, and I hope you get you with what you're looking for. Ever changing. Thank you. So yes, much. That, that music was nice. I appreciate it. Thanks I really enjoy that music. Cool. Tell a friend. Enjoy. Enjoy. All right. so, Bye. I know in time. Right there. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope everybody there know Boki because I can't wait to spread my positivity. Oh no! No, I don't have anything. It have no signs, mm -hmm. no signs, nothing, no body, no people. Yes. Every time it have the NGC Bokas Lit Fest, it does have signs and it have volunteers and all kind of thing. It's not here. I ain't think it's happening this year, Buki. It's not happening here. Maybe somewhere else? Look, look, Abbe Bele. Who's Abbe Bele? You don't know no, Abbe Bele? Abbe Bele is the top ex tempo Calypsonian in Trinidad and Tobago. Stop, stop, stop. Come and hear you because of the corona. With all the talent that you have indeed. The pressure you're going on faces like the bread is Supper. You can come with us. Well, you're going now. I've written five books and two poetry pamphlets by now. And the things I write uh, are somewhere between drama and music and essays, uh, but nowadays they get marketed as poems. Well, I, I think Bocas needs and deserves and has an international place in literature, and that uh, the wonderful confluence of cultures and languages in the archipelago is uh, homologous or similar to the confluence of styles 
and the sort of up and down of tragedy and comedy and different forms that you get within one Shakespeare play. So it seemed to be very fitting. And of course, the, the other very great thing with this year's Bukas Festival is the honouring of people through press. Because I was talking before about the historical contingency that has made Shakespeare prominent, as well as, as the worth of the plays. And the thing that a publisher like People Tree does is to create a freedom of the contingencies of publishing and distribution by really putting books out there, putting people into print, and then getting the books to readers. I was very impressed by Marina Salandi Brown's talking directly about writers needing to earn a living, books needing to be published and distributed in the region, and uh, prizes and festivals as having a role in that. The Bukas Lit Fest is ornithological because it's like a forest of many colored and beautiful birds. This is a fantastic crossroads culture, you know, and so many people have come to this region and have made life here. I just saw a fascinating documentary about the Americans. At my big old age, it's the first time I'm hearing about the Americans. I didn't know about these soldiers who joined the British Army and then were relocated in Trinidad, in Moruga, after the 18, you know, 12 to 16 war. So it's, you know, you learn something new and we have to keep sharing these stories. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that it's very easy in, in, in the Caribbean, in fact, in a lot of de developing countries, to forget culture. Um, especially now in Trinidad, of course, now that you have a, a, a recession and, and, and so on, and you know, in Jamaica and so on. Um, so attempts, not only for culture, but for literary culture, because your know, culture could be carnival, culture could be all kinds of things, but a literary culture, that means that um, one of the things that we need to survive is the imagination. <laughs> And there is ways in which you can feed the imagination, but certainly literature is a very important way of doing so. And it should never ever get either sidelined or you know, short, get short shrift. And that festivals like this make sure that you get exactly what you're doing now. You, get, you highlight what's going on, people buy books, and they look forward to the next one. So what do you hope that people go away with when they leave the festival? Well, I think, I think they will go away with a nostalgia, <laughs> which means they'll come to the next one. <laughs> That's the first thing. I think secondly, they will also um, have a sense that um, there's a wealth of writing out there. And in the same way I did, and in fact, I, I'm a teacher of literature, but I discovered stuff. So I could well imagine people who read simply for pleasure, read you know, in a very um, kind of uh, you know, personal way, they must find also wonderful things that will keep them interested, entertained, for at least until the next one comes along. All right, thank you, Mr. Mm. Nash. Okay. Much. When you read, it's a private affair. So people read privately in their bedrooms, and at best they might have a book club to share what they're reading. And this is like a showcase for the literature of the region. And um, so it kind of unpacks what people are writing. And people get, you know, so you have it, you, have, you put the face to the book and um, you get to ask questions. So it really is a marvellous way to honour and celebrate the diverse um, uh, wealth of talent uh, we have in the Caribbean, not just the old, the first generation, the sort of, you know, the, the generation, the Walcott generation, but there's an emerging generation and another emerging generation. There's just so many people writing now um, that it's a great leveller. So you have um, emerging writers um, reading or on panels with or able to connect with really big names and they're all standing on, in the same room and, and you get people who don't dare say they're a writer yet and yet you have writers calling them writers and being inclusive. So it's an incredible thing in order to so stimulate growth. Um, and stimulating identity. So, you know, you don't know you're a writer until you kind of, um, well, you do the work, but also you look at you, you, the first time I knew I was a writer was when I was in a room full of writers and they just looked just like me. They just, you know, you, you can get through your life um, and you can meet when you're a little, you know, a policeman or a ballerina, you see them all on TV, the possible job options. You know, when you're young, you're kind of working out what you might be when you grow up but you, you'll never meet a writer. 
because they're, they're just not, they're not part of society in the same way. They don't have an office and they don't have a uniform and they don't have a, a place where you can find them. So festivals are where I would say young emerging writers can kind of rest their eyes on um, someone like Marlon James and go, oh my God, that dude wears a tracksuit, you know, he's just wearing a bandana and a, and a pair of Nike trainers and, you know, oh, he looks a bit like me, you know, or someone could go, can just look at women and go, oh, what women write? Or, you know, it's just the whole thing is, it, it's, um, it's a great thing to stimulate growth. My name is Ronald Ricardo Phillips. I'm a poet. Um, I also do other type of writing. I write literary criticism. I do translation. I do some narrative nonfiction and a little bit of sports writing. But kind of the way that I understand the world is through poetry. It's my first time at Bocas Lit Fest and my first time in Trinidad. I'm really happy that my first time here in this country is through such a marvelous organization. I've had a lot of fun with the people and all the events. It's been an introduction that's better than I could have hoped for. I've been to a lot of festivals. And so I have expectations that festivals are going to behave like festivals. They'll have their highs, they'll have their lows, uh, they'll have their richnesses, but also sometimes where you, oh, just need a break. But I've really been breathless the whole time I've been here. It's been nothing but highs. Uh, each panel has been something I've wanted to be at, the congeniality of the people, and just, it's been um, kind of seamless and beautiful. And I didn't expect to have this non-stop love affair with the fest, but it's really been non-stop. I get here as early as I can, which is usually not my style, to be honest, between us, and I stay as late as it runs every day. It's just been marvelous. It's spectacularly run. Bocas is different in the sense, I think, that it understands the, it understands the marriage between culture and literature, but in a way that seems, I've used this word before, but seamless natural. You don't feel cut off from Trinidad. You don't feel cut off from the Caribbean. We could talk about literature, but it also has to do with political situations. It all has to do with music. It also has to do with sports. I, my first day here, I was on, uh, I sat in the audience and panels about cricket, about Calypso, and then of course about books. And it was all happening as one conversation, which is really beautiful. In the world of natural gas, Trinidad and Tobago enjoys an enviable reputation. This is not by chance. For over three decades, one company has led the way in shaping the country's unique energy sector and facilitating its growth. The National Gas Company of Trinidad and Tobago, NGC. NGC is a diversified energy company playing a key role in the development of Trinidad and Tobago's energy policy and increasingly sophisticated energy economy. Hello, my name is Avion. 
And today, I'll be telling you a story from the NGC Children's Boca Slit Fest Storytelling Caravan. This story was written by children of San Fernando, and it's called Last Train to San Fernando. I hope you enjoy it. Penelope always had to go to work early, but first she had to take her six-year-old daughter, Jada, to school. One hot Tuesday morning, they both overslept. They were going to be late to catch their usual train from Port of Spain to San Fernando, so they had to get dressed speedily. Then they grabbed their bags and kissed Daddy goodbye as they ran out of the house. They were running through their neighborhood towards the main road when Jada suddenly stopped. What are you doing? asked Penelope. We're going to miss the train. I forgot my lunch kit on the counter, Jada said timidly. You have got to be kidding me. Jada, you're stressing me out. If we miss the train, it will be your fault. That was incredibly careless of you, Penelope shouted. Jada was ashamed because they had to run back home and people heard Penelope yelling at her. Forgot something? asked Daddy as he passed her lunch kit over the front gate. Wouldn't want you to forget your favorite lunch, bread and egg, he added. Penelope rolled her eyes. Thanks, darling. See you later, huffed Penelope as they ran in the opposite direction. Twenty minutes and one jumpy taxi ride later, they arrived at the train station all sweaty and nervous. The train station was a complete mess, with people swarming like bees as far as the eye could see. We have to get on that train. If we don't, we would have to walk all the way to San Fernando, she told her daughter. It's all your fault that we have to wait on all these people to get on the train, she continued angrily as they joined the long, long line. Jada paced nervously back and forth, worried that her teacher would be angry with her if she arrived late. After what seemed like an eternity, they finally had two tickets in hand. Suddenly, a loud whistle came from the train. It meant that it would be leaving in five minutes. Penelope and Jada ran with the wind towards it. Penelope got on first. As soon as Jada was about to step on board, the train conductor said, That's it. The train is full. No more people on board. Penelope rushed to his side. Sir, I need to get on with my daughter. We have to get to San Fernando for 8 o'clock. We already paid for our tickets. I'm sorry, ma'am but there isn't enough space for both of you, replied the conductor. Penelope was furious, but the conductor was just doing his job. He could not overfill the train because that would be dangerous. Time was running out. The train gave another whistle and Jada began to cry. Please, Mr. Train Master, I'm begging you, let her on, pleaded Penelope. But when it seemed like there was no hope and they would have to walk, an angel spoke up. She can take my seat, said Simran, Penelope's good friend. Thank you so much, Simran. You have no idea what this means to me. You must come over and have dinner with us soon, Penelope said. It's no trouble. I was just going for a joyride. Hope you have a great day, Simran replied. Penelope dragged Jada onto the train and they were soon off. As Jada got to her seat, she took a huge sigh of relief. 
They were so happy they didn't miss the last train to San Fernando. Twenty twenty marks ten years of TNT's National Literary Festival, and it's the first ever virtual NGC Booker Slitfest. It's packed with stories, talk, readings, extempo, poetry, new talent, and of course, surprises. Eighteen events, eighty participants. Friday, eighteenth to Sunday, twentieth September. Catch it all via Facebook, YouTube, and on the Booker's website. BocasLitFest.com Connected and entertained with broadband bundles designed for you with Flow Starter and Advanced Plans. You can enjoy faster speeds to stream more of what you love. Get free access to the best shows, series, and movies with HBO Go. And connectivity on the go with free Flow Wi-Fi. Packages start from as low as $295 and no contract required. Visit discoverflow.co to sign up today. Flow, keeping you connected.
Welcome, welcome, welcome. Day two of Stand and Deliver. Today is Saturday. I hope you've been enjoying the Bocas Lit Fest so far. We celebrated 10 years. So first off, let's say congratulations to the entire team at the NGC Bocas Lit Fest. Celebrating 10 years. That's no easy feat. You see how many things have been going on. And here's another one. Today is Stand and Deliver. My name is Rokas and I'm going to take you through it as best as I possibly can. Let us start off with some Obia from Adam. Andrews. Obia is like a scissors, a hammer or a knife. All it is is a tool. It is different from the hammer and the knife and the scissors because Obia is not a tangible tool. It is a tool of the mind. If you want to shape wants and desires to control energy, you use Obia. Just like you wouldn't use a hammer to cut cloth or a knife to ram a nail into a piece of ply, there are things to not use Obia for. Like with all tools, what Obia do is somewhat up to the wielder of the tool. It have things Obia good for and things it not good for. Obia as a tool is really meant to be a bridge, a thing that connects this world of being to other worlds of being and not being. It connects the tangible to the intangible. It could help you to see pathways, the places jumpy go and the people jumpy like. What Obia are not good for, like most tools, is self-interest. But then that never stopped them from using a hammer or scissors or knife for self-gain either. So when Papa see the piece of sky, when he see the piece of sky, it was almost like he had no choice. Papa don't deal with the white man religion. His science was a deeper thing, an older thing, with more gods, each god with its own secrets and mysteries. Papa know about energy and power. He know about things of the flesh and things of a different nature, things lacking form supernatural things. He knew that when his people first start crossing the sea, it was on their own. It wasn't plenty of them. No exodus out of Egypt. It was the few. The lonely ones. The driven ones. The banished ones. The restless ones and sometimes even godless ones. Restless or godless and everything in between they still all crossed with jumbies. Each had their jumbie inside them. Some had the jumbies of others, but they all crossed with the Moko jumbie. Moko is a good jumbie, protectors and guardians. <clears throat> when they paddling across, going further and further into sky, suddenly Moko appear in front. His long, long legs dropping down through the seawater and finding sea floor. Moko walked them straight into the new lands. Same thing happened when they crossed again. Thousands of years later, as white man property. When they did not leave their homes but were taken. Before their eyes, Moko in the water, leading the way, visible only to some of them. Not everybody had the sight. Moko don't show himself each and everywhere. Papa know these things. He know too that Moko stay with the people. After the water cross, there was no crossing back. Nowhere else for Moko to go. Moko don't have the same power on land like over water. Over water they tall, tall, touching sky and star pointing away steering ships through storms. On land, Moko shrink down to the size of man. They sing songs and see the dream world clearer than man. Still, Moko now come like man. He feel man things. He still want to guard and protect, but not all the time again. Sometimes Moko feel lust and love, even rage. All this, Papa know. 
We are inside the stand and deliver. Thank you very much, Adam. We're gonna keep it moving one time. Up next, ah, guys, I want you to take in the background here for sure, for sure, for sure. But also pay attention to what she's saying. Here comes Carissa, a chat. Nature's tunes. The morning restores color to the canopy, several shades of green. There's a magical and spiritual effect occurring through the windows to my soul. As the sun rises over Holo Mountain to give us our personal dawning, two parrots are flying over the valley. One is going in a straight line, the other glides to the right, and I imagine in their usual raucous manner, they are deciding if this valley is a worthy breakfast stop, or if they should continue westward. One said, come on, I know a good place, while the other replied, let's stop here, I know it's a fruitful spot. This very thought has reminded me of my love for writing, and I now think how fulfilling it would be to write for children. The sweet sounds of the mountain and its valley call to me. Despite the other neighborhood noises, like random dogs barks and cock doo doos reggae music in the distance, and the truck's engine revving for power heading up the steep mountain road, I can full joy nature's tune. I smile now because one of my favorites just played. Mango is falling. Today on this sunny, clear sky yet windy day, the birds are noisily picking at those juicy bear mangoes which hang 50 feet in the air and 20 feet away from me. I am almost eye level with them, but a safe distance for the birds to eat freely. It is during the wind and the rain that I can hear many more mangoes falling. The sound of the rain as if thousands of foot soldiers are preparing to battle and the thunderclap and its stole of fierce and readiness. The other day after the first rains, we got a lovely set of sweet long mangoes. I sat right where I am now and ate three in a row. It was a real delight because we had been eyeing them since the season started and got them before the birds. As I observed the woody woodpecker chomping on the pomerac tree filling up on termites, I discerned a few other bird sounds. The lovely whistles of our early morning visitors for as long as I can remember, the blue jay couple. The kiskitty is calling too, while above me in a little straw home, booby birds are cheeping for mama to bring food. A brown dove just passed close to me, its wings catching my attention before it landed on the same tree the woodpecker feeds on. There it goes without a sound. I've noticed the birds are always observing us, but if it catches you watching, it takes flight. What shy creatures! Occasionally a honeybee gets lost and hangs around the house buzzing. And do you know the butterflies too have a noticeable sound when they are playing and chasing one another? The sound of the seagulls are taking over for a moment. You'd be surprised at how loud those creatures are. In the distance and higher up the mountain, I hear some parrots who fly in with the most noise. In a crew of eight plus, often intermingled with corn birds. They are coming and there are a lot of those noise makers. Wind blows in from many directions and sometimes at the same time. I can hear the wind coming up the valley, see it blow past some trees and then it arrives where I am and the treetops sway, the bamboo moans and the leaves rustle. Those not strong enough take off, first in a mini whirlpool and then they go free and light gliding through the sky. I can further attest to this destructive nature the wind element can bring. The movement can be quick and the wear fast. So sighting the fall of an ancient tree is rare. However, the sound is inescapable. The cracking of the tree bark as its roots are torn from the earth is its farewell call, and the moment of warning before it crashes to the earth to continue nature's cycle. The light breeze makes the colorful glass chimes above me tinkle, while the bamboo chimes can only be moved by the strong wild wind, the kind that we often hear and sometimes see before we actually feel. The kind that can take you as a chariot to a portal of paradise. This wind blows me to my arrow beach, where the sound of the waves crashing on the shores are pervasive and constant, like the strong breeze which caresses my face and blows through my locks. It's so cool and refreshing that I can smell the ocean free. I sit in my hammock absorbing the early morning sun rays just fanning over the Hololo mountain as I recall vivid and warm memories while I watch the sea beyond the little V of trees. All my senses have been activated by this exposure and submission to the elements. It's our way of living. We abide in harmony with nature. 
I and I remain connected to the positive energies that is creation. To us, it's a natural liberty. All right, we inside stand and deliver inside the focus lit fest 2020. And guys, I want you to always remember that this space is a loving, welcoming space where we don't judge, but we can give criticism, constructive criticism. So feel free to reach out to any of the artists you see here because they're sharing their work with you in hope that you can share some feelings with them so they know how to, you know, continue development and which direction to go in next and that kind of thing. And it's always good to give artists constructive feedback. All right, so up next, I want to welcome to the stage, front and center, Mr. Nathan Nanku. The reason why, as I traverse through these desolate fields, the fields I grew up believing only the weakest mind's wheel is safe even that to those who don't accept reality, I conceal. I begin to ponder on what is actually real. Hmm. What I'm about to say in the future may be appealed, although what I cogitate most of you as well feel. But to speak them to society is not ideal. For this statement to many, it may not appeal. The kids, they say, are next generation, the ones that will save us from this discoloration. But in the same line, they say we are an abomination, completely contradicting their acclamation. But the truth is, abominations or artists, we are all doomed. Unless the world changes its perception on darkness and gloom. For the ones who made the mess refuse to let us vacuum, they refuse to let us abloom, they refuse to entomb their hazardous, obsolete habitudes, but instead leave us with screaming sirens, insincere sounds, self-righteous opposition, pleading riots everywhere confounds, a denovirus takes commission, skyscrapers fall, unsheathed swords, shields lay in the earth broken. Abductors enthrall undefeated oars, battlefields with scattered tokens. Shrapner flying, slavery still fighting, sick and no medicine. Missiles flying, the unsavory brightening, politics senseless with no comparison. Slaughtered lies, socialized cries. Significant slowly dying. Now, every day is like watching an action movie, only 10 times more serious. Boom, crack, slash, slash, bash, crash. Just why? How many more nations bombed before a worldwide reset is applied? What is the point of trying anymore if, in the end, everybody is going to die? How many more of our leaders will be lying? How many more mothers, now childless, will have to cry? When will they learn that justice is not an eye for an eye? How do we remove the cause of this? This violence. The answer lies within you and I. So now I look up at the melancholy soaked sky. I have my plans to survival. But the rest of the world. <sighs> Boom! My building just shook. It's time to fight this war with guns, with shelter, with water to pour, with clothes, with food, with water that's pure, with a bountiful deeds, not the void words. They will tell you that attaining perfection is surreal. They are correct, but only to an extent. As perfection is the intent to make something exactly how you want it, and attaining such is unreal. But we can still make it better than this disaster right now that we need to repeal. I'm on that attack. It's time to leave these fields. For now I know that this is what is real. My mission 
My mission is to open these artist's eyes before our fate is sealed. Now we take on this responsibility of ensuring the earth is healed. Ah, thank you very much, Nathan. We're going to keep it moving. Up next, I want you to journey with us, right? Because Noreen Duncan is going to take us on a journey to the past and tell you a part of the story that you've probably never heard about before. Noreen, come and tell us about Mrs. Morales, please. Mistress Morales, they say when the Yankees came to Trinidad, they did something with a Coca-Cola bottle to Mrs. Morales something that the Andrews sisters and Harry Belafonte couldn't sing about. One of those American soldiers was supposed to have been her first husband, but the only one of her children who may have been the child of that union could not have been. For though that daughter had green eyes, she had very Chinese-looking eyelids, somewhat like her mother, who was herself half Chinese, as they say. The other half always assumed to be African or Creole, not anything else. Mrs. Brown, she was, as a result of the marriage to the American, and her next child after the green-eyed Suman was a dark, curly-haired, pretty-looking boy, Junior, Junior to whom was not talked about or even guessed at, as Mrs. Brown was properly and formally married, although the American soldier of that name had never lived in her house or been recalled by anyone who could remember the order and names of her stream of husbands and boarders. When she was obviously pregnant with Junior, she would walk out to the main room to get a taxi to town to the cinema on a Sunday afternoon, beautifully erect and shapely, smoking a cigarette, another habit clearly imported with the Americans who were no longer in Trinidad, the Premier and Spyro having run them out, off of their base before the 99-year lease was up. For that bit of nationalistic cheek, the Premier, who then became Prime Minister, a doctor from Oxford University, was elected and re-elected for many years, eventually becoming the father of the nation before his mysterious death. Sparrow also became a doctor, the honor bestowed on him by the Princess Royal herself, she never having attended university, but in her loyal capacity, royal capacity, allowed to come down from England to award degrees on behalf of the university. For Sparrow's contributions to the nation, music in particular, Calypso specifically. Mrs. Brown was the kind of woman despised and secretly admired by Trinidadian women, but adored by Trinidadian and quite possibly American men. By the time she married Mr. Morales and posed in her front yard for the camera with all of her children around her and the respectable neighbors in attendance, elegantly pregnant again, no one knew what had happened to Soldier Brown, how she could have divorced him or when, since he had never really been seen, although there was talk of an American-looking man lounging on her front veranda once. During that period, the neighbors saw her working hard in her front garden, keeping her premises respectable, in spite of the spite and behind her back ridicule of those same neighbors, the wives every now and then loudly and publicly. It was common neighbor knowledge that she had had a past, and what was so scandalous was that she didn't pretend otherwise, and wasn't concerned about the neighbor's view and talk about that past, or her unusual present. She conducted her life in full view, much of it on her front veranda, or in her front yard, or her little driveway, and God forbid in the street in front of her house, and often in front of their respectable neighbor houses. The women in Mrs. Morales's suburb had servants to prepare their noontime meals and boys to tend their front and kitchen gardens. She not only cooked for herself and her mother who lived with her and her boarders and her husbands and her children and laid her on for their children and their husbands and boarders, for her daughters each had more than one husband, which was a marvel to her respectable neighbor wives that any self-respecting man would marry into that family and so many did. What was even more marvelous was that she did this common work with such grace, sometimes even going away of the islands for rest, which was more than the neighbor wives could do or stand the thought of. Except that they went to Mayar Road, Tobago for a few days, not many went away to the States or England or even Venezuela on holiday in those days, but here she was traveling away on vacation. From what? And then, when Mr. Morales joined the household and fathered a couple more children whom she delivered with the usual grace and effortlessness, he stayed behind while she went away on those trips. He appeared to be beaten down anyway, and there was talk that he was not really the man he was supposed to be, and that must have been true, or he took the talk to heart, 
for he became a noticeable alcoholic, and that was of unheard of then, and he had to go away somewhere. Talk was that Mrs. Morales found him drunk in a rum shop in Arima and told him not to come back to her house. As the owner of the rum shop was a woman with more power than she in any way, he was probably living part of the time behind the rum shop with the rum shop owner. Thank you very much, Noreen, for that riveting, exciting story. Um, <laughs> we're gonna keep it moving instead, stand and deliver. Here comes Osunkemi Ojek Bemi to give us a piece from her book. As I stepped into the cottage, I felt like I was transported to another dimension. Its humble exterior did no justice to what the interior had to offer. I felt a sense of belonging, a very strong feeling of familiarity. The entire interior was into navy blue, making me feel like I had walked into the great depths of the river. African artifacts of all kinds, drums, masks, wooden figures were everywhere. They were on the walls, the shelves, tables, and in strategically placed positions on the ground. There was a stretched leopard skin on the ground that served as a covering for the dirt floor in the middle of the room. On one of the walls was a round mirror which had cowrie shells embedded on its round frame. This mirror reflected the flowers of the garden on the outside, which were visible through an open window that allowed the sunlight to filter into the dark room. It was almost story-like in appearance, making me feel like I was in the middle of a fairy tale. I felt an instinctive jolt of energy run through my entire body, something that always happened to me any time I felt a strong spiritual connection in a space. Nana always told me that this was the way I could tell if something was authentic. So that was the universe confirming to me that Yamato was someone I can trust. I stood in amazement in the middle of a small space, taking it all in. As I was admiring a quaint lantern that was sitting on a shelf, I noticed Yamato bending to pick up a book from a small table in the room. I was standing behind her as she was picking up the book, and as she was doing so, she told me that this was a room where she attended to the things of the forest. I wondered about her statement and waited to hear more and she turned to face me with the book in her hand. She then said, Pinky, this is a very special book that I have been waiting to give you at the appointed time. She came closer to me, enabling me to get a better look at it as she held it in her hands. The cover of the book was royal blue with a red border all around it. It looked very old, tattered and worn, and I noticed that the clothes that she had on were the same color as the book cover. She was holding it between her two hands, her left hand under it and her right hand on top of it. The way that she was holding it indicated to me that it was of great importance. She held it with reference. She continued to say, This is a tool for you to use to help people when they are not well. It is the book of life. All you need is a person's name, and when you turn to the page that has their name written on it, this book will reveal to you all that they need to know about their situation. It is a book of healing which is very sacred and must never leave the forest. Do not share this information with anyone. I will bury it at the front of my cottage in a pile of dirt for you. Whenever you need to use it on behalf of others, come to the forest to retrieve it. The protocol is for you to knock on my door to let me know that you are here. Then you go and dig it up to refer to the page with the person's name on it who is in need of assistance. All the names of humanity are recorded here. And because it is a book of magic, there is no way that you can comprehend how it works. After using it and recording what it says, put it back where you dug it up from and cover it back with the same dirt that keeps it hidden. After you do this, knock on my door to say thank you. You do not have to see me when you come. All you have to do is follow the protocol and go to help the person who is requesting assistance. This was a lot to take in, but somehow didn't sound as strange as some would believe it should. You see, there were two things that immediately came to my attention. The first thing being, Nana asked me when I was just five years old if I believed in magic. And the second thing was a very intimidating incident that occurred when I was an adult and lay sick in bed. The occasion when a voice spoke to me, telling me that one of my friends was ill and that I was the one to help them. Once again, I felt dots connected that were many years apart. As I was having these thoughts, 
the amateur was looking at me with penetrating eyes, and I knew that she knew everything I was thinking. She did not say a word. Instead, she just quietly went outside to bury the book, as she said she would, and I followed her to see where she was going to put it. After she finished burying it, she told me that she knew that I had many questions. She advised that I let everything sink in first so that we could discuss it at another time. They say if you don't know your past, you're doomed to repeat it. And I think that it's really important if we pay attention to people's story, and sometimes they can apply to your life and to your story. And here to tell us a little bit more about that is Mr. Wilfred. As a matter of fact, Wilfred, come on and introduce yourself for me, please. My name is Wilfred Holden. My book is One Man's Journey. It's a story of de de dedication, determination, commitment and perseverance. I consider it an honor that you are here and that I have the opportunity to share my journey with you. As you read on the following pages, my life experience has included some incredible challenges, challenging times, as well as some amazing blessings. I encourage you to read my story with your life in mind. You'll learn much about what I've experienced and what I've overcome to achieve success fulfillment, purpose, and joy. That is what I want for you, my readers. Contained in my book are the following chapters. One, I wasn't born with a gold spoon in my mouth. Two, off to the world of work. Three, a dream come true. Four, how I got started in the life insurance business. Five, the start of a career and business. Six, back to my native land. Seven, live a life happens and circumstances change. Eight, the voice of a giant. Nine, second chance. Ten, the unexpected. Eleven, venture into the unknown. Twelve, a decision of my life. And thirteen, return the Virgin Therapy, 14, a passion, vision, and mission, and 15, Trinidad, living our dream. I wasn't born with a gold spoon in my mouth, far from it. I was named Wilfred Holder after my dad. Six months after my birth, life took an unexpected turn when my father requested a divorce. Suddenly, my 26-year-old mother had to figure out how to financially provide for us. She had helped her, my father with his business, but without any real work experience, it was, wasn't likely she would find a job quickly. Lucky for her, my dad allowed us to stay in one of his houses he owned where we lived for three years. During this tense time, mom remained strong as ever, refusing to see herself as a victim of circumstances considering she got married at the age of 16. She tapped into her Christian faith, passion and swimming, and cricket to cope with the grief and pain. I, in turn, inherit her strong Catholic belief and a strong sense of faith and service. One of the greatest lessons she said, one of the greatest lessons she taught me as a child was never to give up in the face of life challenges. Life is a journey that should be enjoyed. She maintained and not a destination. Knowing I have been able to reach people is a miracle. Life insurance to me will never have boundaries. I will continue to dream and, and love a place of service, from a place of service. I am proud of the blessings God has bestowed upon me. Not only has he given me a life of purpose and faith in him, but he also blessed me with a wonderful wife, Kay, who recently died two months ago, and to two sons, Christopher and David who have been a source of strength and support. I continue to raise my cup of gratitude. Thanks to you, God, for touching my life and so many others. 
All right, thank you very much there, Mr. Holder, for reading that piece for us from your book, One Man's Journey. And speaking of journeys, this one is about to come to an end, but before we do that, we have a very important spelling class for you, courtesy Yashoda Oli. Did she stutter when she said no? How can one simple two-letter word happen to be the most difficult? is beyond me. No. An act of insistently refusing, the act of denying, expected by the user to achieve the response of denial received, but some way, somehow, it takes more than just a preschool vocabulary lesson, more than just a simple exercise on the manipulation of the simple two-letter word, no. Let me hit you with the best most modern yet backward 21st century spelling test. N O no. N for never, O for oppress, but some see it as new opportunities. Say less. Just the simple yet most complicated two letter mountain turned your vocabulary into this big mess that it is. Though, it's clearly not as simple as it seems, I can say. Like you don't understand English or what? But that's the thing. <laughs> English, Spanish, French, it all sounds the same, but yet, as simple as it gets, you'd always think that yes means yes and no means yes. From the beginning of time, women have been collecting the shards of the glass ceiling in their backs from the floor. Some dead, some hurt. But after much grueling and history, we've managed to break through, letting the glass fall into the dirt. But little did we know, it would grow into a glass blade tree, watered with our own blood, sweat, tears, especially the tears, nourished by our own fears. Not doing a grafted plant of yes and no would bear a new scratch-proof glass box that cannot be broken after it's grown underestimating its strength thinking it's not a task to take off half of the length but how can you fix a problem without checking the root first instead they all try to help by cutting off just a small branch of the entire tree you see she was accustomed to reading the headings shadowed by the shallow headlines so shallow that you can't see the truth it's just the way it is. You see, she turned past the first page, knowing that the stories that matter are way past the political sketches. Never did she think she'd be the next victim that this dim spotlight catches, trapped in the glass box of the newly grafted tree that had been there from long before. That had actually been there from a long time before. It's just that the roots took centuries to grow, little shoots here and there. And well, Grandma's own cannot kill that now. It drinking that. It's a task to go back, but everything is possible. It's a task to go back, given for a fact. It took years of conditioning human beings to think that yes means yes and no means yes. I want you to give a big round of applause to all of our performers and readers that came on screen today because guys, it's not easy to come on stage. It's even harder to do this virtually. Trust me when I tell you that. But I want to thank each and every one of them and I know that you appreciated all of it as well. I want to thank all of the artists from yesterday as well inside Sand and Deliver. My name is Rokas and I want to wish that you continue to watch the Bocas Lit Fest 2020. We celebrate in 10 years. We have more programming tomorrow. So please don't go anywhere. As a matter of fact, you know where to go? BocasLitFest.com. You can get all the information you need right there. Thank you very much for locking it down and see you next time. After party today, guys? Any? No? Uh, well, yeah? All right. <laughs>
Brian. The leguminous tamarindus indica tree and its fruit, which is made into tamaran juice, tamaran sauce, and tamaran bowl. Branches from this tree are still used in parts of the Caribbean as a behavior modification incentive known as a tamaran whip. An interjection expressing shock, surprise, or outrage. One, two, three, three, three. Integer following two and preceding four, as in one, two, three, four. See also four. One, two, three, four, four. Either an integer following three and preceding five, as in three, four, five, see also three, or before, as in what are you doing in the road four day morning? Patang. 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 A mongrel of unknown mixed breeding, also known as a Caribbean terrier. As in, that little patang you afraid? I say it's a alley station. Hi, I am Lila Prasad, also known as Auntie Lila, and today we will be reading from the NGC Boca Slit Fest Children's Caravan Storytelling Book. Today, our story is My Birthday Wish, and it was written by some children in Tunapuna in Trinidad. So let's have a read. I am Yolando Karambukas, and I live on St. Vincent Street in the bustling town of Tunapuna. My family inherited this old wooden house that is situated halfway along our street. My dad works on a farm for a businessman and my mother is a cashier at a nearby supermarket. I am told that I am kind, loving and proud. I have many good friends. For this, I am very happy. One Sunday morning, my mother observed that I was particularly quiet. What's wrong? Mummy asked me, as she had never seen me in this mood before. Mom, I just can't take any more of this, I told her. Almost every weekend a friend invites me to spend time with him and he usually treats me very well. But I will never be able to do the same for anybody. Just once, I wish I, wish I could have a big birthday party and tell all my friends to come. I would have a huge cake with a picture of my face and the word that says, Happy birthday to Yolando on it. That would be the best birthday party I could ever have. But how can I do all this if I don't have any money? It took three days before my mom could convince me that everything would be all right. I am blessed with a skill. I can draw well. So whenever I'm sitting quietly wondering about my future or birthday party, I usually do some sketching on any piece of paper that I could find. My parents noticed this and they really appreciated my talent. So when they went out, they would bring me sheets of brown paper and cut up cardboard, you know, so I can use for my art. Also, my teacher who had seen me drawing in school kindly gave me some extra poster paints from her cupboard. One day, while I was sitting quietly in my room, drawing with my crayons and paints, my mother observed that I had sketched a particularly beautiful scene of our neighborhood. You know, Lando, that's what she used to call me for short. You know, Lando, you are really quite good at this. Can you draw some other things for me? You know, people around you, some other scenes. For example, the last time you and Calvin went to fetch fish by the river. Can you draw those? I cheered myself up during the next few weeks, drawing all kinds of things. I was so pleased 
and proud of all my drawings that I stuck them around the walls of our house. Just imagine, four walls of my work. By the end of the week, working for an hour every day from six in the morning and from five in the evening, I had drawn more than a dozen pictures. They amazed my parents and my sisters. Mom Karen Bukas was determined to help me make money for my birthday wish to come true. Of course, she didn't tell me of her plan. One Saturday, she encouraged me to stick some of my drawings on our front wall. There were pictures of animals, children playing together, people in the neighborhood, and even a picture of our house. Each picture was bright and colorful. My family was surprised that many people slowed down when walking or driving by the house just to look at the paintings. Mom thought that if people liked any of these drawings, maybe she could encourage them to buy one or two for a low price. We could use that money for my birthday party. One day, our neighbor, Mrs. Wellington, she visited us. I don't remember seeing these fabulous drawings before. Who did them? Someone can earn a lot of money by selling these. In fact, I would pay $50 for this one with my dog Mitzi in it, she said, and sat on a bench in the living room. Soon, the word spread about my drawings, and one day after school, the librarian, Mrs. Andrews, she paid us a visit. Would you like to display your art on the walls of our library? She asked me. Thank you, I said. That would be great. By the end of that week, many parents and other visitors to the library admired my drawings and were even, even willing to buy them. With the $800 that I eventually earned, I was able to throw a big party and invite all my friends. You know, sometimes you really cannot tell how things will turn out. Indeed, my birthday wish had come true. The end. Hi, I'm Danielle Delo, the director of the NGC Children's Bocas Lit Fest. And we're here today because we are going digital. And today I want to introduce you to Shana Lala, who represents NALIS, as she's a NALIS administrator, and who is here because we're actually launching our story writing challenge. For 2020. Thank you so much, Danielle. Nalis is thrilled to again partner with you for another significant activity that we know is going to um, encourage the reading and writing habits of children. And we are here to support you in every way possible to get to make this competition a success. Nalis accepted and is our partner with our storytelling caravan. For the last nine years, we've been all over Trinidad and Tobago. Actually, we begin in Tobago at Scarborough Library, the new beautiful facility there. And we 
have been to, for example, Point Forty. Indeed. You have a library in Point Forty. That's right. Debbie, I believe you're down south, aren't Correct, you? I'm down south and you've been to a number of our libraries and we're so pleased with that because sometimes the south um, remote libraries are forgotten and you all come in and the children in the community feel so special because of that and we appreciate it. Well, what we've done over the last nine years is take children through the, the, the steps of creating stories. And we're quite convinced that we have, we have been able to achieve a pool of very young authors in Trinidad and Tobago today. We also run, you, you do programs, for example, camps. Correct. Right so, in camps. That's right. So at each vacation period, most public libraries cater for children and young adults, where we have camps which are quite accessible to every person in our community, regardless of their social status, religion, race, and so forth, where we encourage the reading habit through a number of exciting and fun activities. But one of the most exciting things I have to tell you, Annalise, is our camp that we do a workshop, a series of workshops at which, which caters to schools. You are aware of that, of course. Of course. And, and um, we understand the remarkable work and we're so happy that you go throughout not just the public library system but the schools as well because of course we have just 21 libraries but the access that you have to the... We to bring the schools to Nalys. Correct. And we've had fabulous, fabulous workshop facilitators. Uh, we do writing, songs, all sorts of things and we've also catered to, to children that are preschool. Then I've had the pleasure, Daniel, of being at uh, two of these sessions where um, your staff came in and you can see how thrilled the kids are to put together this story because I add a line here, you add a line there and Natasha really brought it all together and then when they see their pieces published it's such an exciting experience and you know it's thrilling for a child to see their work published at that age. I want to ask you something. How many libraries are there in Trinidad today? I know that you also have co, I think you call them co. Co-located libraries. Yeah, can you tell me how many libraries? So we have 21 libraries throughout the country and of those 21 we have co-located libraries. So what co-located libraries are, are libraries located within the community at a particular location. So for instance we have the Beetham Gardens co-located library. That's which is, new. That's new indeed. It's, it's came on board last year and at this library we are at the police task force so we are in the heart of the community connecting I know you're also at uh, Mount, Mount, Mount Lambert. Hope, Mount Lambert. Yes, that's we are right. in Barataria. That's right. And we recently opened a new co-located library, which is in St. Helena. So oh, libraries are expanding because we are recognizing the need to get information and to encourage information to the communities and yes. our um, population and uh, to encourage literacy. So, as we've heard, we are launching today our short story writing challenge. There are two age groups uh, from 9 to 12. And Nalys is here in partnership with us to support us in the judging. Would you take that over now? Oh, certainly. We're looking forward to um, listening to these children's creative side, understanding where they're their world. You know, children write from their perspective and we are excited to hear what they come up with, looking for structure and the proper construction of a story and then a story that lends itself to how do we tell the tale, how are we capturing what's taking place in this child's mind. So we're excited to hear what they come up with, the creativity, and I, I know it's going to motivate. We're very happy to have had such a successful relationship with Nalis. And I thank you so much, Shana, for being here today. You're most welcome. And, and now we're going to take a break. And next on set would be Corin Clark, who wrote this wonderful book. And you know what? She's just four years old. <laughs> Thank you. 
Welcome to Corin. Hi, Corin. Hello. Welcome. Come and have a seat. Can you hear me clearly? Because I have a microphone. Yes, we can hear you clearly. I know. Are you having fun today? Yes. Corin, I understand that you, look at this, look at this, <laughs> you, that you wrote this book. Yes, I did, I did, I did. Tell me something, darling. Uh, Why did you write a book? Because I wanted to read on Instagram. You did what? I, I wanted to read on Instagram. Oh, you wanted to read on Instagram. Uh, and my videos are actually on Instagram. It's actually, you actually have a video on Instagram? Yeah. Tell me something, how old are you? Four. You're four? Yeah. Look at them. Uh, do they believe you're four years old? Um, yes. And I want, I want to ask you about the beginning of your book. Look at it, right? Okay. You've written here you, some affirmations. You said, to children everywhere. Yes, you are beautiful. You are smart. You are kind. You are good. You are brave and you are strong. Corinne? Yes. My darling. Yes. Why did you write these words to children everywhere? Uh, 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 because I wanted to let them know they, they are beautiful, they are smart, they are kind, they are good, uh, um, they are brave, they are strong, and they are important and one of a kind. And they are poor, important and one of a kind. Mm -hmm. What did you like about writing? Uh, well, um, because I like writing and my writing process is good. Your writing process is good. Now your mommy told me, your mommy told me, yeah, I know, that you said to her, I want to write a book. And she didn't listen at that time, is that so? And that you got a double line copy book? Yes. And what happened? Tell us, tell us, tell, tell us what happened. Well. Well, I, I wanted to write a book, and my mommy didn't listen that time. Um, um. Do you remember? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, that's okay. That's okay. But you started putting words together, didn't you? Yes. And then, tell me, what was the idea of this book? Uh, because I see you started with yoga. Yeah, I did start with yoga. And then you do other things too, like what? Ballet. Ballet, and what else? Um, swimming. I know you do swimming, you're a very good swimmer. But I don't do swimming anymore, I don't do swimming classes. You don't, you stop your swimming classes. Yeah, and, I, and now I do gymnastics. You do what? Gymnastics. Gymnastics, she does gymnastics. And, yeah. and she does yoga. Yeah. And there are certain things you said you did. You said you also baked a cake. Could you tell them out there, tell our audience all about it? You yes. baked, look at our audience by that glass window there, see Well, I, I, I made red velvet cupcake with vanilla frosting. Red velvet cupcake with vanilla, well, you know what? What? We have a red velvet cupcake for you today. <laughs> Thank you. I always wanted one of those. And then we want to know a bit more about your writing, Corinne. I see that you like our banner. Yes, I do. I like all of the coloring books that you wrote me. You like our coloring books? Yes. Well, then we have one more to give you right now. Here you are. Um, but I already got this one. You got it? Oh, you're so quick on the ball. Can you show our audience? Just show them. Show huh. so them that book. Um, no, you don't have to get well, it. <laughs> well, my shoes are a bit slippery. Yes, just show them. Just stand there. Stand there and show them. <laughs> Corin? Yes. Yes, very good. You want to show them the inside of, of one of our stories if you open it? Oh, show yeah. Them. Uh, uh, show them. Show them one. Uh, um, oh, um, get open this. That's Dragonzilla, isn't he? Mm. May I keep that for you for a minute? Shall I keep it and then we look at your book? Um, yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. Tell us about our story writing challenge. Do you think children can write a book? Yes. Was it hard writing your book? No. Where did you get your ideas from? Ideas? Um, my mind. From your mind? Yeah. Absolutely your mind? Yes. I hear you play three musical instruments as well. I do. 
there are children out there who may be scared, although the NGC Children's Bocas Lit Fest has been going Chinese. all over Trinidad and Tobago for nine years. Nine years? Nine years we've been going, <laughs> yeah. and we've been teaching children how to write a, stories, and we have storytellers. But what, what I want to, to ask you is this. Would you tell them about your book? Could you tell them and make them feel good about writing? Um, Here you are. Yeah, you um, hold your book and like that so um, they can see it because they're all looking at you um, right now. Um, thank you. Yes, mm. and show them the cover and tell them about it. Hello, I'm Corinne Clark, the author of Chronicles of Corinne, Seven Days of Fun. Do you have a story you like to share? I'm sure I do. So I'm here to encourage you to join the fun Focus Writing Challenge. Writing is fun but it's hard work, but I know you can do anything you put your mind to. You can do this, so just know you can. Ready, steady, let's write. To all the children of Trinidad and Tobago, you've had the pleasure of meeting Corinne and Naya Clark. Oh, Mr. Fiddler, oh, ha, hi. This country so colorful and truly diverse. We're doing our best to put TNT first. Youth success through advancement, we encourage. We're proudly supporting the rich cultural heritage, promoting development in the sporting arena, and empowering women for equality of gender. We're sustaining the environment and strengthening the society. First citizens helping paint a brighter TNT. Drag your bow, Mr. Fiddler. Um, this is my first time writing for SLAM. Um, advised by a couple of people, challenged by a couple of people, I guess. Um, first time doing poetry or anything like this since probably primary school. So big up to Cookery Government Primary School and Ms. Drakes and Mr. Clark and everybody there that encouraged me. So hope I did good enough. Um, the inspiration for my piece, a lot of my Facebook rants. The old host said they were a bit long. You get a summarized vision here. And um, yeah. I remember being a young boy sweating Distracted by the shouts of some youth man getting dragged by his neighbor, by the scruff of his neck, insisting that he have no kind of respect. And as you expect, some corner house shaman breezing on his deck would interject. That youth man, haunted. And the youth got just beat up, undaunted by the blows and woes he confronted, doing what he wanted. Oh, let go me now, boy. Let go me. You cannot ship it out. You go see. And that would be a normal haunted youth display on any given day. What you gonna say? But what really haunted me was what a haunted could really mean. Because I just couldn't guess what jumbie was jumbie man. What stray manifestation was aggravating the Dan? He was bad or just mad with some kind of defect? Did some black magic chant have that kind of effect? No. And with age and with time, I would come to reflect and see how those ghouls weren't the ones you'd suspect. Cause like me, he could boast that the first one to ghost him was his father. And as a serious metex, and no call, no text, make it harder, hard. Like the skin on your back get after years of that leather belt, hard. Like the state of your heart get towards your single mother just doing her best. Because the Bible say, spare the rod, spoil the child for certain. So it was always, always more rod than curtain. But was that just love or hurting? Because hurt, hurt is like a pyramid scheme. They're always looking for just two more people. Just the two. And as much as you put in, more come back to you. Painful susu. 
Could it be colonial operations and operations seen break that branch to use to flog them rather than follow the trunk to the root of the problem? Is the phantom of the massa in your head make you figure you must beat it out at this hard head? The mute man hunted by hunger and lack of education. By anger from lack of elevation, stigma and constant deprivation till a burning tires in the road to make the whole nation bummy. That's a bummy nation. The mute man hunted by the idea that you must stay hard and stoic. You depressed and sad, go show it, you mad. Learning disorders, mental illness, trauma, that's old talk, that's myth, that's white people drama. Them youth men hunted. By the own reflection, probably, because you call them black and ugly, you're black and ugly, you're black and ugly, you're black and ugly, you're black and... Black! That's the constant attack that they keep in your back. Them youth men hunted by the potential to be the best while being conditioned to think the less and need chaining. What else could possess a politician to possess in their political campaigning? So yes, that youth man, real hunted. Roger being a creative performer With this latest virus, they call Corona You're always facing pressure, all in between But the thing get plenty worse with COVID-19 Hey, stop, 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 stop! Oh, oh! <laughs> I thought I see a spike. <laughs> Don't, worry. Don't touch oh. me. Gross. Sorry. <laughs> Just come out, my car. Come out, my car with that coffin. Alright. You want some of this? Thank you. Ooh. Want some? No, I can't talk. I can't talk. Oh. <laughs> what a journey. Going to the southern city. Moving with Rona and Boki. Go to a mystery. I don't know who going up. Just like that, I see somebody start to pop. So I hold me get up. While they take a sip of water. I'm moving with Rona and Boki. Going to the southern city. I don't want to stand out the class, they're going buy some lit focus. I come up and make it there, ah, this long journey by now. So now you understand why the sisters going down by Sapa. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, ah. Now it is a privilege of which you must take advantage. You could stock up like a fridge It's a way to get knowledge I don't know if you could cook But some people rather sit down with a book And I could tell you to your face Through reading a book You could visit any place Hi! Rumba de da de Rumba da ba da 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 Rumba de I'm sure you will agree to sing extemporaneously You must have an extensive vocabulary And be able to sing in key Once you understand the melody And you sing in perfect harmony So what you see from the start That's where extempo becomes an art Bye 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 Later boy, later It's not here either the NGC Bocas Lucas is our volunteers and flags. It's a big thing. Jillian said it's online, Boki. Online is not a place, I see. You realize you're obsessed.
There are humans somewhere in Trinidad broadcasting the NGC Bopas Lit Fest and I am going to find them. Look um, Sterling Henderson. Hey, where are you going? Going to town. Oh, okay, okay, me too. Cool. Brother. Brother. With this latest virus, the corona, you're always facing pressure, all in between. But the thing get plenty worse with COVID-19. One, one, one of the, the, the secret drives for me in reading this book is, um, I think, in the Caribbean, we still have this idea of what prestigious literature should sound like. And so on, and they go, oh, this is a nasty piece of work, wing something. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I'm not going to shock anybody. Lock up the pum pum. Of course, the bitch never listened and knows she's pregnant. Of course, Miss Carter is after let her go. And my recommendation, of course. Can you imagine some of the stinking bottom Diego Pitney around the rapid around the place on Fifth Avenue, no Baba? The white people will have one of them white people things. I can nip chanter at it. <laughs> so does she go by Miss Calters or Ms. Calters? So does she go by Ms. Calters or Ms. Calters? What are we, you stush us? Then we like you quick. Why, sometimes we don't even know which. Soon as you start reading some magazine named Ms. She says she named Ms. Calters. <laughs> we just call her ma'am. Ma'am, like some slavery thing. For once, she looked like she didn't know what to answer. It's three years now, I'm with God Bless Employment Agency. And every time I come in here, she have a brand new story about some ghetto slut who get pregnant on her watch. What I don't understand is why she always feels I'm the person to tell this story. I'm not trying to be understanding or empathetic. I just want a fucking job. So that my slumlord doesn't kick me out of my top class fifth floor walk up with a toilet that makes all sorts of murder songs when you flush it. And rats that love me, they can sit up and watch TV with me. <laughs> Trying to use some slavery word around Miss Calters. New York people don't like them kind of remark. Oh. At least you have one of them Bible names, them loving at Jamaica. We even get them at a work last week. Can you imagine? Probably because of the name Hezekiah. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe they think that nobody with, with the name from the good book went teeth from them. You're not no teething girl. She asks me this every week I come to pick up my pay, even though I've been here for three years. But now she looks at me like she really wants an answer. The cultures are the usual clients, clearly. Where is my 10th grade teacher now to tell me what doors I've opened up in life just from knowing how to speak correctly? Miss <laughs> Betsy is looking at me. Some jealousy, sure, but every woman has that. Some envy, too, because I have what beauty contestants call deportment. After all, I'm a high school educated girl from Havendale, St. Andrew. Pride, of course, because she has somebody she can finally use to impress the cultures. So much so that she probably trump up some false bullshit about the last girl just to get her fine. But pity, too. That one most definitely. She wondering how a girl like me come to this. No, Miss Betsy. Good, good, wonderful, good. Don't ask me why I was walking on Broadway past 55th because not a damn thing was going on on the street or in my life. But sometimes, I don't know, walking down a New York street, but it doesn't make your problems easier, but it does make you feel like you can just walk. Not that I have problems. Actually, I don't have a thing. And I bet you that it, my nothing is bigger than your something any day of the week. Something, sometimes having nothing to worry about makes me worry, but that would be some psychological bullshit to make me feel busy. Maybe I'm just bored. And that meant walking. Even I know it don't make no sense, do it explain why these people never stop walking? You do really wonder, if everybody works in this city, why are there so many people on the street? So I'm walking down Broadway from 120th. I don't know, there comes a point where you're just walking. And beside, until what, I don't know. And besides, it was only a few blocks before Times Square. And Lord knows, only 10 minutes in Times Square will make you miss a quaint little place like the West Kingston. The little sign was failing to stick out between two Chinese restaurants on 51st Street. God bless Employment Agency. Which was enough to make it clear that Jamaicans run it. But if that didn't do it, 
Then the proverb at the bottom of the sign, a soft answer turneth away wrath, which don't have a fucking thing to do with anything. <laughs> Certainly did. The only thing left was to add international to the title. <laughs> but I had some nerve thinking I could just start on top page that existed to help losers like me. After all, there were only so many times you could call your American ex in Arkansas and ask for money to help before he said, Fine, I'll send you some cash, but if you ever call my house again and threaten to talk to my wife, I'll make a little call to the INS, and you'll see if you don't find your conniving nigga ass on the next fucking flight back to Jamaica, punching one of those clear plastic bags that give you the poor you deportees, so all the airport know which brand of panty shield you use. <laughs> I didn't want to tell him that the word nigga didn't have the, the kick he was counting on. Nor bitch, nor cunt, since Jamaican girl don't respond to them things. But yet, I was in no position to walk, walk past anywhere called an employment agency. You know why I'm giving you the job? Because you was the first girl to come in here with some manners. Really, Miss Betsy? We've also had this conversation before. She runs an employment agency that places mostly black women, mostly immigrants, into these posh houses to take care of their young children or their old parents, who, news to me, have the very same needs. In exchange for putting up with whatever shit, sometimes literally shit, they don't ask questions and everybody wins. Well, two people win. I just collect the money. The first client she sent was a white middle-aged couple in Gramercy. Too busy to notice their weak mother smelling like cat shit and talking about those poor boys in the USS Arizona. She was in her room by herself with a thermostat set at 50 degrees. The first time I met the couple, the wife didn't look at me at all and the husband looked at me too long. Both, were all, both wore all black and the same black round glasses like John Lennon. She just said to the wall beside me, she's in there, do what must be done. For a split second, I wondered if they expect me to kill the woman. <laughs> and what woman? In the room was nothing but pillows and a bed she beat up on the bed. I had to come in closer to see that there was a little old woman in the middle of the bed. The piss and shit nearly made me walk out until I remembered that no money order was coming from Arkansas. Anyway, I lasted three months and it wasn't the shit. There always comes a point when you're living in a house with a man when he started to think he can walk around with no clothes on. The first time he do it, I could tell he was really hoping I'd be taken aback, but I just saw another old person to nurse. The fifth time he said the wife was gone to her mother of veterans meeting, and I said, so you need me to figure out where you misplaced your drawers? <laughs> the seventh time he jiggled it in front of me, and I started laughing so loud I hiccup. <laughs> The mother in the room started shouting, what was the joke? And I told her I didn't care. She laughed too, saying his father was just the same. <laughs> Always putting on show even when nobody bought any seat. <laughs> From that day, the mother was always sharp around me. She even developed a little sass. Too much sass for cocky jiggler. I quit before he fired me, and I told Miss Betsy that while I will scoop any load of shit, I will have nothing to do with a withered white penis. She was impressed that I managed to stay in standard English the whole time. Even when I asked if this was a whore or a granny care as a fringe benefit. <laughs> it's most immaculate high school you come from, she said. Holy childhood, I said. Same difference, she said. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
want to thank my publishers. I want to thank Jeremy, Hannah, the whole People Tree crew. Um, you know, Jeremy, I send this, we send this book to Jeremy and within a month he'd, he'd accepted it for publication and, you know, it's a testament to the power and the strength of People Tree Press to put this book out. This important, I think it's an important book. There's no other biographies of Kitchener. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we're going to finish with something. Something that you know. brown skin drum beat and it blow the beat is the blood and the heart and the road and the wood and the rhythm of people walking so many miles in the grinning heat of Port of Spain on Carnival Monday pushing up from Marine Square up through Frederick Street the beat is the queen perspiring in her second skin of beads and sequins the Coscal, the Dame Lorraine the glitter bands passing, the lassificious lovemaking of lovers leaning against walls that stench with urine. Where some coxman burst or some head run blood from blows and bottle. But that is carnival. The sacred and the stink, the profane and the sin, you sit down on the culvert spewing rum, frustration. While the tar band, the mud mass, the oil band, the borough keeps passing. Or the fancy sailor in a tasseled sombrero playing real mass. So he throwing talcum powder on anyone who joined the band. As you pass near the midnight rubber on the corner of Park and Frederick, in his black cape with the skull and crossbones glittering with embroidered stars, with his mouth spitting convolutions of language that twist your head for coins to fall into his collection box, until he goes, until you reach by royal jail And you hear that song that Kitchener sing I hear how they're planning For carnival coming I hear how they're planning For carnival coming They say they go beat people And they don't care about trouble But tell them don't worry with me It's a different thing, 1960 it was so we going up Frederick Street with music and people from every street and alley side until we reach the cenotaph at Memorial Park and we see the dust rising in the savannah ahead. From a steel band coming to come down from Belmont through these narrow avenues and gingerbread yards, across the muddy ravines that wash down swill from the shack hills of Laventil. The murmur of the steel getting louder as it coming and mommy still a few steps behind, carrying a basket of fried chicken pilau, Kool-Aid and coconut drops. She turns when she catch the sound of the band and she says, hey, I hear him, kitchen and chew. So her walk is different now. In its pivot and belt of hip, it anticipates the swing of the approaching band. She is oblivious to everything but the pan, oblivious to the small iron and spoon contingent outside the museum, oblivious to the Moko Jumbies wooden feet knocking on the hard road make to walk, to the trebly speaker hissing from the Chinese restaurant, no. Mammy like nothing more than pan. Leave the old mass, the pretty mass, the jab jab, the oil mass, the brass bands and the mud. All mammy want to hear is iron, and only iron could make she dance like this. Can really make to walk. Eh? Look how far I reach and me I even realize. A vap steak me last night. 
I was sitting down in my battery up on Salvation Hill listening to the radio. I never intend to go in their back and all. Because once I hear Pan in the Savannah on Saturday night, I satisfy. But as I sit down there in the gallery drinking my stout and smoking my thing, I hear Bob Gittin say, radio people, this is the song that everybody talking about. Lord Kitchener is back with a road match contender. This is the road. And when I hear that song, like I get a spirit in me. And I put on my clothes and I grab a flask of babash I was holding since Christmas. I pass through Kobo Town, come down by Marine Square. And when I reach there, I meet fellas beating bottle and spoon and the Lego rum. And it's there I bounce up Rosalind. I hook she and she hook me and it's so we go in through Port of Spain. When we meet up with music, we take a wine. Juve morning, we coming down. We leave Marine Square and we ease up Frederick Street. We follow Pan and Brash three miles around the Savannah. Then we go down to Newtown by Bradley. Was white rum and gooty. But Rosie says she don't want no old man lying. So we go through the back of St. Clair, down Tragery Road. And we bounce up our old mass band. Men with posy on their head and rum in baby bottle. We jump with them and the Lego grog. And from there we going down by Harvard. It's as we coming over the bridge for St. James. Rosie bounce up she child father. And she going with me. So I follow Invader Steel Band through Woodbrook. Sun come up on me and my head twist and I end up back by the savannah. Lord, I really walk like a jackass all about town. I had to lie down a little bit. Anywhere I pass, I hear in Kitchener, the road. They play in Sparrow and they play in Blakey, but you hear in Kitchener more. It's a good song for when you're walking on Carnival Day. You take a little dance and then you walk again. But Kitch, like he put something else in that song. What it is? I don't know much about Africa, but if you listen close, you could hear like people beating big African drum with bone in there. Well, I drink till I strip it and I lie down in the savannah like a muck, sun beating my back, and I'm watching all them tall ass women pass. The road takes a while, can Constable, I don't want to talk. Get information If you know the words you can say you know. I know you know the words They tell me Tokyo Is a danger with Desperado The heat and Carlson Valley Trinidad all stars and Tripoli They could play the mass As long they don't have to win When they pass But the road they to walk Constable I don't want to talk I've got to see Love you now from the Royal Hospital. Love you now from the Royal Hospital. Love you now from the Royal Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it again for Anthony Joseph, Kiwan Landreth Smith, Mikhail Salcedo, Eleanor Ryan, and Chrisan Joseph. 2020 marks 10 years of TNT's National Literary Festival, and it's the first ever virtual NGC Booker Slit Fest. It's packed with stories, talk, readings, extempo, poetry, new talent, and of course, surprises. 18 events, 80 participants. Friday 18th to Sunday 20th September. Catch it all via Facebook, YouTube, and on the Bocas website, bocaslitfest.com.
It's a pleasure to have you join us today. I am Suniti Maraj, and here with me is the, with me uh, Chike Pilgrim, um, Amilka Sanatan, and Tilla, a Tilla Springer. These are they are among the legacies of 1970, but we will get to their story in due course. Uh, as we start to discuss the legacies of 1970 and the Black Power movement the Black Power Revolution, and what it means to all of us 50 years later, I would like to open with, an, on a note of respect and appreciation for the life of Raymond Watts. Many of you may not know Raymond Watts, but he is the person to whom is credited the idea of the 1968 Black, or was it 69, Black Writers Conference in Montreal. And that was a springboard. It came in the middle of the Black Power movement in North America, which had echoes in Trinidad. And it, it, it is, was the single most important political and literary move, um, moment um, that spiraled off into so many, had so many echoes. And of course, the people who, one of the most outstanding speakers of that event was Kwame Ture, um, our own. Stokely Carmichael, as he left here, he left Trinidad at Stokely Carmichael and went into the world and became Kwame Ture. So he, Raymond passed last week quietly in the, in the calm of COVID-19, and we all know what that has done to loss, loss of life and all farewells. But I think this is an appropriate moment to recognize the contribution of a man who brought the world of literature and language to a, a political movement. Uh, so let's get on with the conversation. And um, I, will, I, I want to turn to Shike first. I, I have already said that all three of you are the legacies of 1970, because I ass, I'm assuming none of you was around. Um, and you would have been sprung out of the hopes. Uh, I know, Shike, you have pr produced a book of power this year. And I think that you, you recorded quite a number of conversations? Did you do it yourself or uh, did you, or you did you record it from other sources and so on? And then maybe you can talk, you can open the conversation by telling us about your engagement with that moment through those who lived it. Lived it. Right. Uh, I did a number of interviews, over about 20 interviews. Uh, so the book is made up of two parts. The first part is available now. Uh, the first part, uh, consists of 10 interviews with uh, Baka Rennie, Teddy Belgrave, uh, may he rest in peace, Winston Sweet, Joe Young, RIP as well, Michael Alves, RIP, Kafra Kambon, Bezeli Daga, uh, Josan Leonard, Fidi Ferreira, and Rafiq Shah. So that's the first book. Uh, I conducted these interviews over a period of about five years from 2010 to 2015. Uh, it was part of a, a thesis that I did at the UE. My thesis was on Black Power. So uh, while I was writing around the, the issue of Black Power, I decided to do these interviews. And I thought that I always intended to turn them into a book. And I finally got the time uh, over the past couple of years to consolidate them. And what, I mean, who did you, what feeling did that leave you with, hearing those stories? Yeah, well, I mean, they were exciting, insightful. It was very emotional, you know, because, of course, we're all from Trinidad and Tobago here. So just getting these stories, getting these insights, uh, at, at times it was difficult to record. At times it was difficult to, to write and to rewrite and to transcribe and to research. Um, so I would say it was a, a pretty emotional experience, actually. Um, 
It's used up seventy. I still very close to the surface in Trinidad and Tobago and in the world, as twenty twenty has made quite apparent. Um, so we're still grappling with a number of these issues. So it felt current to have this book up here uh, at this point in time. I didn't intend to be in Trinidad. <laughs> so I, 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 uh, one of my, my Rasta brethren told me that I got brought back, you know, to, um, <laughs> to finish this up. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, when, we started, when, we, when this, the idea of this conversation was first discussed, we were in a different world. We were talking about a retrospective on, 19, on, on 1970. We were going to look back at the 50 years and, and then other things happened. The Black Lives Movement erupted and COVID entered the scene as well. And, and COVID itself has been wrapped up in the discussion about inequality, about marginalization, or about race and class and how these things are transiting into people's lives. So we are in a different world where we have to ask ourselves, are we in some way back in 1970? Now, even if you were not there, um, and any one of you can come in here, in fact, I mean, it's a conversation. Um, do you feel any sense of the recent events involving Black Lives Movement, the election campaign in Trinidad, where race talk erupted in, you know, just like a rash? Um, did you feel that those were the, uh, the, that these are the stirrings of uh, another moment, or do you feel it's just ordinary and part of the cause? Do you feel that that we are in a revolutionary time, or do you feel we've left revolution behind? Um, I think that we're always in a revolutionary time. I wonder if the people are ready for revolution. Um, it's interesting that one of the things that happened as part of the conversation that was going on during the Black Lives Matter um, protests that happened in Trinidad is that people were saying, oh, this have nothing to do with us. How we get involved in that. Um, this is America business, etc." cetera. Um, completely forgetting that the first uh, big protest that happened on the 26th of February, 1970, was actually a solidarity protest for the young people who were in Canada. So, you know, that it, I guess the lack of context that we have and the lack of awareness of our own history just makes these moments um, all the more important as teaching moments. And it, it's surprising that, you know, none of the media houses really took the opportunity to contextualize what was going on in Trinidad um, at the time. In the midst of all of these things that were happening, there was, there was an opportunity for, for some contextualization to happen and it didn't, you know, and, you know, all of us are talking about surviving COVID, uh, how many hours we spend on Netflix every day, um, how, how the technology is changing our existence. And then when something in America happens, which affects um, Black people, people of African descent all over the world, we act like if uh, that's their business and we are not involved in that conversation. So, I mean, the moment could be absolutely revolutionary, but if people are not in a mind, in a state of mind for revolution, I think that that's where the challenge comes in. I feel like in 1970, there was a kind of groundswell that happened that is possibly happening here in little pockets and people are definitely fed up. People are definitely concerned, but you know, the reality of COVID has made it really difficult for us to, you know, gather to have conversations in person that really make a difference to the way that we organize, you know, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. America? Yes, uh, Sunati, and I really appreciate the comments by everyone before. I think um, the first thing I want to establish is that language or that 
conversation you wanted to bring about the legacy of the 70s most definitely we could see like our names you know like you know it's so funny when people saw me and i was very young they thought it was my stage name sometimes like how did you call yourself amilka sonata and, and i'm literally named after amilka cabral in guinea bissau my brother's name fidel after castro my youngest brother marcus after gavi so there was a cultural revolution that took place among many of us um which said that even if the political outcomes of a revolution all of them may not have been achieved some will but there were cultural ones that would go to bring about a long-term change, which reflected that consciousness of that generation. A second aspect is also the idea of the university and what education should do to serve the needs of people. The idea of public intellectualism, but also a proletarian intellectualism, why everyone must read the newspapers, why commentaries must have a public format, the role of pamphlets right, on promenades to engage people, and the type of publications which may take more in the place of blogs and even extended tweets or persons, personalities using the platform to continually raise awareness around it. That has an important role to play around information dissemination, having conversations in a very a more democratic way, and one that is very conscious about reaching to people who will not traditionally access education. But then the last point I think is also around media and visibility. There is, I think, more legitimacy to our ideas. While it may have certain prejudice that we will always have to resist, um, the way that we could present ourselves on the media, national media, um, is very important. And I think that is an inheritance of that movement and the type of consciousness that was there. I don't take for granted every time I may get the opportunity to communicate to the public and there's no anxiety around it. Well, probably they do, but it wasn't enough and it wasn't as powerful to remove me from a conversation. I remember when there was even a time where I was asked um, to put my hair back um, in a Caribbean institution, right, that is very prestigious, saying that maybe Amilka shouldn't have his hair all out because um, the camera wouldn't get to see his face. Like if that was the most important contribution I had to make. So these are the kind of questions that we always have to grapple with. But I think Attila was going to a great place. I think where we have to look at our work is how does Black power for all that we do really challenges hegemony? challenges an idea of dominance in a particular moment. And we are aware of what our dominance is, probably need to be more explicit about what it is and what changes we want. And I think what it really showed up was the lack of leadership also, and not the idea of a single leader or a kind of savior to our cause. Yes, people want horizontal leadership, Yes, probably don't draw a straight line to leaders the same way that we did in the past. And we have more responsibilities, portfolios, sacrifice for our time, mental health care, all these new questions. And of course, more women than men. But I think it really asks a question about acknowledging the spectrum in which mobilizing around anti-Black racism happens and to not buy into one narrative, you know, and, and not be hostile as well. We should be generous in the way we seek to understand people, understand the limits of their politics, probably stand up where we feel our integrity lies, but understand that all of us are important actors to those changes. Yeah, well, there's no doubt that what, is what has been happening is that the people have been insisting on a place around the table and new claimants give rise to claimants that you don't even see at that moment. There was a time it was based on color, race, it was based on, on gender, it was based on sexuality, and even now, as we think that we are very sensitive to all the rights of everyone, we may not even know, we may not even be aware of the voices that are being left out. And they will surface at some time, you know, and, and we have to be alert to the fact that who we see now and eventually come to accept. When we see somebody else come, it doesn't mean that, okay, we have blocked off the space, you know, you always be open. Shike, you wanted to say something. No, I'm just building on what um, Amelka and Attila were saying. I would like to add to that that it, it's 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 time that we, we formalize uh, these traditions, meaning 1930, the 1950s, 1970, 1990, within our education system. You know, we need to introduce this into the history syllabus. The books should be available. They should be there. Uh, people should be teaching around these things and discussing these things. I don't think that the youth, to add to what Amilka is saying, should be grappling in a moment like this to find some kind of place within the tradition. We shouldn't be recreating the wheel. Whether or not you agree with 
one part of the topic or another part of the topic, the, the, the point is there's a very wide discussion that has been happening in the Caribbean for almost hundreds of years, you know, uh, as far as the issues of race, class, gender, and so on are concerned. So I think introducing these things, we should move away from some of the nervousness that I think we have um, with respect to, to these, these crucial moments and teach the children about these things, you know? Yeah, well, we are in 1937, eh? You know, we are, um, but sh should we explore that issue, though? I, I, I think that um, maybe we ourselves need to give a little context for anybody who is on this discussion about 1970. Let's, um, let's just go back a little bit to um, the, the, I think, um, Attila was talking about the fact that we, we, tap, we tap into, and others tap into us as well, global movements and, and thoughts and ideas. It's a world of ideas. And what is interesting is how ideas moved long before social media. Right? And today you, you can, you know, at, at, a, at a click of a whatever, you, you can connect to anybody. But I've always been fascinated by how ideas move in the Caribbean. If you, if you look back to that period with Garvey, you go back to the British West Indian Movement, a British West Indian Regiment um, that came back and how people communicated across the region. Well, of course, the indigenous people were communicating by sea as though it was their highway. They were up and down the place, right? And so um, ideas have been flowing and we have been connecting and tapping into them and feeding, feeding them as well. And that is what was going on in the 60s. And if we, if we look at, if we consider the age of the leaders of the Black Power um, Revolution of 1970, these would have been, if you were to look maybe at uh, Daga and, um, and Cambon, as say the two, um, the two best known leaders, they would have been about, I don't know, about 12 or 13, assuming, assuming they were in university in 1970, at about, they probably would have been about 20. Um, and so, they would have been, um, I'm, I'm talking about when we got to independence, sorry. When we got to independence, they would have been boys, but they would have been flush with a sense of what independence um, meant, what they were to expect and grow up into. And, and then by the time they got to 20, and they are at university, and they're looking at their own odds at what is going to happen in their lives and what is around them, the environment in Trinidad, um, was one that was highly politicized in the 60s. It came out of well, the People's National Movement and Dr. Eric Williams came with his Woodford Square le lectures. Large numbers of people attended these things and these were rank and file. This was a proletariat, as it were, eager to try to make sense of the world and anxious for the independence. And so you had an already politicized um, national community. Um, largely so urban, then you had independence, and then you had almost a decade of waiting for independence to happen, the promise of change. And then by the time we got to the 1968, I remember um, Jennifer Kernahan Jones, Beverly Jones's sister, talking about growing up in, in, in that Laventille Belmont area where there were every night the blocks were of young people sitting down with the most revolutionary literature of the time, Mao Zedong's the Communist Manifesto, the Marxist, whatever, talking under the streetlights, debating and discussing and so on. And there was uh, people who were trying to, they weren't in the university. These are not people necessarily in the university, though they may be connected, but they were talking about what it meant to them. Uh, and so you had an environment that was heavily into discussion. Is that comparable to the discussion on social media today? What do you think? I want to see you go and come across as a hater. So <laughs> let them go first. Because <laughs> I'm salty, but I have some context to give. But go ahead, not me. I mean, I have like a slight bit of salt, like <laughs> slight salt and slight aloes. Salt bay. Salt Okay. Listen, there's so much noise 
on social media. There's so much noise. And you're competing with so much all the time. You're competing with, um, you know, a certain level of potpourri, right? So you're competing with people who have this this um, hyper um, fantastic idea of what Africa is and what Pan-Africanism looks like. And that is feeding into also uh, a very hyper-vigilant policing of people's language, which is also few, um, moving into questions of intersectionality and where women are in the movement, into questions of Pan-Africanism, into questions of what the complete, perhaps, erasure of the history of Black power and the history of movements, the history of, of Caribbean people in um, Pan-African movements, which is something that concerns me a lot. Um, and Sunati, when you were talking about Marcus Garvey, when you were talking about um, the West, the, the, the T.A. Mary show, the West Indies must be West Indian. Um, we didn't even mention Henry Sylvester Williams organizing the first Pan-African conference. All of this, all of this conversation is somehow missing from, again, I'm really concerned about context. And so constantly we are feeling like the, the conversation is now starting. And I've had so many experiences in the last 10 years of being involved in various movements, whether they are environmental movements, women's movements, um, and having conversations with people, arguing with them about the importance of talking about the history of colonial violence or the context of, of our resistance to talking about movements in the, in the present period. I'm not gonna get upset. And I'm like, yeah, well, they need to get upset because you know, we need to take the conversation there. Um, and I guess what I'm trying to say is that we can't wait until the thing is happening for us to have the conversation. And for all of us who have been trying for years to have this conversation and trying to contextualize our own experiences as children, having people laugh at your name, asking you what it is that mean, you know, if you're aware um, anything looking remotely African outside of emancipation, people laughing at you, people, um, you know, there's, there's, there's so much that goes on. And now we have reached a point where the conversation is going on. And lots of people who I was never looking for there are the most vocal, the most revolutionary, the most radical. And I'm like, yeah, but where were you when I was trying to have this conversation with you when we were organizing a protest against the killing of a woman at carnival time? You know, you did not want to have this conversation then. Why do you want to have it now? Because it's fashionable. You know, you didn't want to have the conversation when we were talking about this. We were talking about the difference between rural and urban development when there was a protest going on in, in South for the smelter. You didn't want to have the conversation then. That's when the conversation needs to happen because all of those things, all of the questions of, of how we develop our society, of how women are treated in our society, all of those things come out and have a context and have a history and have a reason for why they exist in the society as they do. And if we don't deal with them, then they, they, they manifest in this way and then everybody gets an on shock like if they didn't know, everybody suffering from I never taught, you know? And so, that's my saltiness coming out there, but I don't know if anybody else have any other saltiness to, um, to add. But <laughs> you or you want me to go? Um, I I am not against um, I'm not against things being fashionable. I'm I'm not against people riding a wave or a carousel or jumping on a bandwagon. You know, we we're, we're on the earth. The earth is a bandwagon. You know. 
I've been a part of many bandwagons and uh, I've been, I've, I've gravitated to more serious issues through fashion, music, different aspects of culture, you know? So um, what I think um, is important with, with what Attila is saying is that I, I think if we're not kind of having those open discussions on an ongoing basis and presenting it within uh, the, 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 the framework of our society, whether it's through some cultural representation or education or whatever the case may be, um, then we kind of run the risk of either having this huge disconnect between uh, the people that are affected the most by the issues or people not knowing how to express themselves. And when people don't know how to express themselves, you know, we know that that, that manifests as violence, you know? Um, so what someone was telling me really is that they were talking about 90 and they were saying that 90 was really a kind of incredible experience for those who had gone through 70 because they saw it as being a situation where some young man on the street or young woman on the street could actually do harm to one of the elders of 70, you know, without knowing who that was, who the person was, how important the person may have been or how the person could contextualize what was actually happening in 1990. You know, so those are the kind of risks that we run by constantly seeking to uh, uh, return, return these experiences to the, the shadow space, you know? So, I mean, I'm not against, like I said, the fashion. I'm not so with the, the Facebook talk and I, I like to read it. I don't like to talk too much, but... Um, it's entertaining. It's good. I think that people being sensitized um, through, you know, social media is not a bad thing at all. And social media, Black Lives Matter, is a social media movement. Um, but at the same time, if we don't have an ongoing kind of education, then then we run the risk of having a very large disconnect. So that's my thought on that. We're going to get a very salty view of America, and I want to. In, in bring into the conversation two comments, two, com two people, two persons who have commented, and one is responding directly to um, the issue that Chike and Attila, um, Kimi Ram Ramnin, or is it Ramnarain? I suppose it must be Ramnarain. So says it's, this is a very important question, which is when and how people enter conversations of justice. How do how do people who are just starting to get engaged become more involved? And I suppose that the issue there is starting, starting with what? Um, because if you entered a conversation start, at the point at which you started, but you brought to it, and this is where the issue of education comes in, if you brought it a certain amount of information, and what Attila is saying is that over and over, you have to, you have to tell that story of why and, and have people say, really, that happened here? Right, and then we have um, Hugh Lawrence who says, "Are we unified today to come together for a common cause, or are the times we are currently living in filled with distractions to ensure that we do not unify?" So that's mm. the point of whether there is some kind of, you know, deliberate um, issue to it, right? So let me hear you, America, if you want to deal with any of these or incorporate them or give us straight out your saltiness. Yeah, man, it's not a bad mind, you know, I mean, because I think uh, all of us here, I mean, you're seasoned with salt as well, you know, and to enhance the taste. All of us here are actively involved in social media in some form or the other, and it's, it's central to our organizing as well. But there are some things we need to really challenge and to put into context, which is the lack of historical reference points, not acknowledging that Facebook is an American corporation not acknowledging that you have been consuming literature almost entirely from the United States, right? Is, is not acknowledging that you're not reading content from within your space. And sometimes when you embrace that language, you embrace that dialogue, you may also reproduce some harm from misreading your context. The famous thing about this is cultural appropriation. Someone looked at a Ganesh tattoo on my hand and asked me if I'm appropriating 
Hinduism. And you know, like, I was like, where did I reach in the world that somebody would know me, would pull my arm and then ask me about cultural appropriation, not nuancing and dialogues when they circulated globally, right? We draw on the progressive elements, but we have to really challenge the parts that don't really fit. And I know Sunity, you have done some very serious around work around that, Lloyd Best and the epistemological problematique that comes about in the way knowledge moves itself. So I think next thing is also organizing the assumption that you could signal virtue to show how great you are and stand on the point of justice doesn't really create a conversation about growth for which the best of our leaders have also done and will continue to do. Growth is part of our ethic and politics and less than holding people accountable to the status. Maybe we need to look at the common thread, how a person will think over a period of time. Signaling virtue is so separate from collective organizing where individuals posture and have a, a false sense of power for which politicians are not impressed by, so it really doesn't bring about the kind of changes they think they may be doing, is that it really not looking at collective work. I usually ask people, well, what organization you are part of? What institution do you work with? When you say you are ally, you are ally to which union or which movement? And I think when we start to extend the question, not that we all need to become members or to be organized on the shop floor, right? But it's that we need to begin to not over-exaggerate our significance to advancing a movement, a cause, or a goal. And I think what I embrace from it is I love is the vocabulary. It is a form of informal education where people learn outside of the classroom. And uh, it brings about a politics of accountability. It shows consciousness. It also helps us identify potentially new leaders for movements who develop community. We don't need to only see it as followers, they also develop community. But just to the last point, there was a time I went to a secondary school long south and um, I finished my presentation and I tried to make sure that, you know, it's a religious institution. You know, I put some things there that I know people traditionally will not feel comfortable about, but I buttoned my crease as well, cool. And then afterwards, a young man came up to me, Mr. Sonat, and I really enjoyed your presentation, but I think you did a cisgender analysis of um, gender relations. And that is when I knew I was becoming obsolete. So where I was always at the, you know, like when I went to another school in Port of Spain, so how we could get more pro-feminist boyfriends? You know, that is the question they're asking me in a Caribbean studies class. And I wanted to know that even the, the, the priority that I had as a 17 year old had long gone, it was answered and resolved, not by all persons, but many young persons have got to that point on their own, took it as natural and wanted new starting points. And that is what social media allows us to assess. Mm -hmm. But does it not also, um, you know, I'm troubled by the algorithms that put you in a bubble that you think is the world. Um, and if you were not in the world of Facebook or any, any one of these social media, and you're, you, you are educating yourself, you are in charge of your education and you're finding the things that you want to go towards. Um, is, there, is that a better way of having done it? Like I, I am really troubled by algorithms because the social media always think one of the things I deal with was throw that up at me all the time. And I am not that kind of, you know, reader or explorer. I, I, I just want to see, consume everything, you know? Um, is what we're seeing on, on social media the result of that streaming of people into marketing audiences, which is what the algorithm is about, that this is what you looked at and therefore this you are part of a group that could buy so-and-so products and that's when the ads and so-on start coming at you and therefore it is limiting your idea and your views of what is consensus because I mean, there's consensus within your bubble and you say, you think, well, all of us in the world think this way and we must therefore be right. And a whole other conversation is going on elsewhere and, and you have not been directed to that. Um, and people are therefore in the absence of coming to things with a body of knowledge and information, which is what school and community gives you. They cannot make sense of that. They think that is the world. They cannot, you, you have to be able, don't you, have, don't you have to have some level of critical faculty to sift and filter in order to find something that is meaningful. And if you come, out of, come, come at it without some basic information, 
we have come back to the issue. I think Chika raised this with uh, raised the point about the education system. Now I know that's a biggie for us, all of us, in that the reason that we are here talking and we are talking about the possibility that somebody in 1990 could would not know one of the leaders of 1970 is because you don't go to school and read anything about that. You're not encouraged. And when you go to primary school and they give you and you talk about your country, you know, we all know the famous thing, you know, and Car Caribbean Arabs and Christopher Columbus, and that's about it, right? How do we break out of this recurring decimal of constantly having to start over and everybody joining the conversation later, but from the same point of zero that gives you that that waste so much time of, of your life and you get to the point of a teller of saying it you know it's just noise i mean when are we moving to the point of organizing and action and so on how do we break out of that trap through the education system how do we come to a level of discussion as whether we're 15 year olds or 16 year olds but we have some shared idea of information about what has happened in this part of the world for as long as it has been here, if not through the education system. I and think, I mean, people are not, sorry. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say that people are not sharing family stories. You know, um, I'm a kind of member of the Bois Academy of Trinidad and Tobago. And one of the things that happens within that community is that you have people who are now studying stick fight tradition, you know, studying Kalinda. Mm -hmm. And when they go home and, you know, some older person in their family finds out that they are having this engagement with stick fight, that is when they hear, oh, you know, your great grandfather used to do that. And he was a stick fighter from so to so, and he got your head bust. And it had an incident where blah, 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 blah was the case, right? And this, this non-sharing of family story is a real crisis, I think, for, for but, our people. And, but because you want, you want to explore why, though. I mean, that, that well, is a symptom, that's a symptom, but it has to be the source of the problem. What is responsible for that? Well, I think that there's a certain level of shame associated with, with family history. Or there's a certain level of bacchanal that, you know, that we inherit. And, you know, there's, there's a falling out with this one or that one. But, you know, I, what I appreciated about both of my parents is that they constantly talked about their mother, their grandmother, where they came from. I know my great-grandmother was born in Barbados just after emancipation. She, she could not even name enslavement she called it that thing because mm. she was so terrified of it although she was not born during enslavement and she left Barbados I know I know her whole story of leaving Barbados and going to the to Panama and helping you know being one of those people who had built the canal and saving up all her money through Susu and thing and being an investor in Marcus Garvey's Black Star Line project and being a Garvey I going I'm buying a house in Grenada on Lucas Street. I know my family's history, and it is also the history of the region. So that you know, through yeah, exactly. through my family history, I have an entry point into the history of the region. Mm -hmm. um, to go back into what you were talking about before about the the continuing cycle, I know my connection to Gaviism. I know my connection to Pan Africanism. I know my connection to Venezuela through Sucre Province. I know all of those things. I know my connection to Black Caribs in Saint Vincent. But people are not sharing these stories, and is it because you know? I don't think it's that that the oral history is not there. I think that we stopped telling stories to our children. And now you have a situation where we expect things to be written down in book, but to sit down and talk with my father about his father's nickname, which was Vanquish. <laughs> you know, he came from a village in Grenada called Shantimel, where mm. they were never enslaved. They, they were bonded laborers who came. You know, 
we have these stories. We have the history that is not written in the history books. I know that history because I, I also live it every day. The stories that I have, I, I, I am told by my parents and now that they are approaching 80 and they repeat their stories. Mm -hmm. I, I, have, I have now reached a point where I can repeat them for them and say, you know, if they forget Sideways was a man who used to live or be behind the bridge in 1970. He was bipolar and sometimes he would go sideways. He was a great intellect, you know? I know these stories because my father told me these stories, you know? And I'm just, I'm just saying that we have a rich oral history. Um, and I just want to encourage young people to interview older people in their families, particularly in this time when we are losing older people. Don't wait for the education system. Just talk to older people in your family. This is one of the things that I perhaps enjoy the most, talking to older people about what life was like back in the day. You know, sometime in the future, we will be the ones who will be like, yeah, I remember that time when Marshall was performing and saying, and you know, that will be our history. Or remember that time when it had COVID and we, we didn't get out of lockdown for three years, not trying to put good mouth on mm. the whole scene, but you know, the oral history is crucial. And it's easier now for us to document the oral history without having to write it down. Just point a voice note at somebody and That's get it. them to record. I, I, I take your point um, very strongly. Um, but I developed this, I, this term I call engineered amnesia. Mm. And that is engineered through the education system. And one of the positions, and I mean, you, you could, you could challenge this if you want that I have, is that I am tired of the fact that the things that are important to us have to be marginalized outside of the formal system. I don't want the oral. Agreed. I, I absolutely accept we have to encourage the oral history. The oral, that's our history. The oral history, documentation, and so on. But I do not think the state should be allowed to continue taking all the apparatus that taxpayers pay for and all the funds and all the systems and resources that it has to be allowed to continue deploying it in the service of history that is pointless and meaningless, while all these troopers like yourself and other people, so many individuals are doing that work so hard and don't have those resources. I think these things, this, the, the apparatus should be commanded for our purposes. And that we really- But Sonati, that's why, that's why Lloyd Best Institute is so crucial. And maybe the state is 20 years behind the schedule, but, we have to be consistent in the work that we do. And I mean, you have been toiling in the vineyards longer than I have. And, uh, you know, the work is so important. Whether the state understands it or recognizes it or not, the work is important. And, and the fact that we are here persevering and doing the work and, and having visibility to do the work as well. We don't actually need the Ministry of Education anymore. We have the power to set up our own digital platforms. We have the power to set up our own culture ministry or whatever, whatever the institution. Um, right? I don't think we should let them get away. Yeah, but but at some, I, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. But at some point, they're going to they're gonna get the, the memo. At some point, they, maybe there'll be somebody inside of one of these institutions. I do think that there are people within the ministries that understand, that get it. And we just have to keep chucking them, chucking them, chucking them. Like well, today, just, just, a little, just a little subtle chuck. <laughs> just well, a little subtle I chuck. It's about time, it's just going on too long. I want to welcome back Shike to the conversation because okay, it's a well And I want to acknowledge a comment here from Brandon O'Brien saying that further to Attila and Amelka's point, I have a question. What ways are there for some of us to remain engaged when we often don't have the stamina for public action or often headed public debate? I'm not sure what the last part means, if he, may, if he means that um, he's tired of that heading public debate as well. But okay, um, you wanna rejoin us, Shike? Yeah, um, 
the stamina for public action, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, Attila has been one of the people that has been kind of operating as an activist and as a trooper and as someone that is a, a social conscience and, and so much uh, uh, work that goes into just kind of confronting the issues, you know? Um, I think that we, we, we need to accept that we are not healing without confronting these issues. We are not moving forward as a society without understanding our culture or the various cultures and our various histories, you know? It's just not happening. And that, that does need to be acknowledged uh, on the state level. I think there's some fear. Um, I think there is uh, an unwillingness to, to acknowledge the difficult things and to have the difficult conversations. Uh, there are people that are in positions of power right now that owe their positions in the society, whether it's at a judicial level, a political level, an economic level, to the grapplings of the 30s, the 50s, the 70s, you know? Um, in, in my household, though, um, there was not that open conversation. And I know that in a lot of households, it, it wasn't quite like Attila's. There wasn't that open conversation. I think that um, that people kind of didn't Okay, so I think that sounds like there seems that there's a technical problem. Um, Amelka, you want to pick this up? There's no problem, if I may. I, I think I'll start with you know, something I, I, I try to raise with people um, who work in these areas, have a deep consciousness in it, and more so even scholars abroad, who sometimes have a tendency when it is not at its best, when they don't do their work their best, to totalize the Caribbean, to say that he is either inherently radical or inherently backward and not moving up to par. And that is why I think ethnography or even just anthropology in general really brings out the best, the closest to life stories and meanings. And I know Attila was trying to speak to that. Last year, I was tutoring a course at the university, put up a picture of capitalism and slavery, put up a picture of Eric Williams and his graduation gong and say, who is that? And not one person could answer that question. And now that could say a lot about the matriculation standards and what kind of people come in here. But it's less to do with the university actually is what they did not have before they came. And this is an environment where most of the students would have written Caribbean studies for sixth form at Cape. And it has history, geography, and economics as core components of it. Some of these schools, which are considered to be prestigious, have literature as a compulsory subject or history or another language. And when you study a language, you really also understand the history and the culture of that language or the many countries that share that language. So what is that gap? The, the, at the end of the day, we have to be evangelical about this mission with history. There's no two ways about it. I can't sit down and analyze. For me, critique could never be enough. It's really working to create that narrative and all the oral studies projects and the and the archival work that we do, and the Kayap and the Panchat, you know, the Quayol that you're trying to teach Sunati. That is the important work to reach the persons that can help not just understand the importance of it in the past, but to see its relevance in the present. And I think that is when history becomes useful. So as a young person, I always I was very aware of history, was all around me. But I realized that uh, it was also dead, that many streets are named after people I look up to but persons will walk past it because they didn't even care about street names. So there was a geographic problem, which made the history kind of null and void. But there's an interesting thing, and this is what I always try to tap into. There's something um, potentially radical or open to possibilities when people do not think they are constructed by history, therefore they are not confined by its shortcomings as well. And there's an opening we could have not to exploit that or manipulate people, but to guide them to more open ways of thinking about it. So the question is not that history is not taught, but what histories are taught. There are certain narratives. There's the kind of light switch of independence to break away from a colonial past. All students know that we are no longer colonial, but never trouble that statement itself. 
what does no longer mean? Can one be no longer colonial? What does independence and the kind of hubris we have around that statement that we now free? That's something we are taught. So part of the language and nationalism, you know, has real shortcomings. And we think about different nationalisms fighting for space. And as well, like in French, you have the idea of savoir and connect, two verbs to know, which it says to know, but savoir, to know something almost intellectually, connect, to be familiar with it, to intimately know something. And I also think people need to walk through history. Of course, I'm biased to the idea of a cultural history. And I don't think history should only be understood because it is relevant to your identity, the one you articulate, but rather the one that we share in a space. So geography gives us a sense of place. When I saw the temple on the sea, I thought that was a mythology that was relevant to me. That you could determine not just a place to worship, but you could reclaim parts of the sea to create more land for you to pray. For some reason, that was a radical added to me. I didn't have to be a Hindu. I didn't have to be an Indian. I didn't have to live in that part of Trinidad. But that is what mattered to me. You don't have to be a Roman Catholic to go Mount St. Benedict. And perhaps you realize colonizers always had the best point of view. But the point of view is what was relevant to people not the process that enabled persons to take piece of a mountain and then look out and say, this is perspective. So thinking about public space, thinking about persons walking through history and seeing how it connects to their struggles in their life, I think becomes important. And that is why that we could advocate on sexualities that may not be our own or what we identify with. We advocate for justice for ethnic groups because we understand that they live here and they need to find peace and dignity in their lives, not just because I feel this way, and I think that is what liberates us. History is very practical and pragmatic and to apply to our problems in the present. Well, if we understand okay. that the temple in the sea is really, I mean, for me, it really was a powerful act of resistance, then we would understand what we have in common with Sadhu. That is not Sadhu versus somebody else, whatever. What we have had is resistance. And that is what he did. So you couldn't, you couldn't build your temple online. Okay, I'm going to see and put it, you know? And what a thing to have done. Exactly. How many buckets of cement you carry to get enough to stand up from the bottom of the sea up? Uh, we have con uh, comments here from Mark Skinner and John Arley. And Mark is saying that the issue isn't that 1970, 90 isn't a part of the curriculum. It's that it isn't taught, one, in the right way, and two, equally across all schools. And that this is coming from a QRC old boy of 22. It wasn't taught. And then John Lee says, who are, who's, he asks, who are the policy leaders, guides, shapers of our educational curricula and systems? What about the place of traditional and yes, social media and education? And what place for alternative educational systems? So I, I mean, I think what he's describing there is the universe of possibilities for teaching because school is not the only place. We know that. Home is not the only place. Um, social media is not the only place, but do you have... Uh, a learning environment where there are certain things that are shared. What school does is it put, puts everybody in one place with one story. And that is why there is so much of, and, and so much of uh, an importance on it. You have to, you, you're investing and society invests in a view of itself through history when it allocates teachers and school buildings and all these things. Because when you go out there in your community, you, get a, you may get a partial view from this person, you know, all kinds of things. You go social media, get, but this, the education system is the one that carries the responsibility for all. And we are disco we're discovering now what it is like when you don't have a school these days. Because school is where one teacher, everybody in the same uniform, have the same textbook. It levels everybody, regardless of where you come from. You go into a classroom and all of you have the same thing, more or less, even the lunch. And um, if you get school feeding, and now everybody is in a different classroom. And if your classroom has a computer or works or it works, and if yours has, you know, noise in the background, and if yours has whatever, all kinds of things, all the inequality and inequities of individual lives are now on Zoom in the modern classroom that we have during the, in the pandemic classroom. And so the, all the questions about how does this take things back and forward? I mean, those are, that's a whole different conversation I, that we're not here to talk about today, but it does, um, it does point to the, the role of the education system as a leveler and as a carry off. And so if that, is, if that is flawed, if that is flawed, and that is where you're putting your resources, 
well then you are doing something about it you know it can't i i I don't know. I just think too, I have seen too many lives invested in this work come to the end of their life and then see people starting from scratch to think we should go on with this. This has to come to a point. And this is where we could pop it, where the organization may come in, but to challenge the education system and rattle it, you know? But it, Trinity, if I may, it. if I may, because I think this is where I really embrace some of Tiller's point about the autonomous work that happens. The reality is, I don't think the state may engineer even that amnesia because it doesn't serve their interests. You have an entire generation, it's no, but you have an entire generation that don't know the prime minister, don't know the MP. They're going to the wrong office when they have a petition. They're balling up anybody come in the name of politics. So like, even in the interests of people with power, it is, is it better for people to know history and civics and their landscape? And it's an interesting thing though, there are schools that produce these culturally empowered minds who have a deeper sense of place than some other students. And that is because they have key teachers who had a kind of commitment and a, a, um, sometimes a Puritan ethic. Music teachers, a famous parent teacher, a very important history teacher, not just only getting ones, but really expanding the mind. And there are many schools across Trinidad that have these key persons, a very popular sociology teacher in the East really expand the person's minds to think radically at 16 and you know, i was what i loved about going to school in six formers everybody have the Harold lambos and holborn and yeah full communists you know and by the time you finish exams and then like the parties after you start to slow down right uh, well not me but there was a way that school itself does unlock your mind much more than others would but i think why six former neighbors that was also the rule of three periods that you were allowed to exercise more leadership in the school and you got clubs. And you also saw the role of peer-to-peer -peer leadership. You got to govern a lot more than you would where you were disciplined before. What does that mean? I don't think teaching history is really just an intellectual moment or for people to acknowledge these key points, but there's a certain swag and a style that history must give to a person that it really gives them more power in their everyday life. And, and I guess that is what I want to speak to. And that is why Marshall Montano will have a concert and people would whine to Big Truck, even though they're whining into whichever road match you throw down on this year. Because he himself has institutionalized his career. And I know that sounds like one career, and we shouldn't compare it to society. But that is an example of artists not being forgotten, also not wanting to be forgotten, and creating an intergenerational dialogue around his craft. And Bonji Gallen does that also, I think a little bit less, but key artists throughout the world do that. The social club in Cuba, you know, um, Veloso and all them in Brazil with Bossa Nova. We see artists do it as well. I just want to, since, since we're on the topic of Soka, I just want to deviate a little bit and say, you know, Shadow in 1981 or so had this record. I don't know if you could see it behind me. It's kind of blurry. It's called The Zest Man. Mm, I know it. And <laughs> yeah. I remember posting that on social media and asking, what do you know about Zest? And people messaging me to ask me if that was a real record. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. So I'm just saying that to... I to, think I have it right there. The <laughs> to to, to, to reconfirm the point that we are just... We are so contextless in our, in our deliberations, even within our culture. And, and you well, know, that's a moment though, but that's a moment for learning, eh? And it's, that's a such a, it's such a learning moment. That's so, moment. So all of a sudden, I you have right all of these people, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, I was going viral on Twitter because all of these young people was like, Shadow is really the original Zest Man. <laughs> <laughs> so it's making that's people look again at, at the forms that exist. Mm -hmm. in their midst right, right? No, and, see, and remember that they, they you know they, they learned it from somewhere they got it from somewhere it didn't just appear in their head one day they get it from somewhere and this reminds me of a story that my dad would tell me about 1970 when he was he was selling um copies of the the um the Enjak newspaper at the time which was called East Dry River Speaks Mm -hmm. So he would go on Frederick Street and try and sell these copies because the, you know, the sales would then be funneled back into doing work for the, for the organization. 
And so he saw two older people passing and, you know, he tried to sell them some and they, they didn't take him on. And then he said, we will reignite the spirit of your royal buzz buckline this place. <laughs> and that was the key for them to turn back and buy two from him mm -hmm. because he... He reconnected with something Invoke. that Invoke. they knew. They in, he invoked something in their history that they recognized. Yeah. They remembered their days with Butler. They yeah. must have been, and it was, you know, it's like how are we reigniting the people in our communities? How are we reigniting? How are we including people in our communities to ensure that they are activated to do the communication that needs to be done? To yeah. remind the young people that, of the richness you see, that of point our about story. communication, though, what your father did there, that is, that is what normal communication should be like for people who are teachers, leaders, anybody, ch parents. It's that there's a point at which a question is there hanging and you just come in with the information. The man called himself, I'm a Zessa, I'm a Zessa. And you say, you know, there's shadow, so, so, so. And immediately you open a whole history and that person is hooked. And that is the art of teaching too, right? And so that exactly there is a seamlessness. There's a seamlessness. And, but some, the, the, the questions I am more detained by is why among the people who have that information, they do not release it, not even to their own children. In that moment, that is what I would call a teaching moment or a learning moment. But I want to, to say what uh, Marina Selandi Brown, who as you know is the Boca's founder and director, has a has a question here because I think she's trying to get us back to the discussion, which is a 1970 Marina. On the issue of race, races came together in 1970. What are the views of the panel on the sense of separation now? Shike, you've been a little quiet being off Zoom for a minute. You want to take that? Yeah, I've, I've been in and out. Um, can you repeat, repeat the you question, do. please? Yeah, on the issue of what she's saying is in, in 1970, she's stating that races came together in 1970. What what do we think? What do you all think on the about the sense of separation now? First of all, you have to accept that there is a sense of separation. And you have to also accept that the races the races came together in 1970. So if you accept those two things, I guess the question is, what do you think? But how do you account for that? Is there is there some deviation, something that has that is lost, or something that is interpreted differently, or what? Are we more divided? I guess is the question. No, than we were in seventy. Hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting question. Um, in seventy, I think uh, what was happening in China and Tobago is that it's it, it 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 was kind of like a worldwide many different movements were converging, you know, and I, I don't think, to be fair to our listeners, we've, we've described exactly what has been happening, but you had Michael Alza and Raymond Palagdari conducting the Young Power Movement, that's in 1968 and 1969, right? Then, as we mentioned, the Montreal Congress of Black Writers, which was kind of like a Black Power slash Pan-African uh, kind of situation. Before that, you have CLR James giving a number of popular lectures uh, in the 1960s throughout North America and Trinidad and Tobago. And then you have uh, Williams, of course, giving his talk in the 50s and, and coming to power. Um, but concerning the issues of, of race, I think you, you did have a number of Indian people involved in the movement and throughout the movement, right? So you had key people such as, as I mentioned, Raymond Palakdari Singh, you had Chan Maharaj, uh, you had Rafiq Shah, of course, who was the rebel lieutenant, uh, Augustus Ramreka Singh, uh, who was Winston Leonard, Winston Leonard, the Winston Leonard right? Augustus Ramreka Singh, who was a member of the, uh, the Students Guild and so on, you know? So you have all these people that were involved on a, on a personal and kind of individual level. However, at the time, um, there's that PNM, DLP, uh, Democratic Labour Party, and People's National Movement kind of divide that, that's happening to some extent. Um, Williams in 58, uh, with his infamous statement, had kind of 
uh, hurt members of the uh, East Indian community. Um, you know, the, the whole, the very notorious statement of a recalcitrant minority and, and all of that, although uh, the claim is that he was not uh, directing that at the Indian community per se, but at members of the DLP. Whichever way you want to take that, you, you, you can take it. Um, I think that, however, um, the DLP being under Badezi Sagan Maraj, um, who happened to be the uncle of Sat Maraj, and the founder of the um, Mahasabha, the Mahasabha, right? Uh, it, it's in the interest, in a sense, of these leaders to kind of maintain their power base, right? So if in any way the DLP, uh, for instance, in the 50s and 60s was making inroads into the African community or the PNM was doing the inverse, um, what you can do is that you can continue that colonial tradition of the divide and rule and whip up the masses and kind of get us into our camps of African Indian and, um, and get your voter base out to kind of have a kind of panic <laughs> of, you know, this is who I represent, this is who I am. And we've seen that kind of thing happening uh, throughout the, uh, in Guyana, we've seen it happening in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, where we have a majority Indian and African community. So that's a challenge that we face. Um, the Indian community in 70, uh, as a majority, did not get the opportunity to, to interact uh, with the urban African community. The attempt to do so, the, the, the major march, well, after the March to Karani, there was a major march that was supposed to happen on the 21st of April, and that's uh, 1970, and that's when the state of emergency was called. So uh, the sugar base, which was predominantly Indian at the time, and the oil and the urban uh, young African community uh, never really connected on that level. So it was kind of like a, an aborted uh, uh, attempt to, to kind of have that discussion between our communities. And I think that that discussion has not since then, well, maybe the um, National Alliance for Reconstruction to some extent, but um, since then that, that um, and of course the efforts of the Lloyd Best Institute, I think, but that discussion has not been had in, in any real way since that time, you know? So I think that that's some of the, the kind of problems that we face uh, with respect to the present time. Uh, to be honest, um, while there was Indian involvement in 70, um, the broader Indian community, which was largely rural, uh, did not get the opportunity to, to enter into the Black Power Movement in a significant way. Um, the Young Power Movement, however, run by Raymond Palak Dari Singh and Michael Alves, um, was a very broad-based kind of South Trinidad, urban, rural, uh, and Tobago kind of setup that allowed for that kind of wider discussion, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, I, um, I, I think that I, I, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I, I was saying I, that um, the, by, by 1970, the DLP was a spent force, absolutely leaving a vacuum that Pandey was able to, to come in very quickly into. Um, and there was actually, I mean, I was in Central as a 11 year old or something in 1970. And I really remember the excitement. And I was in Balmain Village, Cuba, the excitement of, the, of, our, of our village. And it's predominantly Indian, Indians with the idea of Africans and Indians unite. I think Indians, yes. I come, the ones that are, they were so excited by this idea. And I know my teachers who would be leaving school early to go in the march, right? And this was not, this was a very, um, I think Indians also could not, they were excited at the idea of an Afro-urban community that was at war with Williams. 
And they felt, oh, you're understanding now what it is we feel. And it's not about Williams, but the marginalization from the system of the of Cowan government. And there, and there was a, a significant bonding. And I mean, the, the banner that is famous about Indians and Africans Unite really spoke to that movement, which was um, quite a number of people were in it. And, and, they, and they had to come to town to do the march. And of course, there's this clear march to Karani. <clears throat> That, that is based on a lot of interviews with people yes. that they were done at DCFA. And the way in which the Indians were greeted, I mean, sorry, the, the marchers were the the, Africans. The greeted along the way and all this fear that um, Badis um, had invoked and so on. Now, mm -hmm. there's a very interesting postscript to that story that Raoul Pantin published in his um, 1970, his book. Black Power Day, yeah. Black Power Day, in which he said, he phoned Badis. The march was going to go, right? And he phoned Badis the day before the march, and Badis was welcoming to the march, right? On the record. And then Badis changed his mind. And subsequently, and there's a famous story of how he came out in the front yard because you know, it was the, it was the, um, yeah. there weren't the highways and so on. They were going on the eastern the all all next mm -hmm. day. And that the thinking, was that there was some negotiation. There was also, in, in, in that, there was a lot of pressure on people to not uh, endorse this march. And of course, the most famous one was the Archbishop of Port of Spain, who said he will join the march. And then went back on his word and said, he's not gonna, he's not gonna do it because the pressures that came down. And so there are, there are pieces inside of the story that really don't fit a particular narrative, you know? And more and more work has to, has to go on. Um, you wanted to say something, Tilla? Um, yeah, I wanted to say that um, in my readings, I found out that um, Prinsley Samaru yeah. was, um, had encountered Walter Rodney while he was studying in, in London. London at LSE, right? And on returning home, he was like one of the first um, you know, young Indian historians who was approached by um, Daga, by, or Granger, Dabo, his students were Beverly Jones, Guy Harewood, and they approached him and asked him if he would do some education for them. And Brinsley also, Professor Tamaru, was also one of the first people who went into rural Indian communities and actually spoke with them about Indian history in a, in a way that um, they would not have had exposure to. So again, this thing about somebody actively taking responsibility for the education of people. And the, as Sunati was mentioning, um, the March to Karni, which happened on the 13th, March 13th, 1970, where people walked, people offered food and sweet drink to the, the, the marchers, marched with them some way, although there was the threat of robbery and rape, you know, which is a classic threat that we still see being leveled um, against African people towards Indian people in the society. That you know, that is a recurring decimal in the conversation. That, that goes right back. Between, that goes right back and it goes right, 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 right back to colonial days. That separation. You know, Indian women would run away from their, their, their nice Indian husbands to go and shack up with a black man somewhere. Um, and, you know, they're, they're endless <laughs> calypsos that, that document that. Yeah. But, you, you know... I also want to go back again into the history and say that in 1884, when there was the Jahaji massacre, you know, Raviji, who I am very lucky to count as one of my gurus, he talks about the fact that people walked from all over Trinidad. They walked from plantations all over Trinidad. So it would not have only been Muslims, Shia Muslim Indians, it would have been Hindus, it would have been Africans, it would have been Payal people, because everybody understood that these colonial authorities were trying to take away the right of people to have their 
cultural expression. And so this, this is something that was repeated time and again. And that whole question of African people in the, in the urban areas being erased from the consciousness of the mainstream rank and file PNM party. I want to give a short, quick story here about going to Cuba and finding out that the Balize is actually called Sword of Shango, right? And <laughs> posting that online and getting feedback from a friend in England who said, yeah, well, not only was Eric a science man, but he also was friends with a guy called Fernando Ortiz, who was one of the first people to document Afro-Cuban religion. So, so Eric, for sure, 100% would have known that Balize is known as sort of Shango in Cuba. And that the people who live in, in, in large part in Laventil, Belmont areas, would have been bonded laborers who would have come from Oyo province which is the state where Shango is the patron Orisha, right? So, so I'm saying all of that to say that absolutely I agree with Sunati that there was this feeling between Indians and Africans that they were not being seen by the, by the, the, the mainstream of the party, which had put on, as um, George Orwell says, he closed and started walking on two feet, four feet good, two feet a little bit better. You know, yeah, but, let's, so but, let's, <laughs> but let's also not, let, for, for me, part of having the honest discussion is also mm -hmm. not downplaying the, the deep divides and problems that, that we have, right? So we do- Absolutely as, not. As, as I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to say that there, there are divides. But I also want to say that there is, com there is the whole idea of competing patriarchies. And, and if, if I could get you to be on my side by saying that, well, I look like you, so how you could choose that other person against me? Absolutely, that is part of what is um, causing problems. But I also want to say that there are a lot of similarities, and I just want to big up Ravi G again, who, um, who formed an organization called Astro, which is the Association of Traditional um, religion, um, Religious Expression in Trinidad. So you have indigenous people, African people, and, um, and Hindu people getting together and talking about some of the challenges that they are facing. You know, let's not forget that a couple of years ago in Antigua, there was a situation where under the OBIA laws that are still existing in Antigua, two pundits were expelled. They were actually deported for doing rituals there. And so, they, you know, there are all of these opportunities for us to get together and say, you know, we are not that dissimilar. And, and there are people who are doing that work in the society and we need to give them space and respect to do the work that they're doing. Sunati is one of them, Ravi G is one of them. You know, Ravi G has a whole group of people, young people that he's working with, um, young women that he's working with um, from his community to do that kind of work. And we also, in the African community, need to do that work of reaching out and saying, we are not the enemy. We need to do the work together. We need to, because if I understand myself and if I'm strong in my, in my sense of myself, there's no reason for me to oppress you. We have problems when people are unsure of themselves or unsure of their history or unsure of their position in the society. We see a lot of aggressive insecurity playing out as racism in the, in the place. And we just really need to address, well, what, what, what is behind you acting out like that? What is the story behind you acting out like that? And when we go behind and we get these stories, we'll see what it is really going on. And sometimes it's just that people do not have information and they're not educated. And so we go back again into the question of how we are educating ourselves. Yeah. I think yes, um, and, if you draw a line from the Muharram massacre, which is um, its anniversary is next month. So that's an yes. opportunity again for 
learning. Um, you can just straight lines of attempts to, uh, to get together that you could draw. Yes. And it goes beyond 1970, because after 1970, you had a seriously repressive state. This is people down there like, locked up in Nelson Island, um, state of emergency. Then you had the rise of NUF. Um, and you, um, you all know that's when you had the, the killings, the police killings, um, and the guerrilla activity that started in the absence of representation that, that NJAC was providing. Um, and you had, um, and you had, you get, you got to the point where people were on officially banned lists from the state on its sole TV station, trade unions, um, political leaders, just generally people who were opponents of the state. We went through a whole half a decade like that, and it gave rise again to another version of what we saw in 1970 through the United Labour Front before it was a political party. It was Sugars, Oil and Sugar Unite, and it was a powerful movement that led to another event of Bloody Tuesday in 1975. 1975, yeah. That's right. And and, if and, I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm and, and sorry, sorry, Amilka, just to cut you, but I just want to continue along with that line just to, to, to see, let's not forget Adrian Kula, Renzi with Butler and Stephen Mirage yeah. with, with CLR James and, and that, that, con that continual and attempt to, to unite the races, you know? And let's not forget Split Cipriani, seconds. right? No. They, they, I mean, some people want to start our labor movement from 1937, and that's fine, but oh, well, this is the year, 19, 19, um, 1919 to 1920, that the really most powerful expression, I mean, it exploded on the, and, and crippled the whole of Trinidad Tobago, the dock worker strike, that fueled strikes all over, and sugar workers, and the beat up the, the overseer and all these things was 1920 with Cipriani, and but his could... partner was Butler. Right, his but partner was Butler, who was in the British West Indian Regiment. Sorry, Amelka. No, it's a problem. The question, I, I'll, I'll be brief, is that I think we have to look at cultural moments and what they register. And I really identify with Chiki more about this because Chiki was trying to acknowledge what a movement also does not do in a time. And I think it's the duty of many movements afterwards, organizations after, to see the shortcomings, to see why it didn't make that, that turn, why it didn't mobilize and bring out new forces. And we have always seen key leaders or key persons from who don't seem to be in the identity of the oppressed group immediately ally themselves. And that is why we could identify them more easily. But to say that there was interracial unity across the broad movement, that has been called into question, I think rightly so. So for example, like even my family is from Tamana, you know, a lot of them didn't really identify with what was going on in Port of Spain. That was a movement happening almost outside of them. And even I have a, a well, I'm gonna say who it is, a family member who heard gorillas were attacking people in the mountain, thinking an animal was coming out and attacking persons. So even the consciousness, I, I think we shouldn't overstate how that consciousness was diffused throughout but, the society equally. But, but I'll just go to her, there were quite a number of African Trinidadians who didn't share the view either. Of course, and that is the right. point. And I think it's right. when right. we have right. solidarities, not if we have them. We do have them, but the moments, and I, I tell you, I was talking about that, it was resistance to the dominance of the PNM, and there was a certain type of solidarity, but it didn't translate into votes when NJAC competed into the elections. So there's a way solidarities happen and when solidarities don't happen. And I think we need to think about a race class analysis all the time. Chike kind of raised a point. In a course I taught geopolitics and political geography, we focus entirely on Guyana. Because the students here, even though the majority of the classroom might be from Trinidad, is that picture. That picture of Cherry Jagan and Forbes Burnham going to England to negotiate independence, waving off the plane. Is that moment that even now they are torn apart, the country would have to live with the consequence of that. That picture in Black Pond is my last point. I remember watching that picture when I was like 17, like 2008 maybe. Uh, no, I don't know, I'm in 17, 18 or 19. And I saw that picture and then I said, that is not me. You wouldn't believe that. And I'm not seeing that picture to say I critique it. I just didn't feel I needed to march with Indians to say I was down with them for their cause. And as, it was so funny because so many years afterwards, the, even the image it, and the message it was communicating, I think it was different because perhaps I did not live 
such a divided life in the East-West corridor with us and Indians. And that is why the Black Lives Matter movement would have in Trinidad, I talk about the contemporary one, would have to confront a real issue. You know, a lot of the focus started to come around the issue of white privilege, interracial solidarity, and I think the question of Indians and racial justice was not being taken up in the earliest part or not by probably dominant leaders, the, so the most persons at the forefront. And that is why it will keep moving. So BLM started in a certain way, it started embassy politics, then it went to MOVA, then the question of elections came up, which really had conflicted loyalties. A lot of people who were hardcore on racial justice wanted to get back in the political fold because for them, their blackness meant a cultural politics, but not one that would challenge their political ones and uh, political party ones. And that is why I think it's complex and a race class analysis is always yes, important. We're wrapping up now, we have three minutes left. And I think that, um, well, I just one person had a comment here about what specificities differentiated those Indians who did and did not engage, what facets of the movement were most, I, I don't think we have the time to answer that question, but I, I hope the person found some answers that um, the, the reality is somewhere between these extremes. And is the work of scholars and, and storytellers and people who live through things or know things to document and document so that people can go and find it there. And they, I mean, there are so, so many opportunities now to just put your voice note or sit down in front of a camera and record it. Um, last thoughts, everybody? Attila? Ah, <laughs> um, I mean, I just want to give thanks to my um my parents you know for giving me a heavy burden to carry um you know 1970 was it was not an easy thing that happened you know we didn't just get african names we got um we got a lot of trauma we got a lot of isolation we got a lot of people laughing at us. I remember being in standard five and hearing the teacher ask, what is not NJAC? And a teacher and a child responding, national Jambi attacking the country. And the teacher laughing until tears came to her eyes. Um, and me keeping quiet because these are, these are my people. These are my friends. These are the people who I spend all my time with. And so, um, I, I want to, I want to focus on healing and forgiveness and acknowledgement that the people who went through, who lived through 1970, their voices deserve to be heard. Those, those are, those of them who are still with us, um, they, their stories deserve to be heard, their voices deserve to be heard, um, and their contribution to who we are right now needs to be acknowledged and needs to be um, given some visibility as we move forward and as we try to make sense of what we have now, we really need to go back and look into our history and try and contextualize um, their pain, their trauma, there and, and how that is still informing what is going on in the society now. Okay, well, I think we will just leave it at that. Ashe, Shanti, Um, thank you thank for joining you. us. Thank you, everyone. Twenty twenty marks ten years of TNT's National Literary Festival, and it's the first ever virtual NGC Bookers Lit Fest. It's packed with stories, talk, readings, extempo, poetry, new talent, and of course, surprises. Eighteen events, eighty participants. Friday eighteenth to Sunday twentieth September. Catch it all via Facebook, YouTube, and on the Bookers website. Bookerslitfest.com
to revolt. One. To revolt, meaning to renounce allegiance to a language that stuffed mouths with sharp cane and raw cotton. Seasonal crops for perpetual suffocation. Bodies recrystallized and distilled. Mouths fibrous and bagasse dry. Meaning your scars are the only things allowed to speak when spoken to. The skin of those before you is riddled with speaking. Scars are untranslatable, inflexible, and unforgiving. Scars been colonizing bodies to the third and fourth generation. As slowly as salt clots the blood, as slowly as ripped skin sutures itself into plosives and crisp th sounds. Your new language is protective, covering your silence, holding black skin to account. Two, to renounce, which is to say to give up, to refuse to obey tight kerning on pages written with blood and metal and malformed morals. The scars are a many-tongued spirit. Scars resist from the shadow of a countless diaries and the Daily Mail, squatting in ink. Sullen, maroon, runaway, defiant, disobedient, dangerous, thug, terrorist, lazy, angry. It has taken centuries for our scars to master audio. We could not be heard unless someone white saw it happen until pain persisted into pixel and footage. If a ship dumps 1,000 bodies overboard in a forest of human trafficking, did they ever make a sound? Can scars hear instructions over the ocean? Which whiplash spells genocide? Three, to obey, to conform, to mind how you are guided. If an arm is removed for unsatisfactory labor, its pink maw instructs the remaining arm in a careful sifting of murderous herbs. If a foot is chopped off, its absence keeps a smooth striding mind. As the man who raped your mother to produce a higher quality product and raped your father to break his mind and raped your sister slash party favor also rapes you Allow the blistering to cool into full thickness. There will be very little pain on the healed flesh when he chokes on old age in front of you. Four, to mind, meaning to comply with, to attend to the knee in another man's throat and compel hot asphalt remains of other scarred ones, to burn his cold body as fuel for weeks and weeks of reminding ourselves of our price and our pricelessness. Although breaking the law to demand justice offends people enough to keep killing us. Five, to comply, to submit, to survival. So this poem uh, was actually kind of difficult for me to write even though I have been um, occupied and obsessed you would say with 
social justice, um, black consciousness for a very long time from my teens. Um, but the way that I found into writing it was through scars, which I am also currently obsessed with. And the fact that all these things have happened for so long that they're, they're happening now. They happened um, teen generations ago from the time that people were enslaved. Um, and the only thing, the only thing that's been constant has been the fact that it, it, it leaves scars on you. If it's not physical scars, it's mental scars, it's emotional scars. You know, black people are just walking around with a lot of scars on the inside and the outside from being objectified, being dehumanized, being enslaved in many different ways. So um, that's the way that I found into the poem. And it's still a work in progress. It's, it's probably going to change a lot in the, in the next coming months. But I think this first draft kind of brings together most of what I wanted to say about the issue. The title of my first piece is Independence. Only the crackle of cane fields and the cutlass slashing the side of a four-year-old's cheek in the cocoa estate offered partial beauty to the place I call home. Canadians sent us their royal banks. The dead ends of wigs in England fell on our laws. British Petroleum, Texaco and Shell dug for oil and dug out my father's eye. The second poem I have goes to March to Carony, the 12th of March, 1970. The African, like the Indian, forgets the cutter to his side is his laborer. The laborer forgets what the African and Indian remembers. They are niggers and coolies of ambition. Both bicker about the roof and fields the rain lands on. Both chant their ignorance of seasons and settlement. And I alone cannot clear the path, the rocks of historical shame. Gunmen of disunity in bushes, the smoke still in the air from houses we set on fire. I lock arms and form the banner of a cause march further down the road past the fiction of our scorn until tin camp lights have the last say in the night funeral the 9th of april 1970 for basil davis nothing but silence nothing to bid farewell to nothing dressed in black but their torched skin in the afternoon sun grief marched on expanded pavements Dashikis displayed colors of dreams. Students slung slogans uniformed in skirts and khaki pants. Women with babies on the breast nursed revolution. From Port of Spain to Sawa, they paraded their historical suffering. Carved messages in every rum bottle cork made a martyr of a comrade that we may have life because death no longer separated us from freedom. And this is the final poem in my reflections on the Black Power Revolution of 1970. It's dedicated to Beverly Jones. The poem's title is Nuff, the 13th of September, 1973. The consolation of Guevara and his unit's footprints left a trail upon the night. Machine guns turned all of this nocturnal promise to shooting secrets of the state. From ambush to ambush, they assassinated September's cause, dense and uncharted as a forest, leaving corpses in the hill, mouths open to the morning air, stars falling from the eye. Next, I have some reflections on the experiences of Les Nègres in the French Caribbean. L'étudiant noir. You spoke in one tongue first, shifting all your way to their civilization. It was sufficient to be French in Martinique until you went to Paris. How quick they were to remind you the perfume of liberté could not sweeten revolution and Louverture's garments. The only tributes they had to your tribe, amnesic histories flaunting baguettes, and wars against dark-skinned humanity for fertile lands and exotic fruit. Because this mind echoes the hymns of their madness, the black body pauses, halts, stammers in assault, 
those rites made you publish your conscience, great against the divinity of their cathedrals and cities. You penned Africa into being, finding hope and home in the mouth of her rivers, basin of ancestral stars, the good earth of Africa, where children inherit her vast forests in the skin, whether or not the islands sing her song and taste her rain. Le Pays des Revenants. And we cue the small girls in white dresses to walk, swinging old fashioned baskets to church, grind the coffee on the street side for them to smell the spoils of plantation, commission the nation to smile, black bodies ready to assist, give direction. Even yellow birds on pastures are trained to chirp in a Frenchman's French. Island of flowers bending over backwards to appear modern colony doing just fine unchanging like the gentle face of a first true love we do not live in that paradise they discover over and over again the economy attracts white repetitions for tropical landscapes packaged memories of good creoles with wavy hair and negrillon waltzing in a spiritualized poverty as time goes by it would seem our surrender of hills and open hatred confirm a role positive, perfectly cheap observation on tours to blind them from their own barbarity. And these last two poems reflect on the situation on blacks in what we refer to as Latin America. Pizarro yawned with a poisoned tongue, lifting the sails of boats around him, beating into us the rhythm of chains arch back through El Modo de Producción y Clavista, America's black children, fugitives of the night, running through geographies widened in sleep, each nigger stripped of their history, each history robbed of their afternoon, each afternoon filled with bitterness and death. They would have us think slavery had befallen our lives and our poverty something sweet enough to sing along to, simplified. When we were more than great books written overseas, the indignant diaries of priests, man's gift to queens, grown tired of jewels, and desire cruelly transfigured into sugar and pearl countries. And the last poem is for a famous Spaniard at the bottom of Port of Spain, Columbus Square. Embassies of Spain still press lands on the new world to utter the name of their god. The admiral stands tall in the capital city colonial myth looking on poverty's timelessness. As I write, babies battle with congested lungs in the ghetto. So all of this talk of freedom was meant to free whose chest? For I have seen the hungry rise with the unchained, street dogs scavenging bones, thrown to the roadside near the fountain of barbarity. I have watched none of it pause in this half promise of independence, steeped in the romance of discoveries and conquistadors. This short series of poems I delivered was centered around the idea of blackness and how it is understood, I think, in the Caribbean and the Americas. First, I was interested in looking specifically at the Black Power Revolution in Trinidad and Tobago in 1970, and in 2020 means we are in the 50th anniversary of that revolution. And we are in a moment now where the movement for the dignity of black life throughout the world has gripped the imagination of many. It has forced us to contend with issues of not just race, but how do we create material outcomes for racial justice? And naturally, if we think about the situation of black power in Trinidad and Tobago, we have to think about interracial solidarity fundamentally between persons who are descendants of Africans and descendants of Indians. And expanding my lens because I never just read up on one particular island's history, I wanted to understand blackness as it relates to persons in the Antilles, in the French, the Antillean countries, the Francophone countries here that we have and how does the prospect of independence look like? What does revolution mean in that space? How do I read Césaire as I do and not just reject his negritude but understand what does a negritude look like with the type of politics I identify with more, perhaps more of a Conde. So bringing that lens upon the work and giving respect to the people who came before me was important. And naturally, that turn to Latin America is important. One of the largest populations of African people outside of Africa is in Latin America. And understanding um, what does the Spanish colonial conquest 
what does the development of a mestizo culture do to exclude black people understanding the plight of Afro-Peruvians are equally important. So I see this as a project of the black Americas and understanding us as this creation of the new world and Atlantic economy and liberating each other in that same process. Right. Meeting Beverly Jones, January 9, 2020. Dear Father, I was surprised to get your letter today. I was surprised to get your letter, period. First, I didn't know people still wrote letters on paper with pens, put them in envelopes and mailed them to other people. Who does that and why? Second, I thought you were a figment of my mother's imagination or a really impressive lie she told once and stuck to for the rest of her life. I don't know why you're writing me now. Yours, I guess, Benicia. January 29, 2020. Dear Dad, it feels weird to call you that. I've never had a dad before. I live with a single mom, like most of my friends. None of us call our fathers dad. Mostly we pretend our fathers don't exist. Hashtag ghosted, hashtag epic fail. TBQH, I'd prefer to text. Why are you off the grid? Are you some kind of hipster? Hashtag hilarious. You asked, so, I'm 16 of V because it was 16 and something years ago that you did the smash and dash with my mother. Hashtag classy, hashtag peak Caribbean masculinity. Yes, I'm a sarcastic bastard. See what I did there? Two, I live with her in an apartment in Belmont. That's close to the Queen's Park Savannah where you played mass. You and Bernie had your thing there. She told me all about it. Hashtag you, I cannot, again, you. Moving along. Three, I'm in form five at St. Anne's Convent. It's a prestige school. My neighbor, Jody, hashtag heart eyes, says it was founded by white Catholic foreigners for their white Catholic children. The savage natives inherited the convent after independence. What you wrote about your, your boy days in Barbados? Hashtag exactly. Number four, I want to be a lawyer, though God knows why or how. I don't know if she told you in her letters, but Bernadette's a waitress. She barely makes enough money for rent. I'm going to have to get a job in July. Anyway, Bernie needs me to go to the grocery and cook dinner, and I also have a project to finish for history. Yours, are we absolutely sure? Benicia. February 21, 2020. Dear sperm donor, thanks for the pics. I have your face and my grandfather's eyes my grandmother's smile and my mother's nothing. I secretly used to think I was adopted. Don't tell her that. You asked why I'm interested in law? I don't really know. I just always had this passion for justice. I think I want to be a judge one day, minus the robes. I DK where they were going with that, but no, just no. What's going on? It's carnival, my favorite time. Hashtag carnival baby, hashtag duh. Bernie always plays mass and I was going to play with her for the first time in an adult band. She took her hand in a susu for our costume since last year, but she said with the pandemic it isn't safe. What pandemic? I asked her. Nobody in Trinidad cares about coronavirus. It have mass to play. Bernadette sold the costumes today and paid for my ticket to the school fundraising carnival fete. Good thing she did because I'm not sure where we were going to find a thousand dollars otherwise. The government pays only half of what it costs to run the school. Rich kids donate, poor kids like me can't, hence fundraisers. Not playing mass hashtag sucks, but yay, mommy is going to let me go to the fete with Jody. hashtag 
whining specialist. Hashtag Soka is life. BTW Jody is my girlfriend. Yours, unless you change your mind about your homo daughter, Benicia. March 9th, 2020. Dear ghost, school is closed because of COVID-19. I don't know what the big deal is about a virus. I don't know what will happen now. I have exams in May. The weirdest thing happened. Jody's grandfather was arguing with these old men by the corner today. He asked me if I knew who Beverly Jones was. I decay, I said. He got really mad. He said she was an unsung hero of the revolution. What revolution? I asked. He started to quarrel about how young people don't know nothing about the history, how this country does eat up little children, how nothing ain't changed since 1970 and black hen chickens still eating the bread that the devil need. It was hashtag a lot, TBQH. He gave me a photocopy of some essay to read. What is it with you old people and paper? Couldn't he just give me the website? Jody's granddad sits in front of the rum shop, drinking rum and looking sad all day. I never talk to him. He's dangerous, Bernie says. She calls him the terrorist. He doesn't look dangerous to me, just old. Jody lives with him and she says he's normal. A police jeep drove past us real slow. He grabbed my hand and said something about the borrows and flying squad, I think. Uh, I escaped and came home to find your letter. I'll read the essay later. COVID-19 is kind of scary. Please keep safe. You're still my father. Hashtag slight hate. Yours in good health, I hope, Benicia. April 18th, 2020. Dear Dad, thanks for the money. The restaurant closed, so Mummy lost her job. The government promised grant money, but it hasn't come yet. I don't know how we're going to survive, TBQH. Please send more when you can. The landlord says we still have to pay the rent. Doesn't he know it's a pandemic? Benicia, April 20th, 2020. Something horrible happened. I can't tell mommy. Please don't tell her. I don't even know how to say it out loud, but I have to tell somebody. Last night, I tried to go by Jody to Lyme. I haven't been out of the house since school closed and I was so bored. Mommy sleeps all the time. Jody lives right there, a few houses down. I walk to her house all the time and it's always safe. Except last night. The street was empty. The whole country is on lockdown and nobody's supposed to be out after seven without a good reason. At first, when I saw the police jeep driving next to me, I thought they were going to tell me to go back home. Instead, they offered me a drop. I couldn't see their faces, even under the bright blue lights. They were all wearing masks. They didn't take me home. They took me to the lookout on the Lady Young Road. There were no cars and no people anywhere. I can't write what happened next. They made me do things, not with them, just by myself. But they watched and they laughed and they had their guns in their hands and I thought they would shoot me if I didn't do what they said. So I did what they wanted. And then they kicked me out of the car naked. They threw my clothes at me. I got dressed really fast and ran home. I was crying. It was a long way. How could police, who are supposed to protect me, do this horrible thing? What kind of awful place is this? Don't I have rights? They're monsters. If I report it, they'll say I never saw their faces. And who would I report it to? The Belmont police? 
I'm still crying. I hate them. Benicio. May 25th, 2020. Dad, why don't you have a phone like a normal person in DC? What kind of weird life do you live in America? Are you like in jail or something? Hashtag shady AF. How do I feel? Stink. Like rubbish they threw out on the road for rats and cockroaches to crawl over. I know it's not my fault. You don't have to tell me that. It's their fault. And it makes me, I, I don't know. Like I have all this hate inside me bubbling up all the time. It makes me want to throw up. How could they do that to me? How can they live with themselves? Benicia. May 25th, 2020. Later. Dear Dad, I know, two letters in one day, but I'm excited. Remember the essay the old man gave me? I just read it. Did you know about Beverly Jones? Hashtag Shiro, hashtag awesometastic. In the 1970s, there was this black power revolution in Trinidad. Black people did all kinds of things to get the white people and the government to give us our rights. They marched in the streets and threw paint on a statue in the cathedral and they had strikes. Hashtag wild. Beverly was a convent girl like me. She got involved with this group, the National Union of Freedom Fighters. They called themselves Nuff. They bombed a police station. Hashtag totes jelly. What I want to know is, how come they never taught us this in history? Hashtag cover up. Hashtag what is the truth? Remember Jody's grandfather? Now I know what he said. He was talking about Randolph Burroughs, a disgusting, horrible chief of police from the 70s. The flying squad was his special team to kill people. Nuff hid in the Northern Range. Remember the hills? You can see them from anywhere in Trinidad. Beverly lived in a camp up there, deep in the bush, in between running out to rob banks and kill policemen and whatnot. They said they were willing to, quote, die in order to achieve true liberation. That's a direct quote. The flying squad hunted them down like animals. They shot Beverly Jones in the face. They murdered her. She was 17. It makes me even angrier. She had a bunch of random stuff in her bag when they killed her. She had a cocoa tin of gelignite, two feet of fuse wire, a bag of sugar, split peas and chewing gum, socks, wash rags, shoe polish, condensed milk, plasters, an empty file with penicillin residue, ointments, and toothbrushes. I had to look up Jellignite. She wasn't playing, yo. That's literally bomb. Hashtag like a boss. Hashtag bad bitch. Hashtag RIP. Hashtag heartbroken. She died with a gun in her hand. After what police did to me, I understand why. I'm going to pack a bag too. Yours in revolution, Benicia. Quotations are taken from W. Chris Johnson's essay, Guerrilla Ganja Gun Girls, Policing Black Revolutionaries from Notting Hill to Laventil, published in Gender and History, Volume 26, Number 3, November 2014, pages 661 to 787. Um, this story, I think Beverly sent it, in uh, February, I was doing work with um, a small, like a micro band basically for Carnival. And um, one of the things that they do is uh, every year they have a panel discussion. And the theme of the band this year was remembering Beverly Jones. And um, in, in order to put the panel discussion together, I did a lot of research on the February Revolution, Black Power, and that whole movement around the time. And I found this essay um, that was just so evocative and so powerful 
um, and I immediately understood who this girl was. And when, when the opportunity came and I got the commission to write the story, I didn't know what I wanted to write, but I knew I wanted to include that list. And I wanted to quote from that essay because it's a great essay, everybody should read it. Like, it should be required reading in schools. Um, I don't know who will read this story, but I hope that it will give them an entry point into which they can learn more about this period of our history, which we don't talk about and which is not taught in schools and which seems like some kind of weird, dirty secret in our history. And I, I, I think it's a, mo a moment of power. And I particularly, um, in doing the edit of the story, I went back and I made her last letter dated the day of the George Floyd incident because I found that there was such a, um, a parallel between what happens to our young people with the police in Trinidad. She's not the only one um, that this kind of thing happened to. And what happened in the United States with the Black Lives Matter movement and how we in Trinidad in turn then responded to it. So yeah, all of that is folded into this tiny little story and I, I hope you enjoyed it. Revolution time. Revolution time is a turn and a turn is a crisis. And maybe how you spell crisis is where Christ is, maybe not. Revolution time is a turn about a time not taken because taken for granted, for given. Were you taken through revolution time word search looking for love, L-O-V-E? Were you given evil when you wanted to L-I-V-E, live? Live. Revolution is not a spell. Time is now. Time is devalued. Time is monetized, misgendered, is nothing if not now. Time is revolution you don't see. Revolution time happening inside. You can't tell by testing if someone is revolution positive. One thirty second revolution. Who is turning inwardly? The man cutting grass turns into a voter. The child from Venezuela turns into a moco. The lady squatting down the road, you call her crazy. Then then you turn a little inward and call her hungry. Take the time to turn and call her family. Call her family. I am wrong in every structure I take down. Everything we can sing to hope walls fall. We sing colonially. Also this click off. Also that, click off. Revolution time is reflection and reflex action, refusing to react. Revolution time when you love to kill your neighbor, but you click off. Revolution time is thinking again. Think again. The inspiration for this piece was first of all negative. Uh, although I was in Trinidad during the insurrection and have been in other places I don't want to talk about, uh, I have not so far been directly involved uh, in what people commonly think of as a revolution, which means shooting. Of course, if a revolution happens, you can shoot somebody you don't like because they stole something from you or kicked you in class. You don't necessarily shoot people for the purest political motives. So what I am interested in is the internal revolution, which is what we have to achieve individually, systemically and structurally. The revolution which is inward is also already happening. You never knew when it is happening in yourself right now.
thank you to the Bokas Lit Fest. Uh, if I die before next year, I will see you as a zombie. Stay well. Either citrus or antifolia, a small tropical citrus fruit, or an informal social gathering, or a circle of friends, as in the whole lime lime under the lime tree. Chocolate. Chocolate. A candy made from the fermented beans of the cocoa pod with added flavorings, sugar, and milk. Note, unless specified as chocolate tea, this is not to be confused with the beverage hot chocolate. Bake and shark. Bake and shark. A sandwich of fried bread and the batter fried flesh of the cartilaginous fish of the Elasmobranchi family closely associated with Maracas Bay and Anthony Bourdain, often served with tambran sauce. See also tambran. Guava. Guava. Sidium guajava, a tree producing a round or oval fruit which is eaten fresh or processed. A young, flexible branch of the tree was often used in the past as an educational tool called a gopher whip. We live in Stop your bow, Mr. Fiddler. Oh, ha, hi. This country so colorful and truly diverse. We're doing our best to put TNT first. You success through advancement, we encourage. We proudly supporting the rich cultural heritage, promoting development in the sporting arena, and empowering women for equality of gender. We sustaining the environment and strengthening the society. First citizens helping paint a brighter TNT. Drag your bow, Mr. Fiddler. I've been writing since I was a teenager, just for myself. Um, my piece was initially just an ode to homemade bread. And I spiced it up with recent events because I saw the relevance by integrating those two things. An automatic. Now pull up in my car, get out, lock the door. Wave to me neighbor, they ask me if I could help the child in SCA and I know I's a role model for the youth strong here, but I tired today. If focus, work on my mind, studying all the things I have to do before the deadline, one of those days when doubt abounds, feeling insufficient as a woman. But as I cross the threshold, I stop dead in my tracks. The radiant boldness of the scent knocks me back. I feel it pass over my skin. All through my hair, I feel it caress my nostrils that can't just be air as it worms its way into my bloodstream. Heart beats faster, stomach growls, saliva glands scream. Same time, my mother walked by, observed me on the spot. 
Mischievous twinkle in she eye, she know I like it hot. Yes, I make bread fresh out the oven. So you know I rush inside, cause bread is life. The very least we need for sustenance is all the extra things we just put on it does give we health problems and I know different. So the salty two chemical bonds away from plastic we call butter is the best part. Uh, spread it all over, can wait to lap it up as the flowery goodness crosses my lips. Reality hits. This not fresh, but cool. It was all in my head. I make this yesterday cause my mother dead. Choke up, grip the table, heart stops like hers, the wise and how she came to leave my world flash back to the chaos. Tensions were high while the bullets fly, truth laid bare, but they still believe the lies though. It went unnoticed in the grand scheme. Her heart stopped beating when Onella started to bleed. No one paid me to, but I screamed, internalizing that, make we fat. Make we heart burn, the Buddha say we suffer in life because of the things we yearn living alone. Hallucinating, like so many others swallowing trauma. Didn't see the signs of the rising pressure. It's a killer, not murder. You don't get charged for too much sauce when cheddar is the source of all this pressure we put on ourselves. Plus the blame placed on our shoulders for we mindset without historical owner. So... How could we be great without all the added weight? I chew, absorb the taste. This is why I learned to bake. This bread is life. The very least we need for sustenance is all the extra things we just put on it does give we health problems and I must be different. Her spirit reminds me to be calm when I least expect it rising. Like yeast in the pan embracing me. When life gets overwhelming and tough, reminding me to grow a heart out of shell like she crossed, keeping me. Moving forward with strength and purpose, coated in fate. Them long time bacon Pandora's driving me to set a good example for others. To smile with pride at a perfectly formed loaf. So now I don't know if to cry or go and teach the neighbor child instead. Because mommy, I miss your bread. Down there is a dismal little valley on a dismal little island. Notice the hills, how one of them carries on its face a scar, a section where bulldozers and tractors have sunk their rusty talons into its cheeks, scraped away the brush and the trees, and left behind a white crater of marl. The eyesore can be seen from ten or more miles away. To the people who live in this valley, it feels as if they wear the scar on their own skin, as if a kind of ruin has befallen them. The main character in Augustone is Augustone. It's a village in Jamaica that's, that's gone through many changes. You know, it starts out as a village, as a little hot hamlet, and by now it becomes um, a pretty rough inner city community in Jamaica. And I think I just wanted to tell that story through some of the people who have lived in Augustone over the years, some people who are very real, uh, some people who are based on people who are real and some people who are fictional and they all kind of get together in in this fictional August town. When he walks into the yard at night, he never makes a sound. It is as if the earth, every blade of grass, every stone adjusts itself to make space for him. Matt Haffey always knows when he's around. Usually she says nothing, but one night as he was stepping out of the yard, she stopped him. How the night treating him, Marlon? So my grandmother is probably the first person to tell me the story of Bedwood. Uh, 
And, you know, if you live in Jamaica, you're bound to hear that story. It's always told in a certain way. Um, it's, it's the idiot, the idiot who actually thought he could fly. And I guess as a writer, I think one of the, one of the things I can do for Bedward, one of the things that history can never do for him, is that I can give him wings. I, I can make him fly. That's what fiction can do for him. I don't like none of this, you know, Matt Huffy said to him. We don't have no choice. Them take August town people for coward, them take away as weak, we will show them. And Gina, who is, again, is the other person who suffers in the story, um, what can I give her? And I can give her the story. I, I, can, I can give the whole book to her and it can be her story. I, I can give her narrative power and agency. And so even though so much is taken from her, um, in the end she gets the book. First, you must imagine the sky, blue and cloudless if that helps, or else the luminously black spread of night. Next, and this is the important bit, you must imagine yourself inside it, inside the sky, floating beside me, below us the green and blue disk of the earth. Thank you, Bocas, and thank you, uh, Jeremy and Hannah of People Tree Press for believing in this book. I am going to jump right into the middle of the book. Um, in this book, um, the power, the, the bass rhythm of reggae music is so powerful that it can call back the dead. And I am going to read you a passage in which Bob Marley returns from the dead and he meets up with other spirits, you could call them. And this is in, um, he's, he's, he, he returns, he comes to the spirit yard via a hurricane. The wind whirls in the spirit, then lands him, give thanks and praise in a yard, dry and quiet and swept clean as holy ground. The others have been waiting for his arrival in the eye. The bass rhythm of the people has called them too. They lean against the zinc fence or sit on their haunches. Some of them have bongo drums. There is a congregation of birds in an ackee tree and the smell of corn roasting on hot coals. A red flag blows from a bamboo pole. A woman steps forward. They call me Nanny, she says. Queen Nanny of the Maroons. Is me could catch the white soldier's bullets and spit them out. That is what the books say, but I used to do so much more. I could grind a soldier's teeth and use the powder to light a good fire. I could spot one of them coming between the trees without turning around. I would feel it too, the two red of their jackets on my bare arm. One of them would piss behind the tree and I would hear it a mile off. If the books really said all, the very ink would stink of blood. Let's leave it at that. But see me here, the people have called. I have heard their new time music beating the ground and the feet of the children dancing, their hopefulness mixed with pain. Listen to me. There is an echo which travels along fault lines. It comes from their music, the strange music of the people. Sometimes the earth shudders and our bones move in their graves. How can we not arise? Up, up, ye mighty, someone sings. An elder steps forward. His long gray locks touch his knees. He carries a staff carved with a lion of Judah. My name is Leonard, he says. Leonard Howell. They call me the first Rasta, but that don't matter now. And they call me a thief, same like they call Garvey. Said I tricked the people with false tickets to Ethiopia. Thief or not, I had a vision. 
History needed me to keep the wheel turning. Yes, I. I come now to organize, to buoy the people up, 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 to higher groundation, praises. Another woman steps forward. Her head is tied with a piece of flower bag. One furious plait twines against her face. Me don't have no name, she says. Everybody forget it, and now not even me can remember it. It happened like that to plenty of we. We sow and plant and cook and sweep and wash and scrub and reap and stir and cry and pray and bend over and scream and break we back and then hold it straight again to send the children to school with piece of pencil so they can learn to write the book of we story and never forget it. I heard the babies crying from my grave, my grands and my grands' grands, and how could I not return? Mercy. Ever changing scene, ever changing colors dancing, ever changing gold and green, ever changing blue, every day a brand new painting. Changing me and you, things change, and who knows how? But now, now, it's now. Miss Jillian Moon, yes, I find your music real nice. You have anything new coming out? Yes, I have a new album. It's oh. called Ever Changing. Ever Changing, because since I reach, everything changed. Well, that is the truth. I mean, it, you, your arrival has put everything in a whole new context. I see. But we're going forward with the album, and the reaction has been good. So I'm really happy about that. Okay, okay. Hopefully, I learned something from you. Know. This is so cute. Thank right. you. I like Wait. them, but they're not my style, if uh, you know what I'm saying. Uh, no. <laughs> this is not your style at all. Mm. Wear them in good health, and I hope you get through with what you're looking for. Ever changing. Thank you. Yes, so much. That, that music was nice. I appreciate it. Thanks I for really that. enjoy that music. Cool. Tell a friend. Enjoy. 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 Right. So, Bye. I know in time. Some school right there. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope everybody there know Boki because I can't wait to spread my positivity. Oh no! No, I don't have anything. It have no signs, mm -hmm. no signs, nothing, no body, no people. Yes. Every time it have the NGC Bokas Lit Fest, it does have signs and it have volunteers and all kind of thing. It's not here. I ain't think it's happening this year, Buki. It's not happening here. Maybe somewhere else? 
Look, look, Abbe Bele. Who's Abbe Bele? You don't know oh, Abbe Bele? Abbe Bele is the top ex tempo Calypsonian in Trinidad and Tobago. Stop, stop, stop. Because of the corona. With all the talent that you have indeed, the pressure you're going on faces like the bread the devil needs. Are they feeling? You saying supper? You can come with us. Where are you going now? And up. Wake by Kamal Brathwaite. Ship, house on the water, I salute you. I am a bale of straw, swish of your cask's laughter, darkest cling of the gudgeon. There are shadows about me, eyes like mine, pores sweating fears like mine, souring wine. Wind carves the shape of the journey. Sculpture of sails is softer than a stone. Along the dolphin's trail of cloud, there is no native land. There is no grey on the sea with wind. There is no grey in the sky with rain. There is no sky to fall down on, no hill to run up to, and no night with its swimmers of whiteness. It was all so sudden. It was all so very sudden. And your spirit said, I am going away. I am gone. May your journey now be straight going. May your road be a peaceful one. And on arrival, if someone should ask you how you left us, we on these islands with their lockets of grief, say that you left us, eyes still closed, fists still curled, bones still lapped with milk. You know the rock's teeth. You know the pathways leaking up from the beaches. You know the wall with its cracks. Frangipani blossoms. Grave of the soldiers. Tales of the sandbox tree. May your journey now be straight going. May your road be a peaceful one. And on arrival, tell our never returning ancestors of old that now they have left us, the land is unbearably dry. Let there be rain. Tell our never returning grandfathers of old that the houses are damp, the verandas are cold with the wind weeping in from the sea, that the hedges are dusty that the tubes of the cane are dry. Let there be rain. Go, be a beneficent spirit and return to us in the morning. Let the cock know when you are around, crow loudly, royal-headed bugle of the corn. Let your wings embarrass the shadows, lengthening for us. May your journey now be straight going. May your road be a peaceful one. And on the ninth night, staring out of the moon's wrath of flies, wounds uncovered, toothless gaps gaping to mouths, the drilled flesh will begin to speak. Out of the dark I will call you, my warned dead, Ibo King Kota, priest of my silent bread. Bless me with shadows, white calico of mutters. Mother me with words, gems, spoken talismans of your broken tongue. I am your squat young confidence again though the air breeds ruins. Sing, 
cutlass edge of rain. Kill, destroy, restore me. The mud of dark breeds lilies. Crab's eyes rise over the cisterns of ruins. Voices take on flesh. And the flesh stripped by the sun's rod, by the slaver's rod, by the gumboots of conquerors, hardens the spirits that will not be revealed. At at Atibon, Atibon leg ba, Atibon leg ba, ouvri ba ye pou moi. Amen. Ouvri ba ye pou moi. Thank you, Kamau. Thank you, Kamau. Happy birthday, Professor Brathwaite. Thank you, Kamau. Kamau Brathwaite. How great thou art, how great your art. Give thanks for the life and work of Kamau Brathwit, whose tidalectic inspiration, some of the most important thinking of the 20th and 21st century and all time, continues as past, present and future are one without end. Give thanks. Professor Braffitt, thank you for all the work you have done in your life. Happy 90th birthday. Without your dedication to poetry and people, there would be no writer called Roger Robinson. Happy 90th birthday. Thank you so much, Professor Brathwaite, for everything that you have done for our language and for us. Onwards, Professor. Happy birthday, Kamau. We're going to look for you in the web of the croton bush, the sky juices, the bearded fig tree, the cryptic little emails that you used to send us, signed lowercase k, lowercase b, and all those words that you loved and you made us love. Thank you. Come out, Brathwaite. We are honoring you. We are honoring you. Listen. May we succeed. Thank you, Kamal. Thank you, Professor Braithwaite, for inspiring a whole generation of writers like me. And um, happy birthday. Thank you, Kamal, for everything that you will and everything that you are and everything that you forever will be.
Thank you.
Thank you. Minty Ali, chapter 26. As Haynes was going quietly across the yard, Mrs. Rouse called out to him, Mr. Haynes, you will not guess what happened here today. But there was no sign of anger on her face. Triumph, rather. Mr. Benoit, come back here this afternoon. Benoit, said Haynes. Yes, Sir Benoit, come right back like a dog to eat his vomit. But I knew he was coming, you know. He had to come. I drop off the car here about half past one and I come straight in. Well, as I reach to go up the step, I hear, Alice, Alice. I turn wrong and see the man standing up in the yard. Mr. Haynes, you could imagine. From the day the man leave here, I haven't seen him up to that hour. You could have knocked me down with a feather and if you had run a pin into me, I don't think you would have a drop of blood. Anyway, I pull myself together. God give me courage. And I ask him, what you want here? You are not right here? And I watch him. He say, I come to see you. I tell him, Go to your wife, she's the one you have to see now. And I turn my back on him and I walk into my bedroom. I sit down on the bed. I was feeling upset, you know. I was feeling upset, you know, Mr. Haynes. So I lean my head on the bed like, like that. Then I suddenly feel somebody standing over me. And when I look up, who was he? Into the bedroom? Into the bedroom! You ever could imagine Mr. Haynes that the bare face, that man so bare face. I face him stern. You have no right here, I say. I will call the police to put you out if you don't go. He say, yes, I know you will call the police. I hear you and the police very nice. Is that that bring me up here today? Sergeant Parks, he mean, you know. I tell him, yes, I have a protector now, so don't think you could take advantage of me. He tell me he hear I was going to take somebody and he come to find out if it's true and not to do it. <laughs> Imagine that man, Mr. Haynes. But that's not all I tell him. You not ashamed, Mr. McCarthy Benoit, to come here and come into this bedroom to ask me questions? Man, you ain't afraid God strike you down? He say, if God ain't strike he down already, he wouldn't strike me down again. I tell him, ah, is your conscience pricking you now? But your troubles ain't begin yet, boy. Wait, he talk a little bit, then he turn the conversation. He say, but tell me, Alice, Alice to my friends, I tell him, not you. <laughs> he ain't say anything to that. He only stopped a little bit, then he went on. Tell me you're not going to take him. Mr. Haynes, I look at that man. All his big punch gone. His eyes red, his clothes dirty, his face with a lot of hair on it. I look, listen to me. He looked like a fowl that fall in a barrel of molasses. You know, Mr. Haynes, how bright Mr. Benoit used to be when he stepped out from here long ago. You know, where rich? Yes, yes. He asked me if I going to take Pax. I tell him, it's no business of yours. What you have to do with that? He say, Alice, wherever I go, I see you before me. I tell him, 
And you will see me to your dying day. And then I went for him, Mr. Haynes. I tell him all I was to him and all I do for him and how he treat me. I tell him, look at your condition. What care is the woman taking of you? You think when you was with me, I would see you leaving this house looking as you're looking now? Never. When you was with me, you was somebody. But look at you now. Who respects you? You are nobody. You have an old prostitute for a wife. You can't walk a street in town without meeting a man who live with that woman you take and give your name. Mr. Haynes, I give him good and he ain't say a word. <laughs> he hung his head like a dog. So when I finish, he say, tell me, I promise me you're not going to take him. I going to take him, I tell him. He say, I'll prevent you. He catch a little spirit. He catch a little spirit now. You are mine until death, he say. Never in this life, I tell him. I stand up, you know, for he roused my spirit. I call him Mr. Haynes. I call him down for I had God on my side. Then he tried to come near me to hold me. But I tell him that if he touch me, I will ball the house down. So he stand up looking sheepish. Then he pick up himself and walk out. So you have triumphed over both of them, said Haynes. God will it so said Mrs. Rouse. He haven't kept me long. Thank you. with broadband bundles designed for you with flow starter and advanced plans you can enjoy faster speeds to stream more of what you love get free access to the best shows series and movies with hbo go and connectivity on the go with free flow wi-fi packages start from as low as 295 dollars and no contract required visit discoverflow.co to sign up today flow keeping you connected In the world of natural gas, Trinidad and Tobago enjoys an enviable reputation. This is not by chance. For over three decades, one company has led the way in shaping the country's unique energy sector and facilitating its growth. The National Gas Company of Trinidad and Tobago, NGC. NGC is a diversified energy company playing a key role in the development of Trinidad and Tobago's energy policy and increasingly sophisticated energy economy. Caribbean Media celebrates 10 years of the Bocas Litfest and of the OCM Bocas Prize for Caribbean Literature. As we mark this important milestone, 
we recognize the invaluable role that the National Festival has played in advancing the careers of Caribbean writers and indeed reigniting worldwide interest in Caribbean writing. As we enter the next decade, the OCM Group looks forward to the continued growth and influence of the festival and, as it has from the beginning, will continue to support its development. Turn in Trinidad and Tobago, there's something new to discover. But during this period, we made another discovery that we are resilient, that we are passionate yet steadfast, that our beauty shines through our people, our culture, and our energy. Let us stay the course until the beauty of our land can welcome us back. And until our focus shifts from fear to absolute wonder. We will continue to stand strong together, continue to support each other. Then we can definitely go places. Hope will take flight and give way to all the beauty we've missed. Now renewed, replenished, and all the lions we've shared with friends, our families, those we love. Let's stay the course. Continue to dream, imagine, and stay safe. Trinidad and Tobago is waiting on you. much for joining us for our conversation on the personal is always political. I'm Grace Aniza Ali. I am the first thing you should know I'm a proud Guyanese and currently living in New York City where I'm an assistant professor of art and public policy at NYU and this year I had the absolute joy of being one of the judges for the Bocas Prize in nonfiction. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to these three incredible voices we have with us today. First is Catherine Agard, who is a Trinidadian writer and currently based in California. She is the author of Of Color, an experimental essay about color, hybridity, and art making, and a memoir of encountering the binaries of black and white, particularly within North America. And Catherine, it's a physically such a beautiful, beautiful book, a work of art in itself, just as, as an object. So thank, thank you. you for creating, creating such a beautiful piece. We have with us also Andre Bagu, who is also a Trinidadian poet and writer. His book of essays, The Undiscovered Country, is an absolute feast, I think just a feast, exploring literature, art, film, food, <laughs> and politics of Trinidad, the Caribbean and beyond. And Andre, it's really a masterful collection, and I think a, a masterclass in the art of the essay. 
Um, and I, ha I put the emphasis on food because secretly I was hoping you would read parts of the doubles essay, but I know <laughs> you, have, <laughs> you have other plans, but I thought I'd slide that in just a little bit. And oh, thanks. Us, thanks for that. Oh, absolutely. With us is Tessa McWatt, who, as you all know, is the winner of the OCM Bocas Prize for Nonfiction for her stunning, stunning memoir, Shame on Me, An Anatomy of Race and Belonging, which dives into the history of British Guyana and also contemporary Guyana to explore ideas of race and belonging. And Tessa, just give me two seconds to gush <laughs> for, you know, for a minute to be one of the judges this year, particularly for the nonfiction prize and to have the gift of, first of all, reading your memoir and then honoring you with the prize um, was an absolute honor for oh, me. Thank you so much, Grace. Thank you for that. And thank you all for, for joining us and being here. So um, for our audience, we are going to hear from Catherine, Andre, and Tessa. They're going to read uh, brief excerpts from each of their books. And then we are going to come back and have a conversation with each other. And so Catherine, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, thank you so much and so many people to thank. Um, thank you to Nicholas and to Marcus on the back end as well. And with regards to my book, like thank you to my publisher and there's a lot of hands that go into making a book, which we all know, so. Okay, so I'm gonna read from the beginning. How can I explain myself? We bathe in blood. A Akesua is the word I remember to mean this, blood, bloodline but I know it's not the right word. I cannot Google to find it out, but I know it is wrong from its sound. Ah, the mouth inhaling open, K, posing for a smile with teeth. Su, the lips puckering for a kiss. Ah, the mouth preparing again to take in breath. This cannot be the word for blood. I call my uncle on Skype to learn the names for gold and green. I remember from a lesson that the word blue is simply brew in Sri, and there are infinite shades of green and gold. I search and find adada, that is, says the internet dictionary, a bluish earth brought up in digging gold before that which contains gold. I cannot remember the words. I never knew them, but I know that the right one must contain a feeling on the mouth that is quite different from the feeling of erasure or loss. My bloodline is broken. So it said, I want the feeling in my mouth of a whole word, an unbroken one. This word would not contain the sound of my mother having no mother. As it goes, my grandmother was not from the tribe. And so my mother is her own mother, as far as that is. She was treated fine, but then she left. The word I want to remember is about that power that comes through the mother's blood, that unbroken line before its rupture. My mother isn't a kingmaker, but perhaps one of her daughters could be. Or at least that's what I wonder when my cousin Derek sucks his teeth and says, Oh ho, why do you carry your father's name? Forget your father. Marry back into the clan, take everything that could be yours to have. It's a joke that everyone loves. The story goes that my grandfather wanted to marry a West Indian woman, an important political symbol. Still in Kumasi, in Ghana, Auntie says, you are special children, our link across the oceans. The ocean doesn't separate, but joins us. The word for blood, I think, must have the fluid motion of the tongue, containing disparate sounds, but gliding smoothly through. I write about eating fufu in Elmina Castle, my mother crying. I was not young, but I was too young to appreciate the slave holdings underneath, to behold them, to understand. I looked at the ocean and I saw the gray water, the crashing, churning white. This part of my family were not ever enslaved, had nothing to do with it, a fantasy in itself. The fantasy, the truth, we are politicians and scholars and sages and chiefs. 
But there in my mother not having a mother is a blank space in my bloodline like the ocean. I want to think of it as connection, not separation, not erasure, but voyaging. We haven't lost a bloodline, but remade it. I must think like this, for there is no going back, not for everyone, not for all of us. There is only a fantasy in going backwards and a fantasy in staying still. I write this too as a measure of grief. I write this too to remember the promise of otherwise. The salt, salt boys and sings. The salt boys and stings. The water cleanses and seeps into the holes. Movement in the water, whichever way, shudders us with swift recoil. In looking to the horizon, moving towards it, I first do not notice that I am wounded until I find that I have sunk. There may be no forward, but there is motion. Not forward, but under, between, above, beyond. I want. In an infinite voyage, there is change and there is return. I ask you to return to this page if you think you've made it to the end. We were there already and we were always approaching it. Of course, my mother has a mother, and of course, her mother has a mother. My mother's mother says that bitch and laughs when her dogs die from eating frogs or swallowing crickets or chewed up cane. I don't want to repeat the stories of her going to Ghana from Trinidad, leaving with her children, leaving Ghana to Trinidad in the dead of night to avoid a coup the rumors. I don't want to repeat these stories, so I've written them down, so I don't have to. I don't want to repeat the stories my mother tells me of how her mother went to Africa thinking she'd find savages, thinking that she, her color changed by a little bit of Scottish blood, would show them. I'm trying to find records of Scottish slave owners. I know the name I carry is of this given to trace a mulatto dropped off on the steps of a church in Barbados. I wonder if my father's father's family and my mother's mother's family once traveled in the same liquids. I wonder the difference between the words family and blood, the space between them, the time it takes to get to one place. When my grandmother got to Ghana, the first thing she asked was, do you have ice cream here? and they laughed at her. They laughed at this poor colonized West Indian girl, this poor child who had only known an island. I want to know and write about the journey, the time in the plane, the boat, the crossing. I live in this convergence. That is the truth. Both before and after they met the landmass, before they met each other's crystallized conceptions of each other, before they couldn't see. I'm sitting here writing this, reading this, and looking at the ocean, blocked and damned. This connection I have, this parallel of ocean and blood, the blue of the water where there's blood in it. What is the word for that? By the way, a kiswa means sparrow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Every time I hear that, um, that line, it, it stays with me, it haunts me. We have not lost the bloodline, but we've remade it. It's such such a haunting line. Thank you for reading that Thank passage. You for listening. Thank you. And now, Andre Bagu. Andre? Andre, can you unmute? Yes, thank there you so you much. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here with all of these wonderful writers, and I'd like to say thank you to the book as Slit First. So I'm not going to read the doubles essay, uh, as you mentioned, Grace. Um, I'm going to read from In Plato's Cave. Like Foster's book, the film starts on a beach. It is a school expedition. Boys and girls are being taught lessons about the sea and nature. There is kite flying, there is tag playing. One boy, 
who has no male figures in his life and is about to leave school, is given a special send off by a paternal teacher who takes him aside and makes an awkward speech about the birds and the bees. Sex between man and woman, the teacher informs young Morris, is God's wondrous purpose. It might be that the broadcasters empathized with this point of view. Maybe they were satisfied with the fact that the major characters in the film, including Morris's first lover, Clive, played by Hugh Grant, fight their sexuality. Famously, Foster always wanted to write a gay novel with a happy ending, but he didn't. And I've always found the book and the faithful film adaptation sad. Instead of ending up with the man he was meant to be with, his first love from university days, Morris ends up far from home. Clive chooses a life of lies. When he shuts the window in the final scene, he's shutting out a life in which he could be happy, closing down his true self. If you've really invested in the film, the final chords of the score will tear you open, make you contemplate your most secret loss, rip apart every bandage you've applied in the intervening years, leave you falling to your knees, your body crossed, lame and wanting. Life in those days worked as a kind of rehearsal space, a Fellini-esque movie set. You weren't yet sure where the camera was, who your character was, or what the story was going to be. I was treading water in the way gay boys tread water before that day when, finally, they summon up the courage to tell themselves, yes, yes, the rumors are true. Years later, I found the film Morris at university and the power of art to transform life became clear. In a way, the film's wide open beach, its two men holding hands while lying in the grass, its angelic voices singing Psalm 51, its pouring rain in the cold moonlit night, its dark musty boathouse where quietly someone lay in wait, hopeful, all became more real than anything that had at that point ever happened to me on the hot streets of Port of Spain. I seized upon Morris. I watched it repeatedly, obsessively. I used it as a cautionary tale or warning. I used it as a prayer. I hoped that despite the dangers of intolerance around me, it could somehow change my world. And in this way, it already has. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Andre. Thank you. It's no doubles, but it's just as amazing. <laughs> Merchant Ivory instead. <laughs> and finally, we'll hear um, Tessa reading from Shame on Me. Tessa? Thank you so much, Grace, and thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. I wish I were in Trinidad with all of you, but it's nice to be here as a, as a consolation, and I'm really grateful to the Bocas Festival for inviting me. Um, so Shame on Me is, um, is, a, is divided into sections that um, are meant to represent an a, a, a experiment. So the first section is hypothesis, then we have experiment, um, analysis, and findings. And I'm going to read from... Um, experiment, um, just the first few pages. Eight years old, I'm sitting near the back of the room in the grade three classroom of my suburban Toronto elementary school. My desk is close to the window and I'm easily distracted by the birds. One particular bird that preens itself on a branch, its feathers shuddering up and down. I'm not paying much attention to what the teacher is saying. We've been reading a book out loud together and I haven't been asked to read. I feel off the hook, set free to dream. A few minutes into daydreaming, I feel a change of tone in the teacher's voice and the class goes quiet. 
I snap out of my reverie. There's a question in the air. I look around at my classmates who are looking at each other in search of an answer. Anyone know what that means, the teacher says? Oh, I think, I'd better pay attention because there's a new word and I'll need to know it. Does anyone know what Negro means? Good question, I think. What does that mean? I continue to look around at my classmates to see if anyone is going to come up with the answer or even a guess. The teacher seems anxious. This word has weight. Kenneth Percy puts up his hand. The teacher invites him to speak. Yeah, Tessa, he says, as he points towards me at the back of the room. Everyone in the class turns to face me. I freeze, my mind goes blank, and all that is going on in my body is a low fizz like a misfiring electric circuit. As I now realize, my teacher tries to rescue me from something she herself sees as a slur, a word that is fine in a book, but not in person. Oh no, not Tessa, she says, to comfort me and all who might worry about what's in their midst. The other kids continue to stare at me. Doing her job as the class's moral compass, she thinks fast. No, no, Tessa's something else. The misfiring electric circuit spews shocks through my cheeks, my arms and my legs, which begin to shake. What are you, Tessa? What am I? I have no idea what she's asking. I feel as if I failed a major test. I should have been paying attention. I should know how to answer this. You know, people are certain things, she says, still trying to help, but wounding me deeper and deeper with every second she allows the class's eyes to remain on me. Things like, say, Mexican. She waits, but I have nothing. Brazilian, Filipino. She carries on offering possibilities she sees in my face, but in that moment, I, I hear only words that describe all the things that everyone else in the room isn't. She waits, the circuit hums, and it becomes so unbearable that I fold my arms on the desk and put my head onto them. I go away deep inside myself. I don't remember where I go or for how long, but when I look up again, everyone in the class has gone to recess and the teacher is wiping the board. She doesn't try to speak to me as I get up from my desk and leave the room, heavier now, saddled with something corrosive. There with my head in my arms, I learned that I could disappear. I could be invisible. I wondered why the teacher had not asked anyone else in the class the question, why my best friend didn't have to answer it. I kept these questions and my invisibility to myself. I understood without being able to articulate it that language had the power to change me completely with the utterance of one word. I had known what black was, our extended family and friends were an array of shades, and I had known where I was from, but that wasn't what I had been asked. Negro was a word like species, a scientific word that clever people knew, but I didn't. I began to pay attention to the power of words. In being asked what I was and realizing I didn't know, I set off to find out. I believe it was the moment I became a writer. Thanks. Thank you, Tessa. Tessa, I'm actually, I'm so appreciative that you chose that as the excerpt to read for us because that's actually where I'd like to start our conversation with this, um, I think, really violent question of what are you? And in, in your own ways, all of you, Tessa, Andre, Catherine, I think you have confronted this question and confronted the very DNA of the question itself, the history and the process of that question. And it's such a remarkable question. I always think indicts the gaze. It speaks more to the person asking that question of what are you than it speaks to who is being posed the question to. I know it's all I got asked when my family first moved from Guyana to the United States and what always tore at me, and you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too, was the what, the what in the question, just sort yeah. of the objectification of the what, the choice of the what over the who. And Tessa, you circle back to the difference between what are you and who are yeah. you in the last pages of your book. And so 
I wanted to ask you all, you know, the what is so objectifying, the who at least gives a sense of there's dignity. There's a sense of dignity in that question. What is your relationship to both of these questions? What are you and who are you? And how have you engaged and navigated that question in, in your work? We can start with anyone. Well, I can I can start just because it is my question. <laughs> it is the question that I start the book with. Um, and it's, you know, like you said, um, Grace, it's a quite quite a violent question. And it's quite a, um, uh, a for an eight year old, certainly a question that is incomprehensible because then you don't know what the person is asking, you know, when they ask what, because what is is um, material. It's, you know, it's not about the personhood. It's not where are you from? It's not about place. It's about um, the composition of of the, a person, and it's and it's uh, it's such a ridiculous question to ask. Even if that's not how they mean it, it ends up being um, feeling like a, an affront. And so, I for me, I've navigated it since that moment, um, trying to actually answer that question. You know, what is what what does it mean to be a what or a who or a um, or a where from? You know, and what are the differences? And so, for me, that's a, it's a really it's an important violent question because I think it, it helps me to break down race and it helps me to understand race as a construct in the in terms of those questions, but also to know what you well, like what you said is, is that it says more about the ask the, the person asking the question than it does about the person having to answer it. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. And I think um, particularly the objectification of the individual. But I was also thinking of the way in which we tend to um, be very regimental and rigid in our categorization of just this question of the who. Um, uh, and um, I think that's what I aim to kind of trouble in the undiscovered country. For instance, you know, when we talk about what is the difference between the critic and the artist? Um, who is a global citizen? What is a Trinidadian versus what is an American? You know, I think that is what um, the world is kind of grappling with right now. This kind of inability to come to terms with the complexity uh, of individualism. Yes, we've we've focused a lot on society uh, being very much centered around this I, this individual who's working in this enterprising kind of way to just produce something or see about some sort of outcome. But um, we've had trouble embracing that idea that we're not just one thing. We're a combination of things. Um, we're not just one story. Um, history remains this kind of unfolding uh, um, catastrophe, you know. Um, so I think that is, it is definitely a pertinent question right now to be asking. I think Catherine's muted. Yes, hi, okay. Um, I love all your language that you'll have used and I love that phrase that you started with, Grace, to indict the gaze of the person asking. I feel like, um, that is a way to describe what I think I was trying to do in the book and to um, and you know also there's this through line between all of our books um, in my book I think the first time I was asked what are you is really when I went to the U.S. for school and um, and I think my response to that within that context of being like a late teenager not an adult at all um, was to actually try and answer and this book as an answer, which is I, what I am is a circumstance of the society that we're all participating in and cannot be separated. So it's an indictment in a certain sense, that answer of what. It cannot refer to me as a person and can only refer to us as a society or a community or, you know, a series of strangers who happen to be in the same place. Um, that question of who and where are you from, like those are that question of who is like a much deeper question um, and is actually something that I really don't think is inside of my book because it's so much about what other people see and so much about me um, kind of 
working through what of other people's gazes I've internalized and what I need to disentangle myself from. Um, I think, I think like, you know, what Andrea, the phrase you just used about like coming to terms with complexity, I think like in all of our books that I like, I'm really happy to have been able to read all, most of your, both of your books and to think about them like is, and this is something that I think the Caribbean um, like provides or I think I like, sometimes in the US I think like the, the Caribbean or being West Indian is like the future of America um, like but we've been there so many so long ago and also are right here um, so it does this weird thing to like stay some time anyway but um, like I think we've t I've taken this kind of like anti-categorical <clears throat> as Andre is saying approach to these questions and also asking you know what are different categories that can help us to come to terms with the complexity that we're in as you know you said the unfolding history of catastrophe right like yeah and where can we get better questions better categories um things that can actually help us discern and work through the place that we're in um and yeah that's i think that's where i come yeah, and and just to follow on from that, I, I really liked what Andre said about the, the the complexity as well, because you know the question what and the need to answer that question um, requires certainty, and I think we don't have certainty, and we shouldn't have certainty. I think there's something about the place we're in at the moment. Um, you know, there's a, a phrase going around uh, about um, radical uncertainty. You know, to be able to embrace. The, the uncertainty of the times and still have hope, you know, still not, not, put, not put it in any kind of disaster uh, um, uh, category or any um, other kind of racial, gender, country, uh, not nation categories, but to embrace the fact that we are at an uncertain moment and that is something with possibilities. And I think it, in, in the, the, the what question doesn't actually offer much in terms of possibility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Catherine, you were talking about place and I, I want to actually talk about that too a little bit now. Andre, you have this beautiful line in the undiscovered country. Well, all the lines are beautiful, so I'll say beautiful line a lot. Um, you have this line in the undiscovered country where you say the book is a history of myself. And I think that applies to all of your books as well. It's the history of yourself. And I'd love for you, Andre, to also talk a little bit about that framing, the history of myself. And as you all explore both country and self, countries and self, and especially you, Andre, via this artistic legacy, both the literary artistic, his, literary legacy and the visual art history of Trinidad and the Caribbean and other places. I kept thinking about Chimamanda Adichie's lecture, The Danger of a Single Story, of how, you know, we easily can slip into these single narratives of a place. And by we, I don't mean you necessarily we here gathered, but just the general abstract we. And so my question is, as you all were writing about place, were you thinking, did you have in mind those dangerous single stories about the places that you were confronting and investigating? And were you at any point writing back or confronting those single stories, dangerous or, or not? So I, I found, um, you know, when I was uh, putting together all of these essays, I found myself very interested in taking a journey, moving from art to politics. Um, but in that process, I also found myself grappling with the fact that art criticism and, and criticism itself is a form of confession. You know, um, Margaret Atwood, I think she has this line in a, one of her essays on Kafka where she says, you know, she was writing this essay about Kafka and she realized she was actually writing about herself. You know, I mean, it seems a, a very counterintuitive kind of thing to think of, um, you know, an essay which is focused on a very specific subject matter uh, and, and sometimes very intensely so, actually ultimately being about its author. But um, that dynamic, that vein became very apparent to me. And so I sought to kind of to mind that because 
even when we seek to perhaps avoid the autobiographical or the personal details of our life, it tends to ha to find a way to kind of you know erupt in the choice of subject matter that we make. For instance, when we choose, well, oh, I'm going to write an essay about this. So, um, and so I think uh, in terms of you know addressing that history of myself, you know, I mean, I kind of realized that it was almost as though this is the closest I might become, might might come to writing an autobiography <laughs> because, you know, I start off some essays talking about some painting or something and then it's like, oh, it's me when I went, <laughs> went camping, you know, years ago or um, so on and so forth. But I thought that that was actually pertinent because I think um, that notion of one form of self-examination, the examined life, uh, becoming a portal uh, from different realms, I, I was really drawn to that and I thought that that was alluring. And I thought that, um, just to tie in this, this the, the theme of today's discussion, I thought that certainly um, it was relevant because the personal is always political. Um, you know, even when uh, we think we're dealing with something very banal and very ordinary and very, very everyday, you know, um, it ultimately has all of these very subtle inflections and connotations. I mean, as Tessa's, what she just read, uh, uh, demonstrated that, you know, I mean, an, uh, an ordinary, what should be, you know, you're going to class and you're going to school and you're having your childhood and then suddenly there comes the politics, you know? So I kind of was kind of drawn to that, um, idea of, of, of linking the politics of the moment as well to hist a history of myself, yes, but I guess I use the word history there to also bring a, a wider kind of scope to it in the sense that again, just as you know, everything is political, um, the contemporary moment is very much tied to what has come before. So I think those were the kind of veins I was trying to, um, to mine. Catherine? Yeah, um, I, I, I'm, I, I love, uh, I, I'm like quoting back you to you, but the criticism as a form of confession is something that I want to think about. Um, and I think this is a question is about like single narratives. I think that if there's um, an argument or an argument or a thesis in my book, it's that we're all connected to each other. Um, we cannot of course, there's like varying degrees of discernment and um, and difference, of course, but we are all connected to and affecting each other in this kind of, you know, like quantum physics, butterfly effect away. Like everything has an effect and we are all experiencing the effects of each other's actions all of the time. Um, and, you know, I think within that, what I've really appreciated in relation to my book, which I, I think is best described as an autoethnography, which is something that my mother really laughs at because she's like, what are you doing over there? What are you doing? Um, but what I really appreciate it is, you know, people writing back to me and beginning to, to talk about their own lives and their own experiences. And someone wrote me uh, a really beautiful letter, um, which was both about and not about my book. It was about him. Um, and he was, you know, I think what he took was, I think it's a roomy quote, you know, we, you are the ocean in one drop. Um, and so much of my book is thinking about the ocean and water and these currents that connect us. But, you know, I do think of the book as like, it, it's about me. Um, the gaze is really narrowed or kind of, you know, like a snake looking, snake eating its own tail, you know, rivers kind of thing um, at me. But it's mostly, I think, a lens through which someone else can look at themselves like that is the most I hope for and I have hoped for in writing this and I think um, I think like thinking about like um, these like ideas of criticism ever being objective is a laughable one um, but I think where also the uh, like pressure point is in this book is that with people who don't want to look at themselves as a result of reading writing um, and kind of continue to 
like remain separate, which hasn't really happened in conversations I've had about my book. But I always think that's like a really interesting thing to happen where someone then approaches your writing with that question of, well, again, what are you? What is this? How can I analyze this as if it's totally separate to me? And that is, you know, as Andrea and Tessa, as we're like, as we're all saying, you know, much more indicative of them. And that's like the point that I want to say is impossible to look at. And I hope um, in the way that I've written it, like produced something that is really hard to uh, like to dissect in that manner, which explains its form. It's really moving between a lot of forms, switching between a lot of modes quite rapidly, um, kind of, um, which has an effect on everyone. But to say, you know, this is how you read this is a product of where you're coming from and your reaction to it is not separate from me. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, Grace, I just want to get back to the question you had about place, because I think and the place and the history of the self, as well as the um, personal is always political, are really tied. Because one of the things that happened with me in, in having to examine place, the three places where the where I'm from or am or find myself, um, you know, the, the Caribbean, Guyana, but the, the Caribbean and and Canada and the UK at the moment, I've in terms of writing back to those places in the in the research that I did and in terms of the writing back into complicating it and to and to making sure that there wasn't a single story about those places because there's a certain romanticism associated with each of those places actually and and I think that what I discovered in the writing was such violence that took place in those places that still takes place in those places a kind of so that place and violence became um, kind of a way for me to write back to complicate um, the idea of, of what, um, you know, what my ancestors might have gone through, you know, to try and imagine the indentured um, uh, laborer on a, on a ship for 112 days, you know, to, to really kind of um, dig down into the complications of place and what makes a place and what makes a culture, you know, in terms of um, Canada and, and being settler colonial, um, uh, a part of that, a part of that um, culture rather than coming from indig an indigenous um, background there, you know, what kind of violence are we taking part in when we live in places and that we need to really um, unpack that a lot in order to, well, for me, in order to live uh, in a healthy way, actually, so, so to really and, and responsibly. So I think it's an interesting thing to unpack the, the history of a place and why it is, you know, what it is. Andre, I got a sense that maybe you wanted to also chime in on that last part. Yeah, no, because I was uh, I was agreeing and I, I just reminded me of uh, you were also asking about um, in terms of literary history, but I mean, what, what Tessa was just mentioning about writing back and, and answering, you know, responding to things, you know, I do, uh, one of the things I was concerned with in the book as well was um, uh, addressing, you know, key literary figures uh, in the region from uh, V.S. Naipaul, you know, uh, to even someone as uh, as, uh, as old as Jean-Michel Casabon, one of our, um, indigenous, uh, well, the Trinidad and Tobago's first international painter, you know, and, and examining how uh, the lens with which we approach their work, you know, um, changes depending on our politics and how there's a lot that we have to say still um, about that. And I think that is generally true when it comes to, in terms of engaging with literary history, uh, a lot of the things that uh, writers do, you know, that's the job of a writer, I guess, to some extent. Um, it's just to, to, to answer back, you know, so it is, it is, uh, yes, there's, yes, self-expression, and of course, you know, there are different modes of writing, but I think uh, you can't help but get that element in there sometimes, even in the confession. Each of you, um, I want to talk about silence for, um, each of you address the historical silences that have haunted our histories, our families, our intimate relationships, our countries. And I was struck, Catherine, by your words of how in the course of asking questions to first make what was supposed to be a film, which then turned into this wonderful project of color, that you write, quote, 
the silence has actually grown within my family. And so in a, in a, it seems as if in addressing the historical silences that perhaps they're contemporary silences that were also created. And so I wanted to throw that out there. How have you uh, reconciled these two things and in trying to write about the historical silences? that there's this, um, this other path where we might also create new silences as well. And Catherine, I'll, I'll start with, with yeah. you. Um, that's, a, that's a great way to ask that question. Um, you know, I think, I, think, I think I have to start with like how, I think open and willing I was to engage with other people and with various levels of violence and microaggression in terms of my identity and other people's like I was like yes and where is this coming from like really kind of not being defensive and being like yes and um and so in that process when I see um and this is maybe from like a temperament as a child of being like a curious person to an extent and being like well if someone else said it it, it must be true and I'm going to just like accept it um, and you know living with a lot of contradiction which is part of being from the Caribbean and part of being a person um, but also you know not thinking that um, to some extent and uh, that there's like absolute right and wrong okay I'm, I sound really weird of course there's absolute right and wrong but I, I think uh, I'm saying something about empathy and I think wanting to believe that everyone has a reason for feeling and thinking in the ways that they do. And I think being, giving honestly, um, really terrible behavior, a lot of room, um, because I see like a, a level of suffering um, that undergoes everything. And I think within my family and in the process of writing this, you know, what I encountered where, and on all sides where mixed from as far back as I can find. Um, you know, it's, you know, there's not like, and the, my mother's father's family from Ghana is like the most stable part of my family, the lineage I can find and trace. They've lived um, in the same places in Kumani for, in Kumasi for hundreds of years. Um, and that was this really uh, strong counterpoint. Um, to like trying to figure out a family history that has been in the Caribbean for a really long time and to know, you know, this could be marked differently or we, it might be possible to find, you know, records of my family that aren't through slave records or through land records or et cetera. Um, and so in that process of, of, um, of doing research, what I find is that some certain people, um, and I'm not making judgment on this, you know, don't want to interrogate any further um, or don't want to question a stereotypical behavior, like a certain amount of racism, believing, you know, like various kinds of things that you just say as, like, you know, they're like, that's just a joke. And I'm like, it's not really a joke, is it? Like, you actually, like, this is actually not a joke. Like, it's not just like a, a funny thing that you say so often like this has repercussions even if you don't think it's in this house um you know or like on the street or like right here um uh, you get i get to a point with certain people where they're like i'm really i don't want to think about this i don't want to talk about this i don't want to change and the silence that has grown is me being like well i have to and i i can't i can't live like this i can't um accept this level of of honestly grief um an unquestioned history of violence living under like you know these really complicated and entangled histories of of the plantation and its legacies without talking about them and being open about like here i am and I, we're trying to figure out how to be different and you know i and I, I for various reasons some of which are you know the worst kinds but often not because people are just trying to live people are just trying to live <laughs> Um, and I'm not talking about being like blatantly racist or like, I don't know, or white supremacist in any way. I mean, these like subtler forms of um, hierarchy, uh, you know, 
silences have grown in certain sense, but it's more so my my unwillingness to engage in certain kinds of conversation, um, just very different than when I was younger. Um, yeah, if that makes sense. I went a full circle. I think I, I was thinking too, as well, of uh, silence is such a multifaceted thing in the sense that on the one hand, silence is necessary for that space for contemplation. And when we think of the arts, um, you know, a poet w once said that the silence at the beginning of a poem must be different from the silence by the time the poem is done. Um, and I thought, oh, that was actually a wonderful way to think of what art does. Uh, and um, so I guess you could think of silence in a positive sense, but I think certainly um, there's a, a sense of violence as well, where silence is violence um, in that it becomes uh, self-censorship or erasure, you know, sometimes willful, sometimes inadvertent. Um, and I think certainly in the Trinidad and Tobago context, um, and I'm, I have no doubt in the global context as well that there are many aspects of our society that are, we tend to kind of ignore and sweep under the rug. You know, it starts with it, basic things like race, race relations here. Here in Trinidad and Tobago, we've had recently a lot of debate over, you know, the sparring between two main ethnic groups, people of East Indian descent and people of African descent, and there's a lot of mixing up of politics and there's a lot of drama there um, and in Guyana as well of course um, and um, and sometimes it's weird because before 2020 there was a debate as to whether or not is race still relevant um, is race still relevant to our politics you know it was actually being asked and anyone who who spoke about race you know was kind of hushed down it's like no we're not a racist people no we're not we don't that's not how we we roll and then 2020 has happened and I think there's no one who can deny now that race, uh, if, if there's a silver lining from all of this, there's no one who, who can deny that race is relevant. Um, but that's just an example of one form of, of everyday silence and censorship. And I'm thinking also as well, tying back to what I was reading about LGBTQ rights uh, in the Caribbean, you know, that's just Generally, though, within, I guess, gay or queer culture, this idea of don't ask, don't tell, or um, this idea of being in the closet, where there's a, a kind of a, a, a silence of a form in terms of self-representation that is often very much um, part of or a manifestation of homophobia uh, or living within a, an oppressive homophobic um, society. And so I think definitely there are ways in which this insidious thing, this silence can be both manifested and enforced uh, and can it, it can actually be illustrative of systems of power uh, in which the individual is kind of like left entrapped, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really agree with um, everything that you've both said, but and what you said, Andre, about the two, for me there, when, when um, Grace asked the question, there are two kinds of silences. There's a kind of imposed silence. There's the erasure. There's the, there's the silencing by, by powers, as you're talking about. But then there's also a kind of chosen silence, which is the secret. You know, the secret is also a very powerful, um, potentially violent to others um, uh, uh, thing that that I think, you know, one of the things I deal with in, in my book is um, the the is, is a kind of my, my psych psychoanalysis that, that I went through that that had at its heart the kind of unraveling, not of a secret, but of unspoken grief, you know, unspoken grief in my family created stories that weren't necessarily um, or that weren't necessary, you know, they kind of it 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 made me it brought me to a sense of myself that that um, that wasn't empowered and so that you know secrets and secrets and erasure can have a similar kind of um, uh, working on the on an individual you know the the erasure of those ancestors and the women you know I can't follow I can't trace the 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 line of those women um, that are my ancestors that I try to trace so I try to bring them out of the shadows. 
Um, and yet there are shadows that we deal with individual as individuals in our own psyches that are also working against um, the, the, the way we are in the world. And to enter into your book, Tessa, with those five voices was particularly, um, I think, a beautiful way of writing back to mm -hmm. the silence. And there, there's, a, there's short, very short um, pieces on and just fit so beautifully on the page. And I really appreciated that. Um, they're telling us that we have exactly seven minutes left. Can you believe that? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, um, I have, I'll, I'll shift to my last question. Um, seven minutes. Okay, seven minutes, you are. Um, <laughs> then there'll be silence. Yes. Be silence. <laughs> um, because this is actually, this is the question that I was really looking, I was looking forward to all of them, but I'm really looking forward to this one. That's why I saved it for last. Um, Andre, you write in the last page, in your essay, the last page, you write this and about, well, I think the acts of reading and writing. Quote, when we close that book, what has happened to us? Do we see the world around us afresh, as if born again? or has something in the world changed? And obviously, since the time that you all have drafted and written and published uh, these books, the world has indeed been turned upside down and the, the world is literally on fire. And I don't mean that as hyperbole. I'm thinking of Catherine in California and what we're seeing with the fires. Of course, we're all dealing simultaneously with a pandemic and a fight for black lives. And we're adding environmental catastrophes to that. And so I wonder if you've had time to reflect uh, on your own personal relationship to these books and your own reading of them and how that has shifted as the world indeed has shifted from the time that they were written to this moment now um, we're here and I really appreciated before we came for our audience before we all went live with you all we were checking in on each other about what's going on in Trinidad and London and California and New York because they're all disparate situations but there's this common thread of urgency and trauma and um, disaster and so if you can reflect on your relationship to how you feel about these books when so much has changed from the beginning of the year to now. And Tessa, I'll start with you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think, well, my book ends with fires. <laughs> with the book ends with, um, you know, fires in, in Ontario that were burning as I was, as I was um, writing. Um, and, you know, this, this smell of smoke being um, a question that I asked myself, is this what the world will smell like now? You know, because it just, and, and it does end with a, a, a very personal urgency of, oh my God, we have to do something. It's no, there's no longer just this kind of literary um, um, leisure to, to, to think about these questions. We have to, you know, get on the street. And, and so I'm quite happy that we're on the street and that we are um, at this this particular point. And but as as personally, I find that my book feels quite <coughs> even even more relevant than when I than I read it than I when I wrote it rather. But as a personal um, uh, journey, it, you know, you think that you write a memoir and that you sort of put issues to bed. But I think what you do is you just bring them into the living room, and, you know, so they're they're there all the time rather than just you know over there. So um, yes. That's that's my answer. <laughs> yeah, I um, my book was published technically in June around my birthday um, because I'm working with really small press and you know with an editor is one of my closest friends um, and it you know I I wrote it up until the, and edited it up until the time it went through um, and I'm I'm really grateful that that what that is my part of my writing process and it reflects the kind of hybrid nature of the book. But, you know, I sent off the, it's a print um, at the beginning of the pandemic um, and was kind of writing through um, the beginning of that and these feelings of uh, encroaching disaster and also like just a lot of questions and uncertainty and in, in, you know, talking about uncertainty. How do we deal with 
the uncertainty of what is happening and what is going to happen was really a question that I ended with for myself um, and it's throughout the book. I also feel like it's more relevant than before, but, um, but it's also, I think about my writing practice as, um, sometimes I think of it as a performance practice because I, I, I write in these bursts, um, kind of reacting to various circumstances and you know, um, the books that book starts with wanting to make a film um, in Trinidad, which I have footage of. And I was also in London at the so it was 2011, um, where protests there were protests about the the police murder of Mark Duggan, um, and that was the circumstance in which I actually began to write and to think and kind of thinking about what is my place within protests. What does it mean to be in the U.S. You know, talking about race and people being like, I leave that over there. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. Um, and then coming full circle to here where, you know, as you know, saying, it, you know, it's not an American thing. It's not a thing that, you know, the Caribbean has figured out and we don't live in this post-racial utopia. Although, of course, like certainly so much is better and different <laughs> um, than things here and so I feel like I'm still in the process of writing I'm still writing that book um, but it's the book that I wrote is so much about being in isolation and figuring out who to trust and who to talk to who do I want to be in community and collaboration with and I think right now I'm in this place where I'm actually in community and collaboration with people and writing new things and working in more experimental and more hybrid forms with multiple authors and kind of thinking about these questions, about what categories, et cetera. I'm done. <laughs> I think uh, I was thinking, you know, when I wrote this book, you know, I was like, and the pandemic happened, I was like, oh my God, it's no longer going to be relevant. Everybody's concerned about this virus, you know? Um, and then everything happened and I realized it's still relevant. And I got my book and the first sentence is, the life we lead is no more than the fading reflection of an event beyond recall. And I thought, OK, not bad, Andre. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you I for. Think, yeah. No, I'm I was sorry, Andre, say, finally, go ahead. The world is an idea. And I think that's what we are all grappling with. We're all engaging right now with redefining the world uh, within our minds, within art and in real life. That's such a beautiful note to end on, Andre. Yeah. I want to thank you all for tapping in from all your various time zones to be here for this conversation. I really appreciate it. It's an absolute joy to be in conversation with you. It was such a gift to to get to dive into your work and, and spend time with each of your books. So thank you for putting that out into the world. And thank you for putting that out into the world at this very moment. I want to um, remind our audience that we, although we recorded this session prior, uh, please stay with us because we will be doing a live Q&A with you. So stay right here and uh, we will be back. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so it's a much. Pleasure. It was wonderful. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you everyone for joining us for our live Q&A with our authors. We are, remember you can send your questions to us on Facebook and on YouTube. And we have a question everyone from Shivani. And they're asking, do you find yourself reaching for memoirs, narratives and creative nonfiction of the pandemic? And what do you think we are collectively writing out of this deeply uncertain age. Tessa, want to take that? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not looking, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm, there are lots of around, you know, there are lots of newspaper um, articles, there are lots of things about people in lockdown. I wrote one about my lockdown, but I think what I'm, it's, it's a little too soon to, to understand what we're going through right now. And what I really want to hear is the stories of people um, who don't have that voice who don't have that access who don't have the platform to talk like we do here to talk about how it is for them and I think that for me is is probably 
what I would like to seek out. Um, and I, I have a project that does that. I have a, a, a project called City Life that, that has um, students working with uh, people, elders in the community that um, tell stories that, that normally wouldn't be told. So that's the kind of thing that I'm really interested in. Andre, yeah, I, 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 I agree. I think, you know, the story is still unfolding and that, that means you don't have necessarily that critical space, I think, to really um, to see the outline or the shape of where it's going to end. And none of us, we don't know where this is going to end up. You know, every day there's a new chapter, it seems. But interestingly, um, whilst this contemporary moment is happening, what it is revealing is the uh, presence of the past and how the past is alive and, and well. So I think actually um, the type of stories I'm gravitating to are the stories that bring uh, history into a sharper focus. Yeah, um, I think I have some really specific questions after finishing my book. And I think I'm thinking about, about like, how do we reframe history? And I think a question, um, there's a line in my, uh, like early in the conversation, um, there's a line that I read, which was, we have not lost the bloodline, but we made it. I'm reading um, a book by Shona Jackson called Creole Indigeneity, um, which is about like Creole or the category of Creole kind of replacing the indigenous inhabitants of the Caribbean. And how do we kind of grapple with um, indigeneity within the Caribbean and the kind of racial divisions that are moving. Um, I'm also, I think reading, uh, I'm like being very specific because I, I like see the questions that are coming out. Um, I'm reading a book called Reclaiming Dine History by Jennifer Nez Danette Dale. Um, again, thinking about um, who writes history or how do we kind of rec reclaim or rewrite or refocus uh, narratives from a colonial frame and thinking about the future. I think also just I'm really grappling with what it means for me not to be the only author and really looking to people who work collaboratively collab collaboratively and looking for examples of that yeah yeah i think you know i agree with you that it, that we're that because we're still in this thing it's hard to sort of process it because we're so deep in it but I, but what i've been turning to are essays that are um, sharing on how we grieve and what we do with the, with the grief of those that we're losing. And I was just sharing with you all um, earlier that New York, I'm sorry, United States reached this incredible statistic today where we've lost 200,000 people. So we've reached that benchmark. And there's a beautiful essay recently published in Vanity Fair by Jasmine Ward, who lost her husband. Uh, earlier in the summer. So I, those kinds of um, pieces that are really bringing us together in this collective grief. And I really admire folks that are taking their stories, their incredible heartbreaking stories and sharing with us to give us some sort of a blueprint on how we grapple with the grief and the loss. Um, that's what, what I'm yeah. reading. I think that's a, a yeah, really good point, Grace. And I think for me, I, I'm, it's it's the grief, but also I'm I'm you know what the pandemic has done um, has e exposed the scaffolding of how we live. You know, it's exposed the endoskeleton of how, of how we uh, our economies work. And so the other thing that I've become is very angry, and so I'm trying to find ways of um, you know channeling that anger through you know and balancing it with the grief you know and so so it, it, we've there are a lot of um, political articles coming out about just what should not be normal anymore and how normal was part of the problem and do we want to go back to normal Dion Brand wrote an, a fantastic article in the in the Toronto Star a couple of um, weeks ago about you know, how toxic normal was. And so this idea of getting back to normal is not what, not that kind of normal. That's not what we want. So um, yeah, I think that the channeling the anger is really important too. Just want to thank Courtney uh, Williams for her lovely comment. She's saying, I love the sincerity of these presentations and their immense intelligence and empathy for the human condition. Courtney, thank you for that comment. We have a question from Maya and it's 
just uh, directed to Andre, but I think it's uh, really for all of you. And so Maya is asking, Andre, you write a lot of aspirational stories or these glimpses of representation in your work. Do you consider yourself now um, in the role of a model or creator of representative work? tasked with a certain kind of responsibility? Is it freeing? Is it taxing? Is it intimidating? I'm guessing you might say all of the above. You all might say all of the above, but Andre, do you want to take that first? Yeah, sure. Um, I think um, role model, maybe not, because what what is a role model exactly? But I think, I certainly um, believe visibility is very important. So I guess, um, in terms of my own life and embracing that, and I write a lot about this um, in the book, um, uh, that's what um, I think is powerful. So it's not necessarily, it's perhaps a question of truth and just coming to terms with yourself. Um, and it's not necessarily done for um, uh, the external gaze. We were talking earlier uh, in the panel discussion about you know, the what versus who question. Um, but it's more uh, just acknowledging the fact that, you know, everybody in life, you go through a life and you think, my life is so, you know, whatever I'm experiencing, it's, it's only I'm experiencing it. But when you read uh, novels or stories or other people's nonfiction uh, memoirs, you realize, no, you're not alone. You know, there are other people going through the same thing. And so for me, that is just a a really strong reminder of the importance of speaking up and speaking out uh, and, and being visible and being seen because it, it just helps everyone to just recognize, you know, each other in each other. Um, I, yes, that question was directly for Andre, but I think Yes, and um, if there's anything that I aspire or, or um, think about in relation to being a role model, it's of having integrity and living with it. Otherwise, I think just trying to be a good comrade or a good collaborator, just to like be accountable to the people around me. Um, and yeah, um, that's all. Yeah, I agree, obviously, with um, both Andre and, and um, Catherine. I think, it, I think because, it, because of a memoir is not um, that e easy to write. I mean, it's a lot to sort of have your life out there for the world. I think just the, the if, if there's any kind of modeling to go on, it's that it's um, a wonderful thing to share your story, you know, and I, I, I you know, if I could, if I could say to everyone, you need to write um, your a, a life a life story of some kind, um, I, I you know I think that is really important. We need stories. We need the stories of all of those people that um, uh, aren't d d like as I was saying before, don't necessarily have the channels to um, or haven't been previously uh, pushed forward for that. So don't necessarily have that voice um, or don't have the place to use their voice. So I would say yes write about yourself, tell us your story. I guess I also say, yeah, and we need the stories to grieve. We're talking about grief, but we really need everyone's story to grieve. And I don't think, um, I don't think it can be like overstated, like what writing a story of yourself does to you. Like it, it has changed me. And I think, you know, when I encourage or, or encourage other people to do that, it's, to, to go through the transformation of having like told the truth and allowing yourself to feel all of the things and writing memoirs, writing memoir, writing in general, talking to people, actually telling the truth is a very hard thing to do with something that does that. And I, you know, I'm so just adding on to what I've been saying. And Catherine, as we talked earlier in our conversation, your book is an art object in itself. It's so beautifully made and created. And Nicholas had a question for you. And he asks, the visual elements are such an important part of your book. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like to create a book like this, where the images are as crucial as the text? Um, 
beautiful phrasing of the question. Um, I, I think it was made with great difficulty. <laughs> and um, one, because I, I think, you know, just literally printing the book was more expensive than we wanted. Um, uh, just the logistics of it were, were challenging. And I had eventually um, to talk in a really logistical way, like two editors, one who I mentioned was a really close friend of mine and one who I consider a friend now, my editor, and they did very different things because we were operating on uh, like in these different levels of thinking about the design and actually thinking about the narrative of of um, the many different parts of the story that were involved. I worked on it um, while I was in an MFA program um, and was also between um, so between disciplines or between departments. I was in the visual arts department and I was in the literature department. And what I think that did and that maybe helped me with the book was realize a certain amount of bureaucratic stress that's involved in um, being across things and to stop caring about it a little bit and to just kind of go through the hoops that needed to be gone through in order to do the thing and to have your eye on what the, the vision was. I had a wonderful experience in grad school just saying that also. Um, <clears throat> but I think um, when, and this is like not just for that book, but like when working between in ways that kind of seem opposed. Um, and in this case, it was really like, uh, yeah, in ways that seem opposed. And a lot of working with the images seemed in opposition to writing, because there were certain things that I needed to draw it as a narrative and certain things that were really important to hold back on or to approach from a way of silence. Uh, the really important thing was to keep really clear the idea and vision I had of the book, because I had a really distinct vision and idea of the book, um, which took a lot to get there because it was really hard for me to explain in rational terms what I want it to look like, but it looks exactly like how I imagined it to look two years ago. And I'm grateful for that. So thank you, everyone. Okay, yeah. And we're <laughs> grateful for it. Uh, Tessa, we have a question coming in for you from Sarone, and she's asking, is racism because nobody knows the true history. I guess I can say, it, does racism exist because nobody knows the true history? And she writes, there's so much silence and so much inner and outer anger. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. You know, we don't understand. I think, you know, um, we need to bring history into our relationships all the time. And if we understand where we're from and, you know, how we got where we are, the history of the transatlantic slave trade, the history of colonialism, then, you know, we don't, I think, quick as quickly, um, uh, we don't as quickly create others in the same way. But I think we, we power um, and those kinds of uh, racism creates race, I guess is what I'm trying to say, you know, power and, um, and the, that, that greed that is represented in, in um, racism is the thing that creates the othering and the, and the hatred. And so I do think that history and understanding where, why we're all here and where we're from is a really important aspect. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that because I mean, I'm just thinking of Tessa, I think you say um, there's a border in making a violence. There's a yeah. violence in making a, a border. And I just think race, race is an invention. You know, I mean, it, it seems so counterintuitive for some people to say that race is this invented thing, but then actually uh, that's what we're dealing with now, isn't it? And um, I think, um, one of the things I've been trying to explore, uh, particularly in my essays, is how, um, as human beings, we cross so many uh, 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 variables and, and, and boundaries, um, and, and race is one of them. And that has become so fraught with all of these political associations now. And we're, we're, we were talking earlier today about um, the politics of places like Guyana, where, you know, and to some extent Trinidad, where there's this tension and we're seeing now in, in Guyana, there's this, um, this violence uh, that's accompanying that whole strange, that whole process um, of politics. And 
I think we tend to undervalue or discount just how live um, a lot of these issues are and how this history has come back to us. And I think in my uh, essay collection, I was trying to, um, to straddle all of these different uh, worlds and these different ideas from dealing with history to dealing with art, dealing with cultural studies, food, doubles. Um, and I actually, you know, I, I kind of identified a lot with what Catherine was saying in terms of getting it visually correct. Um, you know, not correct, but, you know, get, getting my vision of what I wanted the book to actually look like, you know, because I, um, I think one of my, one of the writers I've been reading recently is Rachel Cuss. And uh, she's a novelist, but she also writes essays and she has a, a essay collection, I think it's called Coventry. And she has a great essay called Coventry, but Rachel Cusk recently said, the essay is the blankest of blank pages. And I mean, that really for me kind of embodied how I attacked the essay in this essay collection, how I, I kind of viewed the essay as this canvas on which I could bring all of it, politics, art, history, into this kind of hybrid kind of form, you know? And I thought, you know, this, this would be useful because the essay seems to be so accommodating as a medium. We have time for one last question coming in. And our Dean is asking, what happens when there is a shift in your personal politics? Have you considered how this could or should affect your work? And Tessa, we'll start with you. Um, I th as I think I understand the question, a shift in, in my um, politics means um, becoming maybe possibly more of an activist in, in, um, in the areas that I deal with. One, you know, one of them um, is Black Lives Matter, but also um, the in environment, and I'm a member of um, Extinction Rebellion. So I think what happens is that well, my, the shift has become, I've become much, much more angry, much more um, active. And it's an important thing because it feels like I'm waking up to things that I should have been angry and active about a long, long time ago in my 20s. But I was so, sort of dumbfounded and thought that the world was progressing and perhaps it hasn't. I think the shift that I, so um, the, yes I think that a, a change in your politics absolutely necessitates a change in your work um, and it definitely does seem that for me I think personally um, I think personally it's actually less a change in politics and more the integration of all of the feelings that I feel all of the time um, being able to to be with a tremendous amount of grief and depression alongside anger and the ability to like to be happy sometimes because that's not the type of child that I was um, really one feeling at a time and I think you know I think I'm kind of hinting at this but I, I feel really strongly about like the the importance and power of telling the truth um, I we're almost at time and I also think that question we just asked about, it was just asked about like, um, is there racism because people don't know their history? Like, I think I'm trying to change my practice to live in a world where people can bear the weight of knowing the history. And there's de definite changes I have to do um, incredibly allied to people who are mad and ill and the kind of illness that comes from not being able to behold yourself or to to hold the great depth of what's happening. So that those changes are coming and I feel it, yeah. I think it's, it's only natural to change. We're always changing. And in fact, the problem is sometimes we expect people not to change. We expect people to stay in this monolithic, you know, we're a little too simplistic, you know? And um, in fact, one of the essays in my book is an essay. I write an essay about writing an essay in which I get everything wrong. And um, I come back years later and I've, you know, I reassess the previous essay and I say, no, this was wrong and this is right. Because I think it's only natural um, to have this kind of evolution of thought over time. I mean, hopefully, I mean, <laughs> that's what we're doing as we live. We're, we're always learning and we're constantly reassessing things. And I think sometimes, particularly in the political arena, people, people view that as a weakness. You know, they say, oh, this person, what are you 
uh, you know, are you flaky or are you inconsistent? But I think it is a strength to be able to, to look back and say, oh, you know, I thought this in back in those years, but now I think this, and this is why, you know, uh, and there's to, to talk about what Catherine was just talking about. There's a truth to that. I want to thank you all and especially thank our folks on Facebook and YouTube for these really wonderful, thoughtful, complicated, nuanced questions. And we've reached the end of our conversation. Thank you so much, Tessa, Andre, and Catherine. Wishing you all a lovely, good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Oh, Mr. Fiddler, oh, ha, hi. This country so colorful and truly diverse. We're doing our best to put TNT first. You success through advancement, we encourage. We're proudly supporting the rich cultural heritage, promoting development in the sporting arena, and empowering women for equality of gender. We're sustaining the environment and strengthening the society. First citizens helping paint a brighter TNT. Drag your bow, Mr. Fiddler. I am an actor and poet for over 12 years, and I have no title for my piece at this time, but it was inspired by just observing how people treat with each other in the poetry slam over past years and how they deal with each other in real life, some activists in particular. And my thing is sometimes, you know, we look at everybody except ourselves. So sometimes it's good to just mind your business, sip your tea, smile and wave. Yeah, thank you. Mirror, mirror on the wall. What happens to angels when they fall? Are they still active? It's hard to tell if they're still active. Hard to tell if they're still active. Hard to tell if they're still activists. Sad. But as bad as it might sound, I need to speak to Lucifer. Because who better to shed some light? Than the first activist to fight for their beliefs despite popular contention. Attention. Cause like some activist brain soft like scotch bright just good enough to scrub off what's wrong if that right might be more convenient to them does your activism condemn asking for a friend because then that could never be activism and i condemn that kind of activism some of them sit down right next to you some activists are arsonists and they will drag your name through the fire just to get a spark amidst the populace. And it's sad because they're confused. Just try to have a heart now. Or try to take a class from Confucius. I mean, I doubt that you might pass, but uh, excuse the little faux pas. But how you does kiss your wife with a mouthful of sulfur? How you go burn your own brother? As a fire breeder myself, I wonder if you know the taste of pitch oil. The comfort you get from every puncture, you casually sever and dissect, my friend, just stop. You're not a doctor. Activists should be more like sculptures, but the culture is being ruptured by these vultures. They peck at everything and barely nothing. I'm surprised they don't have ulcers. That kind of activism needs to be sepulchred.
the structures in place should evolve or just put proctors in place to resolve or simply dissolve the disparities amongst us. The youngsters are pleading, but we are the monsters. Edit. I used to think that there were angels walking amongst us. Some things I hear might make you cringe. Activists singe their septums on a cocaine binge. How you go administer activism through a syringe? You unhinge, you need orange and lime and punch in to kill that kind of activism before it spread. Don't let it get to your head. Activists like headless chickens trying to keep their head on so it's a set of foul play. But as fouls play, you're waiting, baiting for a soup, watching face and race related toots. These kind of politics have me wondering if it's only chickens have a coup. Sorry, some activists are allergic to the truth. But the sins of the fathers will always fall on the sons, no matter who you shine your light through. And as bright as you feel your bright, well, Lucifer was bright too. And I know how much you like to preach peace and play priest, but I would like to remind you that even angels get impeached. So just remember, look through the seat, remove your feet, you'd understand that this rebel... No matter how bad things get, we'll never stoop to their level. Because it was always the drop that made Lucifer the devil. What you doing, Boki? What you doing? I am getting ready to watch the NGC Bocas Lit Fest. So you give up on trying to find it in person? Yeah. Mm. But it's not so bad. I can watch it from home. And I don't even have to wear pants. <laughs> don't tell anybody. Uh, um, um, Boki. Hmm? Where are you watching it? I can watch it too. Sure. Look, uh, go on the website. It's bookaslitfest.com or on their Facebook or on their YouTube. Ooh. Hey, look, look, I'll find it. I'll find it. Uh, okay, okay, okay. All right. Bye. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Boki, 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 boki. What to watch first? What do you care? You keep saying you're not interested in books. Books does cause trouble. You know, that's actually true. It's true that I even know. You know, some of the biggest revolutions in history was inspired by books. <laughs> <laughs> you lie, you lie. I can't see no revolutionary running around with, with what a gun in one hand and a book in the other. <laughs> Wrong. Che Guevara, he wrote a book. Guess what it was called? Hmm, how to destroy capitalism and free the Caribbean and Latin America? Uh, close. Guerrilla warfare. Gorillas. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, even I know he was from South America, right? Gorillas from Africa. Not so? It's not that kind of gorilla. It's guerrilla, if you want to say it right. Whatever, whatever, whatever. And you ever hear about Simone de Beauvoir? Who's that? She was a French writer and her book, The Second Sex, practically started what they call second wave feminism. First gorilla, no wave. We in the sea now? <laughs> Not that kind of wave. Rona, look, I could go and watch my book us now, please. Okay, all right. Jeez, go your way. Hmm. Uh, Boki, Boki, Boki. Yes, Rona. I'll find the website. Great. Hmm. What to watch? Just watch whatever they have on. They have readings and discussions. Ooh, this one look good. Back to the future. 
four of the Caribbean's best speculative fiction writers discuss how the genre helps us imagine alternatives for the future. Featuring Karen Lord, Tobias S. Buckel, Nalo Hopkinson, I hear about she, and Malka Older. Who is all them people? It have Caribbean speculative fiction. What is that, by the way? Science fiction and fantasy. You really should read more books, Rona. Come now, man. Need our time for that, you know, books. Yeah. Okay, then. Well, enjoy your book, us. Uh, a bookie, bookie, bookie. Well, well, one more thing, one more thing. Yes, Rona. I have a joke for you. What did the book say to the book world? I don't know. What did the book say to the bookworm? <laughs> Ouch! Get it? Ouch! <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye! Down there is a dismal little valley on a dismal little island. Notice the hills, how one of them carries on its face a scar, a section where bulldozers and tractors have sunk their rusty talons into its cheeks, scraped away the brush and the trees, and left behind a white crater of marle. The eyesore can be seen from ten or more miles away. To the people who live in this valley, it feels as if they wear the scar on their own skin, as if a kind of ruin has befallen them. The main character in Augustone is Augustone. It's a village in Jamaica that's, that's gone through many changes. You know, it starts out as a village, as a little ha hamlet, and by now it becomes um, a pretty rough inner city community in Jamaica. And I think I just wanted to tell that story through some of the people who have lived in Augustone over the years, some people who are very real, uh, some people who are based on people who are real and some people who are fictional and they all kind of get together in in this fictional August town. When he walks into the yard at night, he never makes a sound. It is as if the earth, every blade of grass, every stone adjusts itself to make space for him. Matafi always knows when he's around. Usually she says nothing, but one night as he was stepping out of the yard, she stopped him. How the night treating him, Marlon? So my grandmother is probably the first person to tell me the story of Bedwood. Uh, and, you know, if you live in Jamaica, you're bound to hear that story. It's always told in a certain way. Um, it's, it's the idiot. The idiot who actually thought he could fly. And I guess as a writer, I think one of the, one of the things I can do for Bedwood, one of the things that history can never do for him, is that I can give him wings. I, I can make him fly. That's what fiction can do for him. I don't like none of this, you know, Matafi said to him. We don't have no choice. Them take August town people for coward, them take we as weak, we will show them. And Gina, who is, again, is the other person who suffers in the story, um, what can I give her? And I can give her the story. I, I, can, I can give the whole book to her and it can be her story. I, I can give her narrative power and agency and so even though so much is taken from her um, in the end she gets the book first you must imagine the sky blue and cloudless if that helps or else the luminously black spread of night next and this is the important bit you must imagine yourself inside it inside the sky floating beside me below us the green and blue disk of the earth. This book is not about modern Panama. Instead, it explores the days before. 
It charts the rise of Panama's railway and canal through the lives of the workmen who gave body and mind to the immense enterprise. It tells a tale of the people who literally carried out the dirty work. I just thought it was very important for us to recognize our forefathers and foremothers who had sacrificed so much in Panama and those places to create a better life for, for us today. One of the things that the old workers talked about a lot was the rain in Panama. It rained for six months there and nothing stopped for the rain. And I'll just quote one of the workers, George Martin, who wrote um, 50 years later, when you're going to talk about rain, please refer back from 1909 and 10, when we worked in rain just as if it were sun. Here is something to note. When we reached a stretch on the way to Gatun, after leaving Montelirio, it rained for days right through, day and night. We had a white boss whose name were Atkins, a young looking fellow at the time. The rain beat him. It turned us colored folk almost white, but our boss, it brought him white like cal calico, I mean white. I did the research for the book over a long period of time. And the, the, so the most challenging thing for me was how to present this mass of material, which is not just research from the archives, but um, it includes oral histories, it includes, you know, just about everything that was written on the subject, including fiction, poetry, songs of the time, and so on and as, as much as possible the words of some of the workers themselves. And so the biggest challenge for me was to find a way of writing the big story and inserting with it, within it the small stories, which are the stories of the West Indian. Well, I grew up in a household of people who had gone to Panama, you know, as a small child. And so I guess Panama became romanticized in my mind as I think it was for many, for everyone of my generation, because everyone was touched by the Panama story. We all had somebody who had gone and, and hopefully returned, or in many cases vanished. Um, so I grew up with this notion of Pan Panama, Cologne, etc., as being a romantic place without actually knowing anything about it. Girls who love their daddies always come at them sideways. I see it all the time in the hospital. Daddies carrying sick baby girls with poor breathing or insect bites. Women supporting sick fathers for just one more MRI or a dose of chemo. Maybe fathers are just more narrow on the side. Yesterday, a teenage girl in the ER, after screaming at her father for 10 minutes, just came at him sideways, wrapped her hands all around him until her fingers met, and rested her head right in his armpit for him to drape her. It's not like I miss my father. I don't even know if he's dead. But I'm starting to miss not taking Xanax. How the book came about. It wasn't supposed to come about. It was a novella, actually. It's, it's ironic that this book ends up being so long because I tried to write the shortest book I possibly could. The original page number one is now on page 458, which was to show how crazy this process was. I really didn't know I had a novel at all. I had a bunch of stories and a, f some floating novellas. They all were on the same thing. I was always interested in what happened after that assassination attempt on Bob Marley. Listen, living people wait and see because they fool themselves that they have time. Dead people see and wait. I once asked my Sunday school teacher, if heaven is a place of eternal life and hell is the opposite of heaven, what does that make hell? A place for dirty little red boys like you, she said. She's still alive. I see her at the eventide old folks home, getting too old and too stupid, not knowing her name, and talking in so soft a rasp that nobody can hear that she's scared of nightfall, because that's when the rats come for her good toes. Well, the first thing I learned was not to play favorites. And um, because it's, there are so many characters, and if I were to play favorites, this would have been an entire novel about a, rich, a hitman from Chicago trying to retire. Um, so by with such a huge cast, 
again, it happened by accident. Um, most of those characters arose out of a need for them to show up. That um, the story ended up being too big for one character, and I still wanted to tell a big story. I wanted to talk about the Cold War. I wanted to talk about the Marley assassination. I wanted to talk about politics. I wanted to talk about drugs and the drug war and how all of these are in some way connected. And because the bigger stories that these are all connected, it meant connecting a lot of people. And uh, few characters make it to the very end of the novel. Because it's still a story about seven killings. So seven killings, well, there are a lot more than seven killings that happen. Chebwa. Devil's Bridge, Mon Lizard, for Vanny Capildeo. Now you concoct your own geography to roads that should have shriveled into primitive paths of red dirt, that should have stained your shoes, led you to the squat satisfaction of some zinc roofed hut. You should have felt the loneliness of all the night's windowsills, the fleeting interest of a small rain, signs and tunnels that disallow your height. Everywhere there is this wilderness of maps that will show you things. My journey into poetry started, I think, before I was able to know that it was beginning. I think it was a very kind of a creative process. Um, that I think began at home um, with my father, who was a poet, who is a poet, and uh, who recited poetry all the time to us or just on his own around the house. And it was a beautiful thing. I mean, he recited Pablo Neruda's um, The United Fruit Company. And I remember one he read to me specifically, which was T.S. Eliot's uh, Macavity, um, Macavity the Mystery Cat, right? Um, so I think that was one of the early things that that started me off the second major thing that I, I i am aware of is really doing derek walcott's poetry for cambridge examinations at a level um being taught by kendall hippolyte um i remember uh i had my eye on a girl at that time and um you know i wasn't really into poetry so much but i, I something told me i had to be doing literature um and i remember reading a poem in uh, win brown selected poems of derek walcott's called a careful passion and i mean that's what brought me into the poem that i was going to good evening ladies and gentlemen i am dr chong lao i am here to present uh the second year of a trilogy of a prize that is awarded to creative writing uh, on, uh, to honor my parents, uh, Johnson and Amoy Achong. This prize uh, has been uh, sponsored by me because I think creative writing is extremely important. It forms the, the basis of uh, the soul of the human being uh, in terms of knowing and understanding his other hu human counterparts and um, it gives me great pleasure to be doing this presenting this to a Trinidadian um, you know Amanda Chukwan. My name is Amanda Chukwan and I am deeply honored to accept the 2020 Johnson and Amoy Achon Caribbean Writers Prize. I would really like to thank Dr. Achon Lau, um, the Bocas Lit Fest team, all of the other participants, all of the people who were shortlisted. Um, again, it's an incredible honor to feel as though my writing is being seen and being nurtured. And I feel, again, um, deeply excited to continue to contribute to a space in which people feel welcome through my writing, um, in which we can be introspective as Caribbean people, um, and in which we contribute to a future in which people feel seen and heard. Thank you. Okay, and Amanda, congratulations on winning the JAAW prize. And I hope that when you complete your entire book, that it goes on to be a number one bestseller. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. Hello, 
I am deeply grateful to the OCM Bocas Prize and to the judges of the Nonfiction Prize for honoring my book, Shame on Me, with this wonderful award. There are many people who are responsible for bringing the book into the world, and I would like to thank some of them here. I have to start with the Eccles Center at the British Library, who gave me time and space to do all the research. And I'd like to thank my agent, Jackie Kaiser, my publishers at Random House Canada and at Scribe UK. But most of all, I'd like to thank my family, my extended family and my immediate family for going with me um, on a journey as I researched and wrote and experienced this book, both before it came into the world and since it's been out in the world. I'm really grateful for their support. And of course, um, the book would not exist without my parents. My late father would be very proud. And I'd like to thank my mother, whose stories and whose love form the spine of this book. And I would like to give this award to her. So thanks, Mum. <laughs> Greetings everyone. I want to thank the Bocas Literary Festival for this most incredible honor. Thank you to OCM and to the organizers as well as the judges and jury. I would also like to congratulate Richard George and Texa McWhart on their wonderful work. Our literature is thriving in your hands and that of so many of the incredible writers and creators and supporters of writers and artists, both within and outside our region. We're living during some very difficult times right now, and it is possible that even tougher times might lie ahead. Literature has the power to provoke and engage during times like this, and yes, can be yet another way we participate in the struggle. Literature also has the power to help comfort and heal as we revisit past trauma and attempt to look ahead, just as we saw in Richard and Tessa's work. And for our writers and our creators, as the great Toni Morrison once said, this is exactly when we go to work. To quote Ms. Morrison, there's no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. That is how civilizations heal. So I thank you all so very much once again. My gratitude to you is deep and heartfelt. Merci en pile. This um, came in the mail this week. Uh, easily the most um, incredible honor I've received in, in my writing career thus far. I, I was like, flabbergasted when the announcement was made. Uh, I know I, I was already um, quite happy to be on a uh, short list with so many of my favorite writers. And so I just wanted to, to, to say thanks. Uh, first and foremost to the judges for, for uh, selecting this work for this this award. I also like to thank Marina and Nicholas and the rest of the Mopus crew uh, for making um, a beautiful space for cabin writers, especially um, you know, in a moment like this. It, it is definitely something that, that you know, continues to, to make space for especially for emerging writers. I'd also like to thank um, Outspoken, uh, Anthony and Patricia in particular. I'll just get my notes. Um, I also want to thank my previous publishers and editors, Tony Fraser, Michelle Tudor, Peter Barnfarb, and of course, One Caribbean Media, Media for helping me this award and this wonderful prize for reality. Um, also, of course, a family of poets upon whose fellowship I am blessed and uh, to partake and last but not least Tavia and my kids and my family for putting up with my you know cantankerous self and then writing me through the night. So uh, I don't want to spend too much more time more of your time. I just want to again pay thanks and enjoy the rest of the festival.
Turn in Trinidad and Tobago, there's something new to discover. But during this period, we made another discovery that we are resilient, that we are passionate yet steadfast, that our beauty shines through our people, our culture, and our energy. Let us stay the course until the beauty of our land can welcome us back. And until our focus shifts from fear to absolute wonder. We will continue to stand strong together, continue to support each other, then we can definitely go places. Hope will take flight and give way to all the beauty we've missed, now renewed, replenished, and all the lives we've shared with friends, our families, those we love. Let's stay the course. Continue to dream, imagine, and stay safe. Trinidad and Tobago is waiting on you.
soak a full in my mouth. I just taste all kind of thing. Like red plum at the right temperature to suck the seed and eat all the flesh. The sweet, salty flesh with enough pepper to make me pucker and the salt itself like it blows straight from Castara. When soca full in my mouth. It's a um, spoken word EP mm -hmm. and I make the distinction between an album and an EP because it's six tracks, six original poems with four introductions. So um, it runs for about 25 minutes or so, but it's me and some post-production work and a little music as well and um, it's my debut offering as a spoken word slash poet mm -hmm. and um, it's been fantastic I'm really happy I did it yeah. what does have to do with literary things all you're always talking about books the man doing spoken word that is not in a book no it's not in a book yeah but it's the same principle it is all about the word and how the word you know, is express whether you write it out or you speak it. It's all about the word, Rona. All right, all right. The word, the word, the word. Yeah. Let me hear this word now. Okay, so this one is called um, Pan Woman. Pan Woman. Yes. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. It sounds like me, pandemic. Uh -huh, yes, you know? yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I'm frightened there, though. No, don't worry. It's just me, Miss Rona. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. And I ain't going anywhere for a while. So play the thing. All right. I hear a pan woman say she want a man she can treat like she pan. As she beat him, he hold on to the rack and do beat she back. Just like she pan. And then she say she want a man she could play like she pan. Sometimes sweet, sometimes with one hand. And the more she play him, he not going to play she back. Was he here to stay? Just like she pan. She say then, he must be hard like iron and shining like the one she did win panorama with. She said she want him bad like a long time steel ban. When it come to tongue, who don't know them scared and by who known, revered. She said she want him soft like a musician. And when the world gone mad and all else fail, she could pick him up and make notes sail. Notes to remind she that music is food, and a full belly does change mood. And when the world gone mad and all else fail, she might get behind a piece of iron and two sticks, cause she and she man sharing the same kind of licks. Bye ladies, bye. Good luck. It's just around the corner. But remember, Bocas is online this year. Bye. Bye, Sterling. Bye-bye. next year when we come back to Bocas together. What do you think? No! <laughs> M foot loose and free Just follow me
Good evening, everyone throughout the Caribbean, throughout the world, and welcome to the NGC Bocas Lit Fest 2020, The Strength of the Islands, a panel discussion which is featuring some of the esteemed poets of the Caribbean. We have with us tonight Celia Sorrendo from Dominica. Hi. We have, there we go, hi Celia. We have Lasana Sekou from St. Martin. Good evening, greetings. Good to be and here. we have Richard Georges from the Bahamas. I hope I'm correct on that. British first name. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you from? Virgin Island. BVI. Ah, see, from BVI, see? Close though. Naila, you always do this to me. It's like five years of doing this. <laughs> I know, it's been so long. I'm so sorry. But it's so good to see you. It's so good to meet Celia. It's so good to make this reconnection with Lasana and with you. Richard. And of course, today's um, our panel discussion this evening is asking that question, how does literature help us turn surviving into thriving? I'm going to let you think about that question while I introduce our viewers to each of you in more detail. First, Celia. Celia Sorrendo was born in the Commonwealth of Dominica, West Indies. She describes it as a small mountainous volcanic nature island, often mistaken for the Dominican Republic. She left Dominica when she was eight years old. She lived for many years in the UK and she returned home to Dominica in 2005. She was an organizing committee member of the Nature Island Literary Festival from 2014 to 2017. And she was the Dominica link for Hands Across the Sea, a US-based nonprofit organization which aims to help raise child literacy levels in the Eastern Caribbean. Her poems have been published quite widely in Anomaly, The Caribbean Writer, Moco Online Magazine, Interviewing the Caribbean Journal, uh, Susumbo's Book Bag, and New Daughters of Africa, which is an international anthology of writing by women of African descent. One of, her long one of her poems was also long listed for the UK National Poetry Competition in 2017, 2018. So Celia, it's wonderful to learn a little bit more about you and I'll say welcome again. Thank you, Naila. So wonderful to be here. Thank you for being with us. Lasana, Lasana Sekou, he's an award-winning author of numerous books of poetry, uh, monologues and short stories. He's the leading St. Martin writer and is considered one of the most prolific Caribbean poets of his generation. His work has been compared to that of Aimé Césaire, um, Kamal Brathwaite, and Dylan Thomas. And he's the founder, and I think most of us in the Caribbean know you as this, um, as well as writer, Lasana. He's the founder of the House of Nahisi Publishers. And he's also a co-founder of the St. Martin Book Fair. And the reason I say that many of us are going to associate Lasana with the House of Nahisi is because we understand the, I will call it the yeomanship service that he has given us, uh, writers and the literary arts throughout the Caribbean through his publishing house and a very um, well uh, respected publishing house, I might add. So welcome Lasana, Thank it's you. good to see you again. Thank you, it's good to be here. And finally, but certainly not least, we have last but not least, is Richard Georges. He's the writer of essays, fiction, and three collections of poetry. His most recent book, Epiphania, which was written in 2019, has just been announced as the winner of the 2020 OCM Bocas Prize for Caribbean Literature. So yeah, we can give him a round of applause. And his book, Make Us All Islands, written in 2017, was shortlisted for the Forward Prize for Best First Collection. His second book, Giant, written in 2018, was highly commended by the Forward Prizes and long listed for the OCM Bocas Prize. He is a recipient of a fellowship from the Stellenbosch Institute of Advanced Study and has been listed or nominated for several other prizes, including the Hollick Arvon Caribbean Writers Prize, the Wasafiri New Writing Prize, and the Pushcart Prize. In addition to writing, Richard works in higher education. So welcome, Richard. Thank you, Naila. Good to be here. Good to and see it's you. So, it is so wonderful to be in this esteemed company. I feel so, so special. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I must say, and I, I, I expressed this to you guys um, in e emails to you before this, this broadcast and 
I am so in awe of your work, all of you. Celia, I mean, we're going to talk about, about um, Guavance. And uh, Lisana, I have some comments about you. Richard also, there's some brilliant work. And, and what I find fascinating is that they are all, well, they, they're following a, a certain theme and yet they're handling it so differently. And, and then of course, there's just the quality of the writing itself. What I would like to ask you is that question that we've posed here for this evening's broadcast, how does literature help us turn surviving into thriving? And I'm going to ask Celia to go first because I'm being a little sexist here and saying, you know, <laughs> women need a go ahead. Hi. <laughs> um, before we just start, I just want to send a shout out. Yesterday was the third um, year anniversary of Hurricane Maria. So I just want to say, you know, heart really goes out to all those who lost family members, et cetera, in that devastation and, and to all those who have lost, you know, members of their family, friends, et cetera, in natural disasters that we've suffered, you know, throughout the, throughout the years. Um, back to that question. Um, I mean, this is testimony really to me, what we're doing here tonight and what I've been seeing um, over the last few days and also with the Brooklyn Caribbean Literary Festival. This is really the strength for me as well as the actual writing, this coming together, these conversations that we're having with each other. They are so fortifying and so inspiring, so encouraging. Um, for me, I've always been a reader. Uh, so literature has always been in my life. Um, since I was a young child, I have to thank my, my mother for that. Um, she was an avid reader herself. And for me, it's always been a, a way of being a mirror, but also a window, uh, a mirror for myself, but also a window into other lives. And um, I left Dominica when I was um, eight years old and grew up in England. So it was quite a culture shock. But one of the books we read um, during school in England was E.M. Forster's Howard's End. And mm -hmm. for some reason, there's a phrase in there, only connect. And that has stayed with me throughout my whole life, um, that phrase of only connect. And not only is it only connect with each other, but also only connect with the aspects of yourself, um, the, all the different aspects of yourself to make yourself whole. So literature has always been there for me. And um, with writing it now, that's been a whole new avenue of catharsis and healing. Um, mm. So coming to literature as a writer, it's been a real, real discovery that um, writing can be healing and cathartic. But I will put a, just a, a little caveat on that. I don't it's healing is a complicated thing and there's no one route to healing for everybody. Everybody heals in their own time. Everybody has their own different methods of healing. Um, so I wouldn't say or force anybody to write about their traumatic experiences if they weren't ready to or if they did, didn't want to. And I wouldn't force anybody to talk about their traumatic experiences if they didn't feel ready. But for me, it has been a really cathartic experience so, and has made me a stronger person as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and we can see that in reading the book, in reading your poems. Um, unfortunately, I don't have my copy in front of me. The last poem in the book, I know that we're all going to yeah. end up talking about that <laughs> because I don't know if I should say this now. I think I'm going to save that thought. So you can remind me, Celia, because I don't want to take up too much of okay. the time. But let me ask uh, Lasana, I'll ask you to, to consider that question. How does literature help us turn surviving into thriving? Hmm. Greetings to all uh, listening in and, and much thanks to the, um, good thanks to the organizers of the Bocas um, Lit Fest. And it's definitely good to be here with the brothers and sisters, poets and, mm -hmm. and creative art artists. Um, you know, I wonder if we could, we could um, spin it around a bit rather than to say how, how, um, how literature helps okay. us. Um, maybe it's how our thriving, our people's thriving in spite of struggles, in the face of disasters, 
uh, man-made and natural, how, how we take that thriving in our people out of, of disaster and how it creatively then takes us, it informs the survival process, of course, and then it takes us beyond just surviving to yeah. again inform the creative process, to inform the thriving in yeah. building what we call this Caribbean civilization. And so the text that comes out, the, the, the dance, the songs, the, the whole creative arts, but we are focusing on literature here, becomes some kind of a mosaic, if you will, some kind of a foundation, yeah. solid foundation in which we are saying, look, look at us. This is what we've been doing. This is how we are building. This is where we're coming from. This is where we're going. So it's a kind of a, a cyclical um, relationship relative to what we produce. I'm imagining what we produce as writers and, and what comes out of our people. You know, that, that, that's the angle I, I, I would like to go from. And if I may add this piece too, relative to, we are seeing now a growth, and I think um, Celia and Richard and myself um, with um, Hurricane Protocol, um, what we are seeing is, 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 a, is a kind of a, 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 a genre of disaster writing, disaster literature coming out of the region, of a region that for thousands of years um, have had hurricanes for half of a hurricane season for half of the year. Mm -hmm. And yet they are, they are just a handful of books from a handful of, 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 of islands that have um, literature, you know, in terms of the, the fine arts, in terms of novels or in terms of um, poetry and so on, that focus on this, the, uh, these disasters and, and the experiences of the people. So we may see very early on Howard Fergus Right after the, the earthquake in, um, in, in Haiti, we saw one or two collections coming out, uh, experiencing, um, telling about that. But what we're seeing now is a crop coming, you know, yes. Richard, Celia, um, Fabian Badajo is coming online with something in, in a few months. Um, the young writer out of St. Martin, um, after the storm, Tamara Grunefeld and so on. We've seen a crop of writing right behind the other, forming almost a kind of a genre of what we can call disaster writing. That is very essential. Mm -hmm. And someone mentioned the word therapeutic um, earlier um, to how our people deal, deal with um, disasters. The day of sitting under the sandbox tree for most of us or sitting under the tomon tree or sitting on the wall to tell our stories, which, which was a form of therapy, is mm -hmm. not as much as it used to be. A lot of us are atomized at home in, in, in terms of um, the family. And so we don't get to do that, you know, retelling of our story or hearing it over and over or as Celia noted, I may not be ready to write my story, but in hearing someone else's story, it serves me richly. It, mm -hmm. it serves me in terms of my healing and to go on and so on. And so our literature can, and I think should, and I think will be more and more um, forming that. It will form it as it goes into song, as it goes into movies, as it goes into the education curricula to see how this helps us to heal um, and build, mm -hmm. and build better. Because sometimes the building is as, is, is, is as simple as policies, for structures that can better withstand a hurricane that are not in place. So we don't know as a citizenry sometimes how to, 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 to lobby and force our governments to instill certain types of, of building codes. That so if our literature can help us to, 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 to come out with these ideas um, by, by popularizing the story, popularizing the narratives that come out of disaster, I think we will be doing a great, a great mm -hmm. service our region and we are seeing more and more of those type of literatures coming out. Mm -hmm. um, just before you go on, I just want to say I hope we can touch on this point a bit later because I do have some reservations about this um, this idea of a genre of disaster um, type right. literature. So maybe we can talk about that <laughs> later. Yeah, yeah. Please bring it up. I, I was going to make that point too. I, I, there's so many other comments and, and, mm. and um, questions that I was going to ask related to what Lasana just said, but mm -hmm. I want to give Richard a yeah, chance absolutely. to, yes, yeah, but please, Celia, because I have a very bad memory, so please, um, you know, remind me. <laughs> Let Richard's laughing, because he knows me. Yeah, go ahead, Richard. <laughs> Can you, uh, how do you answer that question? How does our, how does our literature help us turn surviving into thriving? Well, I mean, I think I would take it out of the disaster context. I think, um, mm -hmm. we'll, but, but you know, I think Lasana is definitely right in pointing out that there's a wave of, of poetry um, in response to these disasters. I think it's also, um, I, I think because we contextualize, um, you know, these recent disasters through the lens of, of, of climate change and, and how how, um, how uh, 
there have been a lot of uh, political catalysts to the ways in which we view climate change, especially in, in climate denial and, and um, bad policies. And it's, it, it is the fact that it is regions like ours that despite being, um, you know, lower down the scale in terms of, of, of those guilty of the emissions that quicken these disasters, we are the ones who feel the brunt of it. You know, in general, the global mm. south is, you know, bears the brunt of, of, of the, um, of the or, or bears the, the torment of the bill created by the global north um, here with climate change. But uh, I, I think I would take it out of the disaster context because I think it rings true across whether, whether it is the elements and I'd just like to, to, to shout out um, Anna Portnoy Brimmer, the Puerto Rican poet, also has a, a collection coming out next year um, centered on, on the impact of Maria in Puerto Rico entitled To Love an Island. And, and, and for those of you who know Anna, it's you know, really waiting to see that one. It's going to be a powerful book. But um, yeah, I'll take outside the context of disaster. And for me, um, writing from... And Lasana could relate because, you know, in, in many ways, we are, we are writing from um, underwritten spaces in, in ways that probably um, you, you don't hear of St. Martin, you don't hear of the BVI um, in the Caribbean canon in the same ways that Dominica, Barbados, Trinidad, Guyana, Jamaica, etc. Ha have, you know, these uh, columns full inscribed with the names of, of, of writers who are, who are, you know, held forth. Uh, as um, bastions of the canon. Um, so in many ways, you know, Lasana, um, you know, his, his prolificity is, is, is almost a, a, I don't know if he feels the same way I do, but almost like a necessity, it's a compulsion because there's this void that you feel. You might have local authors, but um, very few, you know, of us have, have um, been able to reach the void and, 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 be, and be read wider than within our own island. So I think that's something. So there has been a lot of response locally, um, creative response to uh, Irma. You know, it's just that mine is one that that, that, got, that got out. So <laughs> I, I think um, there, there, there is that dimension of it. You know, and, and you know that that is there is a degree of privilege that I have to recognize. Um, several several factors here, in terms of the opportunities that I've been able to take advantage of in terms of the education I've received, in terms of my, um, you know, my employment status and all these things that, that, that made it easier for me to complete a work and then to have the, 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 you know, mechanisms in place to get it to a publisher and so on and so forth, you know. So it's not so much that there aren't other, even more than, than, than this current crop that Lasana speaks to, it, you know, it, it might be a, this might be a, a smidge uh, a, a fraction of the narratives yeah. and experiences that have been written down. But outside of the disaster space, I think for me, you know, my thinking in terms of the strength of literature, speaking as someone coming from, like I said, the underwritten spaces, is to, is to, is to have a hand in creating a, a, a text whereby um, my compatriots can, can see themselves reflected. Um, because there, there is a great, um, you know, power of identification when, when, when you can see not just people who look like you and people who, who, who have similar concerns to you, but where you can see the landscape that you are familiar with, where, when you can see um, the histories and the narratives that you know um, being reflected there. There's a different dimension of power in that, I think. Uh, and so I, I think of, of um, when you read the St. Lucian poets and, and how often the pitons appear you know, and, and the, the iconography that these poets and writers have, have helped establish, you know. Um, so I, I think that that is, is the dimension of strength that I, I, I take to it, that, that um, in many ways, the writer is not just reflecting um, their experience. In many ways, they're kind of constructing, they kind of a, a, an architect of sorts, constructing their own landscape within the text that, that can then be then then be a reflection for for those who read who are can identify in, from the, in those spaces that, that are being um, built in, in in those texts. Yeah, I think that's really insightful, and pretty much I'm agreeing, you know, with everything you said there. Um, Lasana, did you want to respond to that? 
No, it's good. Be good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I also think um, we've got to be careful to say, I think, that people didn't used to write about those things. I think it's testimony to where we are in the Caribbean now in terms of Caribbean literature, why it seems like all these books are coming out together. But um, just recently, uh, it was the anniversary of um, Hurricane David, and I discovered some poems that were written by our poets like Lennox Honeychurch and Mr. Casimir, um, you know, back in those days. So I think um, people have always responded to those things, either in storytelling or relating those tales. Um, but I think it's testimony to where we are in the publishing industry now that these are actually being published, yeah. Yeah, and that was one of the things I was going to ask Lasana um, when he mentioned, you know, the whole concept of this genre of disaster poetry. Um, why now? I mean, apart from the fact that if the hurricanes happened, you know, these disasters are happening. Um, it, it seems then that we've we've just we've progressed somewhat then thematically as writers in the region is. Is that what you would think? What you would say? No, no, no. It, it, uh, I did mention Howard Ferguson, which goes much yes. further back. In further back, so, yes. But yeah, so what we, what we really talked about, indeed, the, the, the technology that is allowing for more mm -hmm. uh, publishing and for more access to information yeah. online, ebooks, and so forth. Um, publishing in our region is, is far more accessible now than before. We, all mm -hmm. of our writers, in fact, a, a number of our writers who are now well known abroad. Um, if they're not still at home, they started out, like Marlon and so on, they started out in the region um, to, to be known while before coming out of the 40s and the 50s across our language zones. And even uh, earlier back, 1925, you know, the Haitian, the Haitian writer who was published in, 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 uh, in Paris, for example, you had to go abroad to be published. But while all that was going on, indeed, at home, the storytelling, the writing, mm -hmm. The, the, the handwritten pieces that were pushed in the family Bible, you know, the little church play, the, you know, the, the house mm -hmm. concerts like they used to have in St. Martin in the yeah. 60s. That's yeah. where I read first as a child. A lot of folks say, oh, you, you read, you know, you learn all that type of style reading in New York. No, I started mm -hmm. reading, you know, in these house concerts and so forth in the, in the, country, the countryside. So I'm saying, yeah, so indeed we've always had that, but you, this, this, this flood, if I may use that term relative to uh, natural disasters that, that, that you tend to be getting now that is there now is, come, is being aided, being encouraged, being accessed through um, the technology, but also because the, 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 the education within our region is becoming, it, well, it should be more, but it's far more dynamic than it was in the 40s and in the 50s and in the 60s. You know, I think in the 60s, relative to the higher education, we started to see a turn with the UV. But while that was happening in the English-speaking Caribbean, you know, the University of Havana and, and Haiti also, uh, um, th there were already changes that were turning our interest in our research and our in, in various literatures from home to the world. Yes. But we have more of the technology now. The education systems mm -hmm. are more dynamic. There's more access to different types of writing. A lot of writers who would have had to go abroad to write before can start at home. Um, um, Richard is 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 is, is uh, the awards that Richard are, are, are winning or are being mm -hmm. listed for. Um, twenty years ago, just twenty years ago, you know, I would dare say uh, the majority of Caribbean writers and aspiring writers would have never heard of those type of awards. Mm -hmm. That's right. And even dare to think that somebody from our in the region could be um, could be listed for them and can win, you know, and and and, yeah. and it's being read enough for someone to consider. It. Their works at, 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 at that, and I don't usually um, um, use the the awards abroad as some kind of a measuring stick for the quality and the level of our readers across the language zones. But you know, I mean, given given our size as a region, the Caribbean writers, the Caribbean literature, and it is a young literature. You know, mm -hmm. Caribbean course, literature yeah. is 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 a world class, highly competitive literature. You know. Um, and that, that comes out of the experiences of our people. You know, what, the stories that Lamming will tell in, um, in The Castle of My Skin were stories he heard as a child as well. So he's not just writing from his childhood, but it's stories he also heard as a child that will then inform this writing process when he goes abroad. So we've always had this dynamism within us and to see it, but I think now you're getting a, a, a flowering, a, a buzzing, a, 
you know, boosting given technologies, given the education, given access um, to, 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 to publishing technologies and so forth. Writing workshops, um, literature festivals like the Bocas Festival, like mm -hmm. in the fair, you know, um, and, and throughout the region, you know, the, the book fairs are following the trend of the, um, the song festivals, you know, after the St. Lucia Jazz Festival, you know, the tourist captain decide, the tourist captains of the other island decide, well, we should have a song festival too. You know how that goes. And mm -hmm. so the, 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 the book fair, and it, has, it has its place. The book fairs throughout our region are following that. They are upwards, there are over 10 to 15 um, literary festivals throughout our region. You know, including the top five that's been around for a while, over at least um, at least twenty years. You see, so all of that well, I think, of why we see um, more of the literature coming out of the different types. I think we can also point to that, um, Lasana, you and, and um, Celia are published within the region. You know, and so you have you have these these to not is no longer like like you're saying, um, this reflexive relationship is no longer um, necessary in order for right. for us. Um, to read, read each other. I think in, in the past, usually when something is published within the region, it, it'd be very um, insular. Yeah. You know, yeah, and you, it, it would yes. be, it would yeah. ricochet within the island, yeah. you know, within yeah. a particular yeah. space. No, yes. And then, yeah, then was mean, maybe within the island, because <laughs> at, that, at that time it was still, well, if it didn't come from abroad, it can't be that good. You know, that kind right. of thing? Yeah. So, right. so, and I think that's right. still a dimension to it. Yes, you're quite so right. I, I think it's also important to note that, that that's that dimension. So, and I would say, you know, um, somewhat controversially, you know, okay. I am the BV Islander. You know, I, I keep telling okay. people, you know, colonialism is not post. So it's a British Virgin Islands and I'm published in the UK. Indeed, it's still a colony. And, and, yeah. and, and for example, um, <laughs> Anna Portnoy, you know, Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States mm -hmm. and she's published in the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, um, although you have been published in the Netherlands, but I, I won't ask you why. <laughs> Well, I think in terms of magazines and, 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 and journals, yes. But yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just teasing you. Yeah, yeah. We have a beautiful you know, house you, you, right, right there. You, you hit on the point house right the there that publishing in the region has also become mm -hmm. one of the reasons why we're seeing more of this fruition of yes. this type of writings about these experiences that we go through, both man-made and, um, and natural, mm -hmm. natural disasters. Mm -hmm. Because um, Howard Ferguson's mm -hmm. books... Um, uh, Celia, uh, you're correct relative to, to, to the Dominica experience. How the, at least one or two of the Howard, Fer Howard Fergus books out of Montserrat with the volcano experience, and if I'm mistaken, you know, a, a, a hurricane or two, are anthologies. So it's not just his mm -hmm. work, but he's collecting these different writers, children, elderly people, you know, people who never thought they would ever see themselves in a book. In and print, he's publishing yes, exactly. from home as well. You know, so whether it's, mm -hmm. a, it's, a, it's a small, and this is another feature I've mentioned at a number of book fairs, and people look at you like, what? Because at that moment, you didn't think about it. That every, at this stage, practically every island, uh, as territory or as independent country, have a publishing activity going on. Mm -hmm. You know, and in some, some places, the books that are being produced are of like an extremely good quality. There, mm -hmm. there are only four of our publishers in the region who are, are trying to push the envelope to some extent beyond their, their borders. So you can say, well, you know, both for authors and for, for trying to market it into other islands. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's happening, and that is UV Press, um, uh, Casa, Ian, out of, uh, out of um, um, Jamaica, mm -hmm. and what we do at, what we try to do at House of Nehesky Publishers, where we publish writers. Mm -hmm. and and those, those, those are... Um, then you have like those smaller presses that are doing some really, well. smaller mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. exactly. You know, who's also uh, reaching out to Farmers other, yeah, other writers from in the Bahamas. Bahamas. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed. In fact, Papilo Press is going to be publishing um, uh, a, a text on on Shea Kane in 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 a, in a few months. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, okay. you see, we so mm -hmm. the, the reaching out to our our, our islands is also um, starting to ebb and flow. And that, that, that is lending itself to this pan-Caribbean approach, both for, for publishing, for readership, for access to readership, for access to publishing. So yeah. writers at home don't necessarily think as much um, that they have to go to, to London or to exactly. New York exactly. or, to, or to Madrid and or to Paris or to Amsterdam to be published. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. And there is actually a comment from Culture Go magazine via YouTube 
and they're actually um, it's emphasizing the point that that you guys are making and, and I'll just read it to you it says Caribbean resilience has forever been underrated overlooked if not erased this panel in itself deliberately breaks this tradition truly empowering yeah so all you know the points that are definitely taken Celia mm -hmm. I know you but, want to yes I really want to make this point though about um I think I've heard this come up in a few conversations about the danger of a uh, of a single story and a danger of just one point of view of um of the islands I mean our islands are so diverse and at the same time so similar. But mm -hmm. um, I totally agree. We are, I, I say the Caribbean is like a crucible where you are kind of, um, it's like a testing ground where you are tested on all kinds of levels and you kind of have to rise from the ashes of all the different trials that um, you come through. And uh, even even physically, with the um, we, we recently had a scare with one of our. We've got like nine live volcanoes in Dominica, like the highest mm. concentration of potentially live volcanoes in anywhere. So we've always got to be living with these things. And um, you know, over so many years, Dominica was an island whereby um, it was colonized quite late um, compared to some of the other islands. And the Maroons and the indigenous people like lived freely. They created their own communities together before colonization. So we've got all these examples where we have gone through challenges, etc., and overcome challenges. And on the one hand, I totally agree we're a resilient people, but I, there's a cost to that that sometimes that is not acknowledged. Like sometimes people feel they cannot speak about the trauma that they've been through, or sometimes people feel they cannot say that they really can't cope anymore because you are seen to be constantly having to be resilient. You are seen yeah. to, you know, you constantly have to be strong because we're always recognized as these strong people, especially as black women as well. Mm -hmm. You're kind of thrown between these two things of being a victim on one extreme and being a superwoman on the other. So I just think that's just important to recognize that although we truly are resilient people, there is suffering going on under the surface. There are people whose roofs still aren't on, even three years on, there are people still suffering. So, and also the danger of, um, I'm so worried about, um, especially as Dominica is considered a, obviously a small island development state. I hate the word SID, because it always mm. sounds to me it's like a some kind of STD or something. Yeah. So, uh -huh. <laughs> um, but um, we're always kind of portrayed as being in need of help. And um, I, that was one of my real concerns with um, writing was that I could portray something that on the one hand, yes, but also on the other hand, um, it was an incredibly empowering experience and a lot of good things came out of it. So it wasn't just a situation of devastation. It was the fact of, um, it really showed um, strength and empowerment and um, coming together and all the things, all the positive aspects of what makes us, um, what makes this, makes us really strong people came out of that as well. So I'm worried about this trauma, a trauma porn and, and always like exotic, maybe exoticizing trauma that, that is kind of some of my concerns, especially, yeah, especially when it's been read um, by, from people overseas, from the UK and America, and whereby, you know, it's again, all these poor people in the Caribbean, oh, look at how sad this mm -hmm. is, you know, we need to help them, etc. Um, one of the things I always thought during the hurricane when people came to help, was so we had all these aid agencies come, which was fantastic. I'm not disparaging any of that. We're so grateful of the help. But some of the jobs they were doing, I'm sure um, people in our country could have done those jobs. Some of the entering on the spreadsheet, you know, that they were doing. So it would have been great if we had also been empowered to um, to help ourselves in, in that way as well. It would have been lovely to have seen that, yeah. But I'm, I'm thinking I'm that, 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 part, that. I'm, I'm thinking that one of the vo among the voices that 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 we can you know uh, 
give air to, give, give voice to, give power to, is to say these various things. I, I think I've read the, the works of, of, of all the, the writers on this panel, for example, and, and, and others, um, Bambi Cat and others, and, and even some of the younger ones coming up. And, and you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't have to sit at the, at the, at the, at the wayside to help um, others um, exoticize my work or not. I'm gonna, but I'm gonna try to put out the work that tells the, full, that, that shows us as a, you know, a full dimension of human being in the variety yes. of our approaches. Yeah, and you know, exactly. and if I, for example, there's a, there's a poem in the, in the hurricane protocol where at the end of it, you realize that the mother, and you see that the, the, they go through the storm, the storm fills up the house, it floods in from the bayside, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of it, you realize it's, it's a poem about a nervous breakdown. But the power and strength of holding on until the people, the neighborhood, interestingly, Celia, rescued her that morning with her son. Yeah. Um, and what he went through because he couldn't protect his mother because he was too young, blah, blah, blah. At the end, you realize it's a story about a nervous breakdown. But yet yeah. the, the, the healing process, the holding process, the process that, that takes them in at the end of this is home, is community. And, and to, to rebuild yeah. and to, you know. So we, we as, as writers, and, I don't believe in, I don't think writers should censor themselves in no way at all. Yeah. We should give air to the variety of our writing. Absolutely. But part of what we will write about and part of what we should encourage and give, give way to, um, because some of us are going to have opportunities to talk to kids. We're going mm -hmm. to go to the school and talk and show a book. It's to let them know they can write about anything. 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 I think and that's so important. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And to write about the fullness of yourself as a being, yes. of your family, of your neighborhood, of your community. Of your mm -hmm. of your so it's a three-dimensional, like yeah, three-dimensional, yeah, yeah. non-stereotypical image. You know, getting all these stories together and building up. Like, there is not one picture. Yeah, yeah. Indeed. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. So I, I think I think and also right. when, when, I, I want Richard writing, to jump in. Yes, go ahead, Richard. Yeah, in, in the writing, I, I think there is an awareness. I think that city is 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 hinting to us. You know, I think I think often of um, uh, Dave Chappelle when he's talking about why he had to leave the Chappelle show. Yeah. You know, it's like when, when yeah. your art is no longer the vehicle for what you intended it to be. So, yeah. so I think that's, that's what we are, are hinting at here. But I think, mm. you know, and I, I've, I've seen that sometimes, you know, where, where by certain markets uh, uh, um, come into you because you're the hurricane poet. Yes. There's some of yeah. that, you know, and like, yeah. you, know, you, yeah. you, you, you fill in this notch. Yeah. But I think, yeah. Um, yeah. I think for me, um, my, my concern is, is <laughs> like uh, we like were invited point. because we're the hurricane poets. <laughs> <laughs> no, Nicholas did not do that. No, no, yeah. I don't. But no, no, but that is, that is my point. That is my point. You end up being Nicholas complicit. Did not do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah you end up being complicit. And but I have yeah. this real issue Guilty. because. Yeah, absolutely. This is this is this is exactly the point. I was, we'll, we'll, and we'll, this whole we'll, capitalization. We'll yeah. yeah. To go back to your point, in terms of uh, you know, in terms of the uh, the strength and resilience that 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 that, that is almost a requirement. But mm -hmm. I, I think for me, the strength and resilience is often the power just to be, you know, the power just you know not to have those expectations to just mm -hmm. just to exist in whichever yeah. way yeah exactly um, yeah. to know, still be here you know, is natural yeah. 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 yeah or recognize so, and, and them and just decide to do it yeah. anyway you know recognize right, those right. things yeah. but just yeah. decide yeah. to do it anyway when the camera's but, not yeah. there anymore i still have to e go feed my exactly. children exactly exactly you know? my, yeah. my yeah. esteemed yeah. colleagues now you're, you're all of this talking i'm <laughs> i'm watching the clock at the same time and it's a wonderful conversation but you see all of this chatting you know that you're going to have to share some of your work with us all right i'm going to give you a few seconds and i'm going to let you decide who goes first i want to read a comment we have another comment in from desiree sibaran via facebook i hope i have her name uh, pronounced her name correctly mm -hmm. and she's saying that point of constantly having to be resilient as islanders is so important and mm -hmm. she's very glad that celia made the connection to race and black women black people yes so we're obviously on track now um, Lasana, you spoke about a poem just, just in your last comment. I'm, I'm wondering which one of your poems you're going to share with us from Hurricane Protocol. <laughs> hint, hint. Oh, so hint, hint. To, to that. <laughs> you know, I've never so been too subtle with my hints. No, I've never, <laughs> I've never been. I've never been known for subtlety. Come on, Richard. You know me more. You know me better than that. <laughs> and you know, the, the Hurricane Protocol for me is, is um, and, and Richard probably out of, 
more, maybe even more than you, Nala, because I know you've, you've known some of the work for a while, knows mm -hmm. that this type of writing for me, Celia, and this goes back to your point, is, is new and is uncomfortable. It's a very mm -hmm. uncomfortable zone for me. I like the sociopolitical, historical, uh, sink my teeth into it and I could go, you know? Yeah. But a lot of the, the poems in here are personal, they're familial, they're community. Yeah. You know, when I was going out in the yard, moving zinc and thing or helping somebody, maybe they say a line or two when I come back in for some water, I, you know, I wrote the note down. I and really would, like that point. Yeah, yeah that's a really that, that, important. That kind of thing. Yeah. That's how this yeah. hurricane protocol came about. And if you'll mm -hmm. notice that none of the poems really have a name. They have a subtitle called Hurricane Protocol, but each of them, the name the is the date that they were written. Because that's, that's, right. that's when I came in, I wrote the date and I gone again outside to do something. And so but, this is one so of the- I, I, I want to say to you though, you know, I, I understand that you were saying that about your work, Lasana. Mm -hmm. However, um, as much as it was a personal chronicle or personal recording of this event, um, I still found that you found you 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 managed very well to work some of that <laughs> sociopolitical yes that yeah, angle in there I, I even it. within the personal so you realize it for yourself because I, I would like, of course I you know, I the would, personal yeah, is I, always political right it, it is, is, it is. is. <laughs> and I'm, I'm reading it and I'm saying yes this is this is different this is not his work wow yeah, yeah, you know yeah. he's really this there's this inner thing I weep for you Lasana and then you know and then he juggled in this thing under the yeah, yeah, like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, you I, haven't changed. You haven't changed. I, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. Which is good. That's not a negative <laughs> thing. Yeah. This yeah. one relative to the the, the nervous breakdown. Uh, so, um, so it's eleven sixteen seventeen. So that's the date it was written. After the way after the hurricane, but the work was still going on. Eleven sixteen seventeen hurricane protocol. It was. It was. It was the pitch nightingale singing. A sweep of seawater fly across the fish pond. Bus open the house, liquid glass in the galvanized cut off. A frigid wash up all up under the quarters of my bed. And to push my grown children back to me. They groan, yes, and curl up. Father, how I wish I could bear them back in me now. How he hands must be full of it with this world cold trembling and we tossing high on pond water deep and we floating in air wade and wading cross eyed as cackling rafters appear stark stairs to the crackling shadows of crackling ceiling bones splintering whip 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 let me think, let me think. What, what, what was that? What was the color of that sky again? Waiting, waiting, waiting and holding on and waiting, waiting till morning come like a water bag bus. Neighbors deliver us down to ground. One of my children, them, is still up there. Beautiful. And we, we're all applauding. We're, we're all applauding. You just can't hear the Caribbean applauding, but we are, and the world, actually. And I, I think one of the things of the strength of the woman in our experiences, um, which to me um, complements the strength of our men in what, what we do and how we do it and have to do it, is that it, the mother and the son is who's stuck up in the, 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 the flood comes into the, to the house mm -hmm. and they're stuck and they're raiding, you know. And the son realized he couldn't help his mother as a boy, as a male child. And so the, the, he is left with the trauma. So when she said this, he's still up there, it was the son who had the nervous breakdown. Yes. Because he's still, he's still in that, in that moment. Yes. yes, but but what rescued them in the morning wasn't the Dutch Marines, wasn't the French Marines, wasn't the foreign aid. It was their neighborhood, it was their community, which immediately in our culture's Caribbean people begins yeah. the healing process, yeah. Yeah. immediately. To help there's ourselves. No, there's no, exactly. Yeah. There's no culture Absolutely. clash. There's no, there's no attitude. There's no who he think he is. Or that, there's one time. And yeah. so this too is hopefully comes out in a poem like that, yeah. um, which I say is kind of uncomfortable for me to write. But yeah. Well, and, we're and, glad and for that your discomfort. Stories from stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but we're glad for your discomfort. Without it, we wouldn't have this. Yeah. So. And it's come, we talked of the different voices, Celia, earlier. Mm -hmm. um, in that one poem, there's like three or four stories of that type. 
yeah. you know. Yes. And of, of course, as the writer, uh, and Richard would, would, would go with this as the writer, you want to pick one that conveys a certain drama as well. So they might have been where the, 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 the door busts in or something, and you're holding mm -hmm. onto the door and the door fly off. So I pick the one where the water pushes you. You know, yes. again, yeah. you pick one. Because as a writer, yes. that's true when we say we shouldn't limit or censor ourselves as writers or limit our, our children that we talk to about what they can write about. You do have certain aspects of the craft I was just to about to say, this is not just our diary. With. Yeah, right. this is not our just right. our diary entry. These are exactly. crafted things. Exactly. And yeah. Sometimes that balance is, is a real thing, you know, that people are going to say, but that didn't really happen. But the whole point is this is a creation. This is not yeah. just me writing out my diary. These are things I poured over and crafted. Yeah. And well pick put. this from here, pick that from wherever. Yeah. 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 So, you know, yeah. Celia, that was your introduction to your own reading. You know that, right? <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> um, I'm going to read um, one of the things I think that really makes us resilient or what I've seen is um, our immense faith, no matter what form that takes, whether it's faith, the Catholic faith or faith in, 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 in a greater force. That's something I've seen threaded through our culture. And um, I had a great aunt who lived to 101, I think it was. And one of her favorite things to say when things were just you know, getting too bad. And I'd say, Auntie, well, what about this? She'll, she'd shrug her shoulders and say, like, what to do? You know, in the sense that it's sometimes you have to learn which battles to let go of and mm -hmm. which ones um, to fight. And some of the healing um, is in the letting go. So this one is called Ode for My Mum's Missing Roofing Screws, Somewhere Still in the Universe. And this one is after a poem by Palmy Dawes that I read called um, Ode to the Clothesline. So I really recommend everybody looking up that poem by Palmy Dawes. There have been so many things to deal with, consider after the hurricane, that we couldn't imagine, never would have wanted to, Many say Maria was one hell of a storm, but the happenings after we woke from her wake were whole other almighty storms to be living through. Yes, I know, we know there is much to be grateful for, much we have still in all the forms that life beautifully frames for us, but now, I am writing an ode to my mum's online ordered roofing screws, a small part of the huge tarpaulin puzzle of how we were going to get her home covered again, how to reassemble life to order as before. They were strong quality screws with hex heads, cute metal caps, and neoprene washers would keep heavy rain from heavens out of holes, screws pierced, with pointed self-drilling tips, letting water gush free down galvanized into gutters, then ground. Not so much the missing of things, Kwame wrote in Ode to the Clothesline. And after the storm, we went back to living some old ordinary life ways that he spoke of. We walked slow, back and forth, across that strange taut rope lying between horror and happiness, self-reliance and persistence, being alone and in the spirit of community, holding on to and letting go constantly. The joy, the pain feelings of this uncovering, this rediscovering, I know, I have to let these missing roofing screws go. No one can tell me why they never made the sea passage from one landmass to this one. Just insured commodity, they say, no matter. This time, I agree. Yeah. So this yeah. one I was kind of thinking mm. of Zong as well, when, when human bodies Beautiful. were yeah. were just commodities. So yeah. you have to let so you have to let the roofing screws go sometimes. The tarpaulin puzzle is the best. Yes. Yeah. It, you, it really you was. It really yeah. was. So I think you have so aptly and beautifully 
um, provided evidence of what you said earlier, which is that these are not just diary excerpts. Mm. You know, these are these are works of art that depict and record something important. You know, and it's beautiful, Celia. And but I just you know, want to make this comment because I see the time going on. So yes. I, I I want to make sure that we we hear from our new OCM. Um, you know, prize winner. So we've got to give Richard a chance, but I do want to say, Celia, that for me, the experience of reading your, your the final poem in Guabonse yeah. was like being in the hurricane itself. Yeah, I, yeah. I live in Barbados. Yes, I live in Barbados, so I, I am not, I have not lived through a hurricane. Um, we would get the peripheral, you know, peripheral damage and that kind of thing. Um, but reading that poem put me right in it and at one point even in the eye and then coming out on the other side so it's an absolutely beautiful poem for those who um who have an opportunity to get a copy yeah. to acquire a copy of what and say i would highly highly urge and recommend you to do so mm. and um, really the the different points of view just quickly it's it's the mm. same storm but we're all in different boats uh, yes. so that that yeah, was really that's important that's you know yes, that's that's yes, so yes, true yes. yeah yeah yeah. Um, we do have a, a question from uh, some, an audience member, but Richard, I do want to give you a chance. I think we have an extra five minutes, I think, um, I'm being told here by my producer. So I'm going to read this question because it may lead to something and then we'll listen to, to, to Richard. So we have a question from Fabian Adekunle Badeho, and I really hope I've not disrespected your name. And it comes via Facebook. How do you bridge the linguistic gap in the Caribbean in order to achieve a truly pan-Caribbean society? He says, I'm thinking of the role of translations in Caribbean literature. And he also goes on, congrats to Loretta Collins Toba and co for the new bilingual anthology, The Sea Does Not Need Any Ornaments. So thank you very much, Fabian, for that comment. But do you guys have any answer to that? How do we bridge the linguistic gap in the Caribbean in order to treat to achieve a truly pan-Caribbean society? Well, I think Fabian Barajo is, is already part, I, I, he's one of our authors, our mm -hmm. authors of House of Nehesi, and mm -hmm. um, he's already part of that process. And we try to do that at House of Nehesi Publishers by the multilingual, whether it's two right. bilingual, trilingual, and even we went up to four languages in one volume that then is marketed throughout throughout the experience, in, including from where that author or that writer is from. And that is something that we are not the first ones to have done that. That has started from before. And I think maybe there's a kind of a cornerstone coming out of the first part of the last century um, with, with Casa coming up after the 59 revolution in Cuba. So um, Casa has tried to do it um, in terms of the, their award um, with the winner wins, um, um, the winning, um, book would get translated into one or two languages and so forth. And but at House of Nehesi, we we've gone, you know, we've added to that layer in terms of what publish can can do, what part publishers can play in translating writers from different parts of our region into different languages and to market those books um, at, at home, but also throughout the experience. And I think it comes, in a, for lack of a better word, it comes easily from St. Martin because the multilingual aptitude within the, the St. Martin society in general, um, from the traditional society up to now, um, means that you know, language, we're not afraid of language. In fact, it's, it's an aspect of the cultural aptitude of, 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 at one of the cores of the St. Martin culture. So it's like, yeah, it's another language. Oh, what's that language? We're curious about language. So, we, mm -hmm. so we've, tried to, we've tried or we're trying to put that into our, into our books, into the books we've published. We've published Lamming in, I think, two or three languages in French and Spanish um, mm -hmm. and so forth. So that, that, is, that is a way to reach out to our region so that same experience, Sita said, she says, you know, we are writing about a, uh, someone who just same. said we are writing about the same mm -hmm. storm. Yes, yeah, the same stimulus. Yeah. And so similarly, we want to see both the uniqueness and the similarities of us as a Caribbean people, as a region. We want to see it in the text, see it in our literature as we move it up, up, across the region. And if I may add one thing that, uh, again, too, when I throw that at conferences, people like, you know, look a little startled and then they start shaking their head. And that is, our region, including the, the, the Central American countries that coast, their coastal area, including the Guyana and Suriname and Cayenne, our region have upwards to 30 million people. Mm -hmm. 
You know, that's not counting Lemming's external frontiers yet, right? <laughs> I know of yeah. no Caribbean author, none, including Marquez and so on, that have sold in our region, in the Caribbean region, a million books. Yes. You know, and so there's a lot of reason for that. It's marketing, it's agents, it's bookstores. We know there's trade and, and commerce and so forth, but you know, mm -hmm. it gives us something to look forward to of the different ways we can bridge that, we can make that reaching out to I just use the million thing as a kind of a mark. It's not it's not nothing set in stone. I'm just saying we can do more and every which way we can as writers at festivals when we talk to each other of uh, the different languages that we study, trying to submit to writers in different parts of the region or in the world in different language areas, getting our work mm -hmm. translated by translators like Jorge Rodriguez, whose cost, who's excellent um, scholars in, in translations. But work is, it's not very expensive for them to, 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 mm. to get them to do it. All of that is part of the mix, if I can just throw that in. Reaching out through the translations of our work to our region, hearing our different stories and telling our different stories in the various languages. Beautiful. Thank you no, so much for that. I and I know nothing, that Fabian must love that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just to say it will happen. Answer. It will yes. happen. Yeah, you know, we're new, yeah. we're, we're new to this and it's just a matter of time. I even uh, thought the other, the other day, I mean, what was the Chinese experience of the hurricane, yeah. the Chinese people here? You mm -hmm. know, you know, mm -hmm. could we translate some of these works into yes. Chinese? Could yes. we have Chinese works that translated into English of what their yes. experiences were? Yeah. Indeed, indeed, yeah. indeed, yeah. you know. Richard. I think, and I think we're pushing towards that. Yes, sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, go ahead. Let's have a No, Richard. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I, I'm uh, waiting to hear Richard. <laughs> yes. I'll no, we're not. Off. Richard, Richard, we're not leaving here tonight, Richard, until we heard you. No, 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 you're not getting away. No, no. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to read a poem entitled The Year Has Become More Beautiful. Mm. There is no power in the walls. The noisy nights rattle on. So I fill my cup with as much ice as it can carry and flood it with as much drink as it will hold. Green vines cover everything that was ruined. The rabble rousers light fires on foundations. They drink, they smoke, they laugh loudly. There is more air than joy. Every morning I walk past a fallen tree, its broken boughs wet and flowering purple. This is a different kind of broken now. I've begun to learn that devastated does not mean dead, that ruin can be resplendent, that what has been emptied can be filled. This year has become more beautiful for the scars. I've heard folk measure pain by hurricane. You can still look through some windows and see only sky, still see gaping homes like cupped hands. The day is full of heat, the screaming behemoths clear the rubble. Your morning walk is barricaded by afternoon. The map shifts. I know there are no such things as endings or beginnings, no cycles to measure, no useful predictions. The prophets are all mealy mouthed and impotent. There is only this ball madly spiraling through space, and that is the most reassuring thing. From the windows in our bedroom, I used to watch our neighbors, their busy lives, the tempests. Tonight, our view is clear out to the channel, the moon making the waves sparkle silver. Hmm. <laughs> Such beautiful work. And, and, and you, you know something, if I may quickly put in there, we oh, talk of, of the human um, element. Uh, we didn't touch so much on the economic element, but that's always yeah. thrown up by the mealy mouth prophet, for example, that um, 
But you know what comes out in that poem that is so key and is so involved in our lives and livelihood in our region that often maybe we don't think of immediately is that the, 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 the abuse to nature, yeah. you know, this whole notion of an eco-politics that's coming in now as one of the areas that people talk about and write about. And that comes out clearly just by the, the description of what the tree goes through. That tree yeah. that you might have been passed every day and not noticed. And now you're passing it and you're no, noticing it. It becomes part of the rebirth. It becomes part of the tragedy. It becomes part of the telling of, the, of that, um, you know, the, 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 without markers, without a calendar. And it's, yeah. and it's setting apart its own, its own space, so to speak. So that what happens to nature with, with, when these storms pass, in addition yeah. to what happens to the human being, what happens to the economy, what happens to, to mm. expectations, what happens to, and, and, and so forth, yeah. I think that's but Richard, I really love that because it really shows like, um, I love the term collateral beauty because um, it's really, it's not all about the devastation. There's so much beauty, right. there's yeah. so much beauty. And I, I think that- Many days later. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, you know, so um, that poem really spoke to that. Yeah, I found that with all three of you, um, there was always that sense of, yes, abs absolute and, and in a sense, pure devastation, but that there, there was always a sense of hope and regrowth and rebuilding. And that in some cases, in my, at least in my imagination, I could see your words as being that actual rebuilding of the island. Right. And, mm. and it, it very, as I said, I've not experienced a hurricane um, full force, but it, it just gave me this sense of comfort having read this, mm. that you know, you know, there's always going to be hope. Yes, there's going to be devastation. Yes, there's going to be loss, but there's also always going to be hope. We actually have another comment um, via Facebook from Cynthia Birch. And this goes back to um, what we were talking about in terms of um, bridging the, lang the linguistic gap or the language gap. And Cynthia has said here, when there are so many experiences in common, so much of communication is intuitive. So translation, and she puts that in quotations per se, helps the process of understanding, but it is not the only medium of sharing experience. And that also um, we emphasize is what Celia was saying and what you, Lassana, was saying and what Richard has demonstrated, which is that it was the same stimulus, but, you know, there was no trouble express, expressing it from your various boats, you know? And, um, and our music as Caribbean people leads that way, you know? Um, mm -hmm. You can be in Anguilla and you hear Cuatro Carenta. You could be in, in Havana and you hear Akaiso. And, you know, you could be in Trinidad and you hear a, 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 a good piece Zook. of music from uh, a zoo. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say from Kurosawa, but Zook Sweet too, <laughs> you know. And all of a sudden, it's, it's, it's felt, it's known intuitively. And, and some of the experiences that, that are in you are going to speak to that, if I can use, it, I can use that term. So our, our, our music generally have led a lot of in the way of where our arts, our, our literature is following in terms of connecting and reconnecting and discovering and, and so forth and sharing our experiences as Caribbean people. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have found this a thrilling evening, just an absolutely thrill to be with you. Um, I, we do have permission to, to go on a little longer and because I'm going to um, hog this show a little bit, I'm actually going to, after I thank our guests, for joining us here on the NGC Bowcliffs Lit Fest 2020. This is the panel discussion with Strength of Islands. And we've been exploring how literature um, helps us survive and thrive in the Caribbean. And Celia, I might be putting you on the spot a little bit because I, I think I'd like to have you um, end our show this evening with, if, with an excerpt from that poem. <laughs> If I'm not asking too much, you have a special request. I want people to experience it with me. And this is not to, this is not to diss the fellow esteemed poets who I've been referring to as that all night. But I, I really want people to experience that with me. Um, Lasana, I want to congratulate you on your, your volume because as you said, this was a step away from the quote unquote norm for you. 
And it was as painful as it may have been, as I mm. said to you, we're, we're happy for your pain. We're sorry that you had to experience, but we're happy to have been able to experience the, let's call it the aftermath of that. It is absolutely wonderful work, my brother. And Richard, we haven't made a big enough fuss about you and this OCM. <laughs> Volk Volk exactly. Yes, we really haven't. We I, haven't. I agree. There. I mean, I agree. yeah, we haven't made a big enough fuss. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> congratulations, my brother. It's going to get to the point where I can't even call you. I can't even talk to you probably because you are going to be so up there and <laughs> stratified, man. Beautiful. No, and it's like Lasana said, yeah, you know, 20, <laughs> no, but 20 years ago, 20 yeah. years ago, yeah. we could not be having this conversation yeah. with one of our brothers. Or if we were, it would be one of our brothers from, as Richard pointed out, one of the yeah. islands where, you know, the writers are known somehow to be born there. And, and he would have been visiting the Caribbean. He would have been visiting the Caribbean or you'd have to con contact him abroad something like that yes. yeah 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 for real so i want to thank all of you i'd like to thank you richard lasana celia i'd like to thank all of our viewers out there in internet world and and social media facebook youtube wherever you're joining us and i urge you to um you know continue to check out the ngc bocas lit fest 2020 lots of good things happening celia are you ready for okay, it? Yeah. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm so honored to be in this uh, space with Richard and Lasana. When I saw the pictures, I thought it was like um, it was two roses and a, a thorn in between. So um, I'm good really, with that. No, no, no. <laughs> really, that's the beauty. Really beauty. It's beautiful the rose so. and the thorn. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's the beauty so. of nature, though. And the, and the, ro and the thorns yeah. are necessary, yes? Although actually, I should, shouldn't use rose. I should use a, a hibiscus or something. A more something like that. Yeah. yeah. True, so true, um, true. I'm just going to read a very short extract from um, the last poem, which is um, Hurricane Praxis, Exorcising Maria Experience. And it really was um, an exorcism to, to kind of write this one. Um, so it's just a short extract. We exchange food with each other. We long for garlic onions, fresh seasoning, green fig, fresh fruit. We long for cold beer, for ice. We need fresh food, toiletries, pampers, baby food. We need washing powder, disinfectant. We need so much. We have fuel. We hope soon we will have bread. We make our own bread. We even make our own fuel. We are thankful when rations start coming. We are thankful when water trucks come. We are given some rations. We fight for rations. Someone takes our rations. We cannot go for rations. We don't want rations. We compare our rations to what others receive. We think the rations are great. There is enough. The items are needed. We think the rations are awful. There is not enough. The items are useless. We think so-and-so got better rations than us. We hate needing rations. We long for fresh food. Mm. So it's just... A Twenty twenty marks ten years of TNT's National Literary Festival, and it's the first ever virtual NGC Bookers Lit Fest. It's packed with stories, talk, readings, extempo, poetry, new talent, and of course, surprises. Eighteen events, eighty participants. Friday eighteenth to Sunday twentieth September. Catch it all via Facebook, YouTube, and on the Bookers website. Bocaslitfest.com. 